Chapter 8. A reset is not a revolution. So, dear open-minded progressive, in Chapter 7 we established who runs the world. You do. Or rather, people who agree with you do. Or hopefully, people you used to agree with do. I can hope, right? In this chapter, we'll do a little more than hope. We'll also look at change. But first, let's nail down our terms. The great power center of 2008 is the cathedral. The cathedral has two parts, the accredited universities and the established press. The universities formulate public policy. The press guides public opinion. In other words, the universities make decisions for which the press manufactures consent. It's as simple as a punch in the mouth. The cathedral operates as the brain of a broader power structure, the polygon or apparat, the permanent civil service. The apparat is the civil service proper. All non-military officials whose positions are immune to partisan politics, also known as democracy, plus all those formerly outside government whose goal is to influence or implement public policy, i.e. NGOs. There's a reason NGOs have to remind themselves that they're non-governmental. If we did not have an existing category for the press and universities, we could easily think of them as NGOs. In particular, the system wherein journalists are nominally supervised by for-profit media corporations is purely historical. If the Times and its pseudo-competitors ever fail, as they may well, the responsibility of funding and organizing journalism will fall to the great foundations, who will certainly be happy to pick up the relatively small expense. I have blown a lot of pixels on the historical roots of the cathedral, but this one-minute clip might tell you just as much. Hollywood supports New Deal and NERA. That, my dear, open-minded progressive, is what we call a personality cult. No, that's not George W. Bush on the flag. If you don't recognize the eagle, he is this friendly fellow, a symbol of the National Recovery Administration. And if you think there is anything ironic about the production from Footlight Parade, 1933... You're dead wrong. And in what secret speech was this cult denounced? It never has been. All mainstream thought in the United States, Democrat and Republican alike, descends in unbroken apostolic succession from the gigantic political machine of that man. The last of the FDR haters were purged by Buckley in the 50s. The cathedral connection, of course, is the academic brain trust mentioned in Chapter 7. Today's cathedral is not a personality cult, it is not a political party. It is something far more elegant and evolved. It is not even an organization in the conventional hierarchical sense of the word. It has no leader, no central committee, no nothing. It is a true peer-to-peer -peer network which makes it extraordinarily resilient. To even understand why it is so unanimous, why Harvard always agrees with Yale, which is always on the same page as Berkeley, which never picks any sort of a fight with the New York Times, except, of course, to argue that it is not progressive enough takes quite a bit of thinking. Yet, as the video shows us, the cathedral was born in the brutal, hardball politics of the 20th century, and it is still best understood in 20th century terms. Most historians would agree that the 20th century started in 1914, much as the 60s denotes the period from 1965 to 1974, and I don't think it can be declared dead until this last great steel machine finally gums up and keels over. I'd be surprised if this happens before 2020 or after 2050. The 20th century prudently and definitively rejected the 19th century idea that government policies should be formulated by democratically elected representatives whom you know and loathe as partisan politicians. Unfortunately, at least in the United States and the Soviet Union, it replaced the fallacy of representative government with the far more insidious fallacy of scientific government Government is not a science because it is impractical to construct controlled experiments in government. Uncontrolled or natural experiments are not science. Any process which is not science but claims to be science or claims that its results exhibit the same objective robustness we ascribe to the scientific process has surely earned the name of pseudoscience. Thus, it is not at all excessive to describe 20th century public policy as a pseudoscience. A good sanity check is the disparity between its predictions and its achievements. Moreover, all the major 20th century regimes maintained and generally intensified the underlying mystery of Whig government, the principle of popular sovereignty. Even the Nazis acknowledged popular sovereignty. If the NSDAP had defined its leadership of Germany as a self-explaining proposition, it could have laid off Goebbels in 1933. 
Instead, it went to extraordinary lengths to capture and retain the support of the German masses. And most historians agree that at least before the war, it succeeded. If you don't consider this an adequate refutation of the principle of vox populi, vox dei, perhaps you are a Nazi yourself. This is the terrible contradiction in the political formula of the modern regime. Public opinion is always right, except when it's not. It is infallible, but responsible educators must guide it toward the truth. Otherwise, it might fall prey to Nazism, racism, or other bad thoughts. Hence the cathedral. The basic assumption of the cathedral is that when popular opinion and the cathedral agree, their collective judgment is infallible. When the peasant mind stubbornly resists, as in the cases of colonization or the racial spoil system, more education is necessary. The result might be called guided popular sovereignty. It wins both coming and going. In 1933, public opinion could still be positively impressed by group calisthenics displaying the face of the leader, eagles shooting lightning bolts, etc., etc. By today's standards, the public of 1933, both German and American, was a seven-year-old boy. Today's public is more of a 13-year-old girl, a smart, plucky, well-meaning girl, and guiding it demands a very different tone. You are not a 13-year-old girl. So how did you fall for this bizarre circus? How can any mature, intelligent, and educated person put their faith in this gigantic festival of phoniness? Think about it. You read the New York Times or similar on a regular basis. It tells you this. It tells you that it reports that scientists say X or Y or Z, and there is always a name at the top of the article. It might be Michael Luo or Celia Duggar or Heather Timmons or Mark Lacey or... The list is, of course, endless. Do you know Michael or Celia or Heather or Mark? Are they your personal friends? How do you know that they aren't pulling your chain? How do you know that the impression you get from reading their stories is the same impression that you would have if you personally saw everything that Michael or Celia or Heather or Mark saw? Why in God's green earth do you see their stories as anything but an attempt to manipulate procedural outcomes by guiding you, dear citizen, to interpret the world in a certain way and deliver your vote accordingly? The answer is that you do not trust them personally. Bylines are not there for you. They are there for the journalists themselves. If the Times, like The Economist, lost its bylines and attributed all its stories to a New York Times reporter, your faith would not change one iota. You trust Michael and Celia and Heather and Mark, in other words, because they are speaking quite literally ex-cathedra. So you trust the institution, not the people. Very well. Let's repeat the question. What is it about the New York Times that you find trustworthy? The old black letter logo. The motto. Suppose that instead of being reporters of the New York Times, Michael and Celia and Heather and Mark were cardinals of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Would this render them more credible, less credible, or about as credible? Suppose instead they were professors at Stanford University. Would this increase or decrease your trust? For a hardened denialist such as myself, who has completely lost his faith in all these institutions, attempting to understand the world through the reports and analysis produced by the cathedral is like trying to watch a circus through the camera on a cell phone duct taped to the elephant's trunk. It can be done but it helps to have plenty of external perspective. And for anyone starting from a position of absolute faith in the cathedral, there is simply no other source of information against which to test it. You are certainly not going to discredit the Times or Stanford by reading the Times or going to Stanford any more than you will learn about the historical Jesus by attending a Latin Mass. And as a progressive, you are no more interested in prying into these questions than the average Catholic is in explaining what makes the Church one, holy, and apostolic. You do not see yourself as a believer in anything. You don't think of the cathedral as a formal entity, which of course it is not. Its institutional infallibility is a matter of definition, not faith. Rather, you focus your political energies on the enemies of the cathedral. Perhaps the keystone of the progressive belief system is the theory that the cathedral, far from being the boss hog, the obvious winner in all conflicts, foreign or domestic, is in fact struggling desperately against the dark and overpowering forces of bigotry, religion, ignorance, corruption, militarism, etc. In a word, the man. We met the man in Chapter 7, courtesy of Lincoln Steffens, whose enemies in the form of Gilded Age blowhards such as Chauncey Depew at least really existed, 
and had real power. When C. Wright Mills wrote The Power Elite, their memory could at least be reasonably invoked. By the Chomsky era, the military corporate financial conspiracy was approaching the plausibility, if not the maliciousness, of its international Jewish counterpart. The 20th century's real power elite, of course, are Steffens, Mills, and Chomsky themselves. This is the classic propaganda trope in which resistance becomes oppression. Poland is always about to march into Germany. Every aggressive political or military operation in history has been painted, usually quite sincerely, by its supporters as an act of self-defense. In reality, active resistance to the cathedral is negligible. At most, there is the outer party, which is completely ineffective, if not counterproductive. More on this in a bit. The outer party can sometimes align itself with small acts of petty corruption, as in Tom DeLay's K Street project. This can hardly be described as a success. There are also phone-in operations, such as Numbers USA, which attempt to mobilize the last remnants of unreconstructed public opinion. The cathedral, which fears the masses much more than it has to, is often demure in revealing its power to just steam right over them. And so it is possible to achieve small victories, such as Numbers USA's, in maintaining the status quo. Finally, the initiative process, ironically a relic of early progressivism itself, grants occasional laurels to a Howard Jarvis or Ward Connolly. But most resistance is of the passive, atomized, and inertial sort. People simply tune out. If they are especially determined and wily, they may practice the ketman of Czesław Miłosz. Or they believe, but they don't super-believe. They are the progressive version of Jack Mormons. Naturally, even these small, private apathies enrage the fanatical. Here is another inescapable contradiction. The average progressive who is not open-minded, most people aren't, and is not reading this, cannot imagine even starting to perform the exercise of imagining a world in which his side is the overdog. Yet the very word progress implies that his cause in general tends to advance, not retreat, and history confirms this. If you were advising a young, amoral, ambitious, and talented person to choose a political persuasion solely on the probability of personal success, you would certainly advise her to become a progressive. She should probably be as radical as possible, hopefully without acquiring any sort of a criminal record. But as the case of Bill Ayers shows, even straight-out terrorism is not necessarily a bar to the circles of power, especially if, like Ayers, you started there in the first place. The only reason to oppose progressivism is some sincere conviction. As Edith Hamilton said to Frida Utley, don't expect the material rewards of unrighteousness while engaged in the pursuit of truth. This has to be one of the finest sentences of the 20th century. Any such conviction may be misguided, of course. People being what they are, and progressivism being the creed of the most intelligent and successful people in the world, most opponents of progressivism are in some way ignorant, deluded, or misinformed. Often the situation is simple. Progressives are right and they are wrong. This hardly assists the pathetic, doomed cause of anti-progressivism. In the post, the liberal historian Rick Perlstein stumbles on, and then of course past, the inconvenient reality of progressive dominance. Born myself in 1969 to pre-baby boomer parents, I'm a historian of America's divisions who spent the age of George W. Bush reading more newspapers written when Johnson and Richard Nixon were president than current ones. And I recently had a fascinating experience scouring archives for photos of the 1960s to illustrate the book I've just finished based on that research. It was frustrating and telling. The pictures people take and save, as opposed to the ones they never take or the ones they discard, say a lot about how they understand their own times. And in our archives, as much as in our mind's eye, we still record the 60s in hazy cliches in the stereotype of the idealistic youngster who came through the counterculture and protest movements, then settled down to comfortable bourgeois domesticity. What's missing? The other side in that civil war. The right-wing populist rage of 1968 third-party presidential candidate George Wallace, who, referring to an idealistic protester who had lain down in front of Johnson's limousine, promised that if he were elected, the first time they lie down in front of my limousine, It'll be the last one they'll ever lay down in front of because their day is over. That kind of quip helped him rise to as much as 20% in the polls. 
It's easy to find hundreds of pictures of the national student strike that followed Nixon's announcement of the invasion of Cambodia in the spring of 1970. Plenty of pictures of the riots at Kent State that ended with four students shot dead by National Guardsmen. None I could find, however, of the counter-demonstrations by Kent, Ohio, Townies, and even Kent State parents. Flashing four fingers and chanting, the score is four and next time more, they argued that the kids had it coming. The 60s were a trauma, two sets of contending Americans, each believing they were fighting for the future of civilization, but whose left and right-wing visions of redemption were opposite and irreconcilable. They were a trauma the way the war of brother against brother between 1861 and 1865 was a trauma, and the way the Great Depression was a trauma. Tens of millions of Americans hated tens of millions of other Americans, sometimes murderously so. The effects of such traumas linger in a society for generations. Consider this example, the Library of Congress, which houses the photo archives of Look Magazine and U.S. News and World Report, holds hundreds of images of the violent confrontation between cops and demonstrators in front of the Chicago Hilton at the 1968 Democratic National Convention and from the summer of 1969 of Woodstock but I could find no visual record of the National Convention on the Crisis of Education. Held two weeks after Woodstock in that self-same Chicago Hilton, it was convened by citizens fighting the spread of sex education in the schools as if civilization itself were at stake. The issue dominated newspapers in the autumn of 1969 and is seemingly forgotten today. 68 wasn't a trauma. It was a coup. It was a classic chimp throwdown in which... Using tactics that were as violent as necessary, the new left displaced the old left from the positions of power. Up against the wall, motherfucker, this is a stick-up. Truer words were never spoken. The victory of Obama, a movement man to the core, represents the final defeat of the Stalinist wing of the American left by its Maoist wing. By Stalinist and Maoist, all I mean is that the New Deal was allied with Stalin and the SDS was aligned with Mao. These are not controversial assertions. But I digress. My point is that what we can infer by our inability to recognize any serious successor in 2008 of George Wallace, the anti-sex education movement, or the folks who thought that the National Guard's real mistake at Kent State was that they failed to follow up the victory by fixing bayonets and charging, is that these reactionaries lost and their progressive enemies won. Generally, in any conflict, only one side can claim victory. And if after the battle we see that one side still flourishes and the other has been so thoroughly crushed that it is not only non-existent but actually forgotten, we sure know which is which. The great myth of the 60s is that the movement somehow failed. Actually, its foes, not Nixon's silent majority, who never had any real power in the first place, but the establishment, the old Eleanor Roosevelt liberals, the Grayson Kirks and S.I. Hayakawas and McGeorge Bundys lost almost every battle, including, of course, the Vietnam War itself. The SDSers and Alinskyites suffered hardly at all for their offenses and moved smoothly and effectively into the positions of power they now hold, almost exactly as described in the Port Huron Statement, which is unbelievably windy, even by my standards, scroll to the end for Hayden's actual tactical battle plan. The case of the silent majority illustrates the system of guided popular sovereignty. A majority of American voters opposed the student movement, just as a majority of Germans supported Hitler. The majority does not always win. The children of the silent majority are far, far less likely to express the views of a George Wallace, a Spiro Agnew, or an Anita Bryant than their parents. The same can be said for the grandchildren of the Nazis. The cathedral defeated both. Was this a good thing? I suppose it probably was. I'm not a huge fan of George Wallace or of Hitler. But they are both dead, you know. History is not a judicial proceeding. Quite frankly, I find it amateurish to take sides in the past. We study the past so that we can take sides in the present. The progressive is quite satisfied with the defeat of Hitler, which, short of making pyramids of skulls, Tamerlane style, was about as complete as it gets. But Wallace is another matter. To a progressive, progressivism is right and its opposite is wrong. Thus, any survival of the silent majority, any sense in which the world has not yet been completely progressivized, any victory short of unconditional surrender, 
is a sign to progressives that the world remains dominated by their enemies. More energy is necessary, comrades. The device of unprincipled exceptions allows this bogus, self-congratulatory legend of defeat to persist indefinitely. As we've seen, the progressive story can be traced back centuries, and at every moment in its history it has existed in a society which has included reactionary power structures. For example, the concepts of property, corporations, national borders, marriage, armed forces, and so on, are irredeemably unprogressive. Attacking on all these fronts simultaneously would result in nothing but defeat, real defeat. So the continued existence of these reactionary phenomena provides evidence that progressives are struggling against dark forces of titanic and unbounded strength. You have to be a bit of a reactionary yourself to see the truth. These institutions are simply a matter of reality. So it is reality itself that progressivism attacks. Reality is the perfect enemy. It always fights back, it can never be defeated, and infinite energy can be expended in unsuccessfully resisting it. Thus, Condoleezza Rice, for example, can claim that America is only now becoming true to its principles. The Times disagrees. It claims that America is not yet there. Rather, it is treating its illegal immigrants unjustly. Is it just for America to prevent any human being from setting foot on its noble soil? Or is no person illegal? The Times is silent on the question. But perhaps in a decade or two, the answer will be revealed in our living constitution. You see how cynical a response this great institution can expect from a carping denialist such as myself when it accuses some poor outer party shill of breaking the law. Anyway, I think I've gone far enough in describing the cathedral. It is basically a theocratic form of government, minus the literal theology. Its doctrines are not beliefs about the spirit world, but they rest no less on faith. I certainly cannot see any reason to believe that these people have delivered, are delivering, or will deliver government that is secure, responsible, and effective. I can see plenty of reasons to expect that, as the unprincipled exceptions rise to the surface and are carved away, things will get worse. In case you are still undecided on whether or not to support the cathedral, dear open-minded progressive, I offer you a simple test. The test is a little episode in ancient history. The name of the episode is Reconstruction. The question is, who is right about Reconstruction? Team A, Eric Foner, Stephen Budiansky, and John Hope Franklin? Or Team B, Charles Nordhoff, Daniel Henry Chamberlain, and John Burgess? For extra credit, throw William Salatin in the mix. Team B has an advantage in that their books are available in one click. They have another advantage. They actually lived through the events they describe. Team A has an advantage in an extra century or so of scholarship and the vast marketing powers of the cathedral. You don't actually need to buy their books. Their ideas are everywhere. Budiansky's breathless first chapter is, however, online. Note that there are no factual matters in dispute. The choice is merely one of interpretation, and all the authors linked above are, by any reasonable historical standard, liberals. Who do you find more credible, Team A or Team B? As you'll see, you can hardly agree with both. If you get the same results from this experiment that I did, you may want to think about strategies for change. Change can be divided into two parts, capturing power and using it. My answer for how to use power will not change. I believe in secure, responsible, and effective government. This is not, in my humble opinion, a difficult problem. The difficult problem is how to get from here to there. Let's start by looking at some ineffective strategies. In my opinion, the most common error made by anti-progressive movements is to mimic the strategies of progressivism itself. The error is in assuming that the relationship between left and right is symmetric. As we've seen, it is not. The three main strategies for progressive success in the 20th century were violence, Gramscian or bureaucratic incrementalism, and Fabian or democratic incrementalism. As anti-progressive strategies, I don't believe that any of these approaches has any chance of success. As at the very least distractions, they are counterproductive. Revolutionary violence in the 20th century has such a strong track record that it's only natural for reactionaries to think of trying it. Furthermore, in Japan, Italy, and Germany, the 20th century has three cases of reactionary movements. Yes, I know Hitler did not claim to be a reactionary, but he was lying, which achieved success through violence. For a while, 
before their fascist movements rose to power, these countries all had one thing in common. They were monarchies. Is your country, dear reader, a monarchy? If not, I recommend strongly against any kind of reactionary violence, terrorism, civil disobedience, such as tax protesting, or any approach that even starts to smell of the above. Fascism was a reaction to communism, thus the word reactionary. It could exist because of one thing and one thing only, a political and especially judicial establishment that was fundamentally reactionary and willing to turn a blind eye toward anti-revolutionary thugs who used Bolshevik techniques against the Bolshevists themselves. Is your country, dear reader, equipped with a reactionary judicial establishment? Are you sure? Are you really sure? Because if not, I recommend strongly against, etc. In a world dominated by progressives, the fascist gate to power is closed, locked, welded shut, filled with a thousand tons of concrete, and surrounded by starving cave bears. Today's apparat has entire departments who do nothing but guard this door, which no one but a few pathetic dorks will even think of approaching. And this is even assuming that a regime which achieved power through fascist techniques would be superior in any way, shape, or form to the cathedral a proposition I consider extraordinarily dubious. Give it up, Nazis. Game over. You lose. Frankly, even the real Nazis were no prize, and few of them would regard their modern successes with anything but contempt. There is a reason for this. We continue to Gramscian incrementalism. This is not without its merits. It even has its successes. I think the most effective arm of the modern conservative movement far and away has been the Federalist Society. The Federalists are absolutely decent and principled. They have separated themselves as far as possible from the outer party, and they have had a real intellectual impact. Frankly, you could do a heck of a lot worse. On the other hand, it should not be necessary to join the cathedral to have an intellectual impact on it, and one day it won't be. And as an institutional power play, rather than a platform for intellectualizing, the idea of Gramscian reaction is just silly. At best, the Federalists and their economic counterparts in the George Mason School might make the cathedral system work a little more efficiently. But the cathedral tends to be much better at assimilating them than they are at subverting it, an intention which, you'll note, few of them will admit to. Gramscian subversion works for a reason. The Gramscian progressive's real goal is power. In order to generate free energy, which he can transmute into organizational power, he is ready to push his organization toward ineffective policies which by virtue of their very ineffectiveness are a permanent source of work for him and his friends. A Gramscian reactionary, working in the same organization as these people and nominally collaborating with them, is forced into one of two options, attacking the progressives and trying to destroy their jobs, which will result in his certain destruction, or finding a way to betray his own principles, which will result in a comfortable and permanent sinecure. There is little suspense in the decision, Ultimately, the Gramscian reactionary is, in fact, a Gramscian progressive. All he is doing is to create jobs for himself and his friends. The cathedral is happy to employ as many tame libertarians or conservatives as it can find. As LBJ used to put it, better to have them inside the tent pissing out, hence the infamous Cosmotarians. Perhaps if someone found a way to spread their dung on crops, they might have a reason to exist. We continue to Fabian incrementalism. You can see Glenn Reynolds endorse the Fabian strategy here. I'm afraid I still have a soft spot for the Instapundit, who was perhaps my first introduction to the weird, scary world outside the cathedral, and a gentle and pleasant introduction it was. But frankly, Reynolds doesn't pretend to be anything but a lightweight, and I see no reason to waste much time on him. Fabian incrementalism means supporting either the outer party or a minor party such as the Libertarians. By definition, if you are going to take power using the democratic process, you have to support some party or other. There is an immediate problem with this. As we've seen, modern democracies do not allow politicians to formulate policy. It is a violation of their unwritten constitutions, and an unwritten constitution is just as hard to violate as a written one. Therefore, even when the outer party manages to win the election and gain power, what they find in their hands is more or less the same sort of power that the Queen of England has. My stepfather, a mid-level Washington insider who spent 20 years working as a staffer for Democratic senators, cavilled vigorously at the idea that the Democrats are the inner party and Republicans are the outer party. 
He pointed out that between 2000 and 2006, the Republicans held the presidency and both houses of Congress. I pointed out that he was actually underplaying his hand. During this period, Republican nominees also held a majority on the Supreme Court. By the 11th grade civics class separation of powers theory, this would have given the grand old party complete domination over North America. Without breaking a single law, they could have liquidated the State Department and transferred sole foreign policy responsibility to the Pentagon, packed the Supreme Court with televangelists, required that all universities receiving federal funds balance their appointments between pro-choice and pro-life professors, terminated all research in the areas of global warming, evolution, and sexual lubricants, etc., 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 whereas in fact in all the hundreds of thousands of things Washington does, there was exactly one major policy which the Bush administration and Congress pursued, but their democratic equivalents would not have, the invasion of Iraq, which you may support or oppose, but whose direct effect on the government of North America is hard to see as major. Moreover, this applies only to the first term of the Bush administration. We have no strong reason to believe that a Kerry administration would not have adopted the same policies in Iraq, including the surge. Why did the Republicans not use their formal control over the mechanisms of Washington to cement real control, as the Democrats did in 1933? There are many specific answers to this question, but the basic answer is that they never had real power. In theory, the Queen has just the same power over the UK, and if she tried to use it, all that would happen is that she would lose it. Exactly the same is true of our own dear outer party, on whatever occasion it should next get into office. It may get into office again. It will never get into power, although it retains the power to fill many juicy sinecures. There is a more subtle reason that the outer party is a rolling disaster. Conservatives and reactionaries, whose political positions must be based on principle rather than opportunism, since if they were opportunists, they would always do better as progressives, find it difficult to agree. Progressives always find it easy to agree. As you might have noticed, their disputes are almost always over either tactics or personalities, almost never over principles. There is a reason for this. Thus, progressives have the advantage of spontaneous coordination, the glue that holds the cathedral together in the first place. Their formula is pas d'ennemis à gauche, pas d'amis à droite, and any unbiased observer must applaud at how smoothly they make it work. Their coalitions tend to hold, those of their enemies tend to fracture. Evil is stronger than good because it is never worried or confused by scruples. Third, outer party politicians who achieve any success are constantly tempted to succeed even more by replacing their principles with progressive ones and allying with progressives. Since this alliance enables them to outcompete their principled competitors with ease, it takes a very determined figure to avoid it. In the ancient grinning carapace of Senator McCain, this strategy has surely been pushed to its furthest possible extent, or so at least one would think. Then again, one would have thought the same of the original compassionate conservative. We can see a more extreme version of this in the pathetic gyrations of one of the outer party's outer parties, the Lou Rockwell libertarians, skewered with deadly aim at V-Dare and roasted to a fine crisp at VFR. I don't really agree with the details of Oster's analysis of libertarianism, here is mine but our conclusion is the same. The problem with libertarianism is that libertarianism is a form of wiggery, and the first wig was the devil. Furthermore, this idea of presenting Dr. Paul, who so far as I can tell is nothing but a profoundly decent old man, as some kind of public intellectual, and putting his name on blatantly ghost-written books reeks of 20th century politics. Fourth, there is another way to succeed in the outer party. This might be called the Huckabee Plan. On the Huckabee Plan, you succeed by being as stupid as possible. Not only does this attract a surprising number of voters who may be just as stupid or even stupider, the outer party's base is not exactly the cream of the crop, it also attracts the attention of the cathedral, whose favorite sport is to promote the worst plausible outer party candidates. As usual with the cathedral, this is a consequence of casual snobbery rather than malignant conspiracy, but it is effective nonetheless. It is always fun to write a human interest story about a really wacky peasant, especially one who happens to be running for president. And fifth, the very existence and activity of the outer party, this profoundly phony and thoroughly ineffective pseudo-alternative, 
is far and away the greatest motivator for inner party activists who believe it is a monstrous danger to their entire world. Don't say they don't believe this. I believed in the right-wing menace, the Regis Gavar, as it were, for the first quarter century of my life. Without the outer party, the cathedral system is instantly recognizable as exactly what it is, a one-party state. You'll note that when the Soviet Union collapsed, it wasn't because someone organized an opposition party and started winning in their fake elections. In fact, many of the later communist states, such as Poland and China, maintained bogus opposition parties for exactly the same reason we have an outer party, to make the people's democracy look like an actual 19th century political contest. Without the outer party, the legions of inner party youth activists we see all over the place are exactly what they appear to be, Komsomol members. They are young, ambitious people who serve the state to get ahead. In fact, often their goal is not to get ahead, but just to get laid. Once it is clear that the inner party is just the government, all the fun disappears from this enterprise. There are other ways to get laid, most of them less boring and bureaucratic. If the Republicans could somehow dissolve themselves permanently and irrevocably, it would be the most brutal blow ever struck against the Democrats. It would make Obi-Wan Kenobi look like Chad Vader. As I'll explain, passive resistance is not your only option, but it is a thousand million times better than outer party activism. Do not support the outer party. Face it, political democracy in the United States is dead. It died on March 4th, 1933, when the following words were uttered. But in the event that the Congress shall fail to take one of these two courses, and in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. FDR is often credited with preserving democracy, he preserved democracy in about the same way that the Russians preserved Lenin. More precisely, it was his opponents who preserved the pickled corpse of democracy. When again and again FDR made these kinds of crude threats and they failed to call his bluff, Justice Van de Vanter has a lot to answer for. Democracy sucks. It never worked in the first place. Pobedo Nostsev got it exactly right. If you read British travelers' accounts of 19th century American democracy, when we had the real original thing, and theirs was still heavily diluted with aristocracy, the phenomenon sounds terrifying and barbaric. It sounds, in fact, distinctly Nazi. And where do you think the Nazis got their mob management technology? By listening to Beethoven, perhaps. By reading Goethe. And since democracy is dead, the idea of restoring it is doubly quixotic. If you have to pick something dead to restore, at least find something that everyone understands is dead. It would actually be much easier and certainly far more productive to restore the Stuarts. For example, the British writer Richard North, who is not a porn star but the proprietor of EU referendum, perhaps the world's best blog on the reality of government today, has a fine two-part essay on the failure of the Eurosceptic movement. That is the movement to rescue the UK from assimilation into the curiously Soviet-like and thoroughly undemocratic EU. What astounds Dr. North so much is that no one seems to care all the Sturm und Drang of the 19th century, all the democratic foo and the jingoism and the socialism and all the rest, and the British people are letting it all just be sucked away into a creepy-looking building in Belgium from which all important decisions are handed down by transnational bureaucrats who could sign on as extras in Brazil, too, without the cost and inconvenience of a baby mask. And it's not just the U.S. I mean, good Lord Ireland. All the ink that was shed over home rule, all the blood, too, the unquenchable Celtic passion of the fiery, irrepressible Celt, and they can scarcely be bothered to give a tinker's damn whether they are governed from Dublin or from Brussels. What in the world can be going on? What is going on is that the voters of both Britain and Ireland, though they may not know it consciously, are perfectly aware of the game. As anyone who has read the Crossman Diaries knows, their politicians handed off power to faceless bureaucrats a long, long time ago, just as ours did. The only real question is what city and office building their faceless bureaucrats work in and what nationality they are, and why should it possibly matter? So Dr. North concludes his entire well-reasoned discussion with this pathetic creed occur. To achieve that happy outcome, though, 
we have to answer the question that the elites have been evading ever since they decided to take refuge in the arms of Europe. What is Britain's role in the world? On reflection, I have come to the view that it is the failure to address this question which has given rise to many of the ills in our society. As have our politicians internalized, so has the population. Lacking, if you like, a higher calling, the sense that there is something more to our nation than the pursuit of comfort, prosperity, and a plasma television in the corner, we too have become self-obsessed, inwards-looking, and selfish. In effect, therefore, we are looking for the vision thing, a sense of purpose as a nation, a uniting ethos which will restore our sense of pride and reinforce our national identity, which the EU has been so assiduously undermining. What bland shite! Dr. North, here's a modest proposal for your national identity. I suggest a Stuart restoration in an independent England. Through some beautiful twist of fate, the Stuart succession has become entangled with the House of Liechtenstein, who just happened to be the last working royal family in Europe. The father-son team of Hans Adam II and hereditary Prince Alois are not decorative abstractions. They are effectively the CEOs of Liechtenstein, which is a small country but a real one nonetheless. As you'll see if you read the links, the last reform in Liechtenstein actually increased the royal executive power. Take that, 20th century. And Prince Alois's son, 13-year-old Prince Joseph Wenzel, just happens to be the legitimate heir to the Stuart throne illegally overthrown in a coup based on the notorious warming pan legend. Therefore, the structure of a restoration is obvious. The Hanoverians have failed. They have become decorative pseudo-monarchs. And as for the system of government that has grown up under them, it makes Richard Cromwell look like a smashing success. Restore the Stuarts under King Joseph I with Prince Alois as regent, and the problem is solved. Unrealistic? Au contraire, mon frere? What is unrealistic is a sense of purpose as a nation, a uniting ethos which will restore our sense of pride. Frankly, England does not deserve pride. It has gone to the dogs, and that may be an insult to dogs. If England is to restore its sense of pride, it needs to start with its sense of shame. And the first thing it should be ashamed of is the pathetic excuse for a government that afflicts it at present and will afflict it for the indefinite future until something drastic is done. For example, According to official statistics, between 1900 and 1992, the crime rate in Great Britain, indictable offenses per capita known to the police, increased by a factor of 46. That's not 46%. Oh, no. That's 4,600%. Many of the offenders having been imported specially to make England brighter and more colorful. This isn't a government. It's a crime syndicate. Ideally, a Stuart restoration would happen on much the same conditions as the restoration of Charles II, except perhaps with an extra caveat, a total lustration of the present administration. It has not partly, sort of, kind of, maybe failed. It has failed utterly, irrevocably, disastrously, and terminally. Therefore, the entire present regime, politicians and civil servants and quangocrats and all, except for essential security and technical personnel, should be retired on full pay and barred from any future official employment. Why pick nits? The private sector is full of competent managers. You can import them from America if you need. Don't make the mistake of trying to sweep out the Augean stables. Just apply the river. If a concession must be made to modern mores, however, I think this time around there is no need to hang any corpses. In order to make a Stuart restoration happen, Dr. North, you have to accomplish one of the following two things. You either need to persuade a majority of the population of England, or Great Britain if you prefer, but England as a historic jurisdiction without a present government is quite an appealing target, that it needs to happen. Or you need to persuade the British Army that it needs to happen. The former is preferable. The latter is dangerous, but hardly unprecedented. Frankly, the present situation is dangerous as well. Neither of these options involves any of the following acts. Starting a new political party, recruiting a paramilitary fascist skinhead stormtroop brigade, or engaging in eternal debates about the policies and procedures of the restored polity. All of these are crucial, but the third especially. Note the difference between organizing a royal restoration and organizing a democratic revival. The latter, simply because of the open landscape of power it must create, offers an infinite plane across which an arbitrary oil slick of random crackpot ideas can spread out indefinitely creating a movement with less cohesion than the average pubic hair. 
see under UKIP. The former is a single decision. It is far less complicated than voting. Either you want to restore the rightful King of England, or you'd rather take your chances with the faceless bureaucrats. Either you're a neo-Jacobite or you're not. There are no factions, parties, personality conflicts, etc., etc. What will the New England look like? You don't even have to think about it. It is not your job to think about it. It is Prince Regent Alois's job, the miracle of absolute monarchy, Stuart style. If he runs the place a quarter as well as he runs Vaduz, if he can get the crime rate per 100,000 back down to 2.4 from 109.4, historians will be kissing his ass for the next four centuries. Perhaps he can get Lee Kuan Yew in as a consultant. You have many difficulties in making a Stuart restoration happen. But perhaps the greatest is that most Englishmen simply have no idea what living in a competently governed country would be like. Liechtenstein, while quite well run, is too small to serve as an illustration. Singapore is definitely a better bet. Here is a speech made last year by Lee Sien Lung, who just, um, happens to be the son of Lee Kuan Yew. Read this speech, obviously composed by Prime Minister Lee himself. It certainly does not betray the speechwriter's art. And imagine living in a country in which the chief administrator talks to the residents in a normal voice as if speaking to grown-ups. Yes, men and women of England, this is what American-style democracy has deprived you of. We're sorry. We promise we won't do it again. This sort of transition in government is what here at UR we call a reset. It's just like rebooting your computer when for some reason it gets gunked up and seems to be running slowly. Are you interested in debugging it? Would you like to activate the kernel console, perhaps look at the thread table, check out some registers, see what virtual memory is doing? Is a bear Catholic? Does the Pope, anyway? Or perhaps it's a little more like reinstalling Windows. The gunk could be a virus, after all. Rebooting will not remove a virus. Better yet, you could replace Windows with Linux. That way you won't just get the same virus right away again. I think a Stuart restoration in England is about as close as it comes to replacing Windows with Linux. There are three basic principles to any reset. First, the existing government must be thoroughly lustrated. There is no point in trying to debug or reform it. There is certainly no need for individual purges, McCarthy style, or for Fragabogan and Purcellshiner, a la 1945. Except for the security forces and essential technical personnel, all employees should be thanked for their service. Asked to submit contact information so that they can be hired as temporary consultants if the new administration finds it necessary and discharged with no hard feelings, an amnesty for any crimes they may have committed in government service, and a pension sufficient to retire. Second, a reset is not a revolution. A revolution is a criminal conspiracy in which murderous, deranged adventurers capture a state for their arbitrary and usually sinister purposes. A reset is a restoration of secure, effective, and responsible government. It's true that both involve regime change, but both sex and rape involve penetration. Of course, a failed reset can degenerate into a revolution. No doubt many involved in the rise to power of Hitler and Mussolini thought of their project as a reset. They were quite mistaken. It is a cruel irony to free a nation of democracy, only to saddle it with gangsters. There is a simple way to distinguish the two. Just as the new permanent government must not retain employees of the old government, it must not employ or reward anyone involved in bringing the reset about. A successful reset may involve an interim administration which does have personal continuity with the reset effort, but if so, this regime must be discarded as thoroughly as the old regime. This policy eliminates all meretricious motivations. Third, and most important, a reset must happen in a single step. It is not a gradual effort in which a new party builds support by incrementally moving into positions of responsibility, as the Labour Party did in the 20th century. As we've seen, this Fabian approach only works from right to left. The only way for a reactionary movement to acquire power incrementally is to soil itself by participating in political democracy, a form of government it despises as much as any sensible person. Besides, since there is no such thing as a partial reset, there are no meaningful incremental policies that resetters can support. You can restore the Stuarts or not restore the Stuarts, but you can't restore 36% of the Stuarts. A reset is the result of a single successful operation. Ideally, the old regime simply concedes peacefully and of its own free will that it has lost the confidence of the people. 
and obeys all legal niceties in conveying full executive power to the new administration. This is more or less the way the Soviet satellites collapsed, for example. It can get more complicated than this, but not much more complicated. Whatever is done, there should be no security vacuum and certainly no actual fighting. Real reactionaries don't go off half-cocked. There is a simple way to execute a reset without falling into the dead-end trap of politics and without the assistance of the military. Conduct your own election. Enroll supporters directly over the Internet, verifying their identity as voters. Once you have a solid and unquestionable majority, form an interim administration and request the transfer of government. And it will happen. You may not even need an absolute majority. The modern regime is quite immune to politics, but it is tremendously sensitive to public opinion. It cannot afford to be disliked. Like every bully, it is a great coward, especially if it is given a comfortable way out, thus the amnesty and the pension. If you have your majority and still the regime does not concede, this and only this is the time to turn to the official elections. The truth about the people who work for government is that in general they despise it. They are demoralized and disillusioned. They have slightly more excitement and energy than your average Stasi employee circa 1988, but not much. Working for the government in 1938 was incredible, unbelievable fun. Working for the government in 2008 is soul-destroying. If you gave the entire civil service an opportunity to retire tomorrow on full pay, nine out of ten would take it and lick your hand like golden retrievers for the offer. Chapter 9. How to Uninstall a Cathedral I'm afraid, dear open-minded progressive, that we have wandered into deep and murky waters. You thought you were merely in for a bit of philosophical wrangling. Instead, here we are, openly conspiring to restore the Stuarts. The other day, in an old book, I found a cute little summary of the problem. The book is Carlton Hayes' History of Modern Europe, first published in 1916 and updated in 1924. Writing about modern Europe without mentioning America is a little like writing about the Lakers without mentioning Kobe Bryant. And in the 1924 addendum, Professor Hayes simply gives up the ghost and tells us what's happened lately in the Western world. Of course, I simply adore these kinds of contemporary digests. Here is the state of Protestant Christianity, circa 1924. Among Protestant Christian sects, there were several significant movements toward cooperation and even toward formal union. Many barriers between them were broken down, at least in part, by the Young Men's Christian Association, which had been founded in the 19th century, but which expanded very rapidly during and after the Great War. The Salvation Army, dating from about the year 1880, was another factor in the same process. It placed emphasis on spiritual earnestness, on evangelical work among the poor, and on charitable endeavors, rather than on sectarian controversies. There were also various federations of churches, and in Canada, after the Great War, several Protestant denominations were actually united. Such interdenominational and unifying movements were made easier by the fact that the original theological differences between the various sects were no longer regarded as very important by a large number of church members. Some Protestants, reacting against the decline of dogma and the doubting of the miraculous and the supernatural, turned increasingly toward Christian science or toward spiritualism or theosophy. In some countries, and especially in the United States, the current vogue of Darwinism and other theories of evolution caused a new outburst of opposition from stalwart groups of Protestants to the claims of science and a stubborn reaffirmation of their fundamental faith in the literal inspiration of the Bible. These fundamentalists, as they were called, were fairly numerous in several Protestant denominations, and they contested with their progressive or modernist brethren the control of Protestant churches, particularly the Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Baptist, and Methodist. Now I ask you, dear open-minded progressive, is there anything familiar about this picture? The YMCA and the Salvation Army are, sadly, no longer major players. But it seems obvious that Professor Hayes is describing our present red state versus blue state conflict. What's weird, however, is that he seems to be describing it as a theological dispute, not exactly the present perception. Your present-day progressive or modernist may retain some vestigial belief in God, or not. But she certainly does not think of her faction as a Christian supersect. Meanwhile, her fundamentalist adversaries have largely appropriated the label Christian. 
Neither side sees the red-blue conflict as that old staple of European history, the Christian sectarian war. There are a couple of other interesting details in Professor Hayes' little narrative. One, he finds it noteworthy that the mainstream Protestant sects are for some odd reason converging. And indeed, in 1924, it was a historical novelty to see Episcopalians and Presbyterians cooperating amicably on charitable endeavors, forgetting all those nasty old theological differences, dogs and cats living together. Two, it is clear, at least from Professor Hayes' perspective, that the progressive or modernist side of this conflict is the mainstream of American Protestantism, and the fundamentalist side is a weird, stubborn mutation. To our modern fundamentalists, the term has become so opprobrious that they will respond better. Dear open-minded progressive, if you use the word traditionalist, the idea that liberalism is actually mainstream Protestant Christianity is about as off the wall as it gets, and it must strike most progressives as equally weird. But here it is in black and white from a legendary Columbia historian. Obviously, someone is off the wall. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you. Are you feeling paranoid yet, dear reader? When dealing with historical movements, it's often useful to ask, is this dead or alive? If the former, what killed it, when and how? If you cannot find any answers to these questions, it is a pretty good clue that you're looking at something which isn't dead. And if it's not dead, it must be alive. And if it's alive, but you no longer identify it as a distinct movement, the only possible answer is that it has become so pervasive that you do not distinguish between it and reality itself. In other words... You do not feel you have any serious alternative to supporting the movement, and you are probably right. Note that this is exactly how you, dear open-minded progressive, see the modern children of those stubborn fundamentalists. You read the conflict asymmetrically. You don't think of yourself as someone who believes in progressivism. You don't believe in anything. You are not a follower at all. You are a critical and independent thinker. Rather, it is your fundamentalist enemies, the tribe across the river, who are Jesus-besotted zombie bots. The first step toward a historical perspective on the conflict is to acknowledge that both of these traditions are exactly that, traditions. You did not invent progressivism any more than Billy Joe invented fundamentalism. Thanks to Professor Hayes, we know this absolutely, because we know that both of these things existed 84 years ago, and you are not 84. And what is the difference between a mere tradition and an honest-to-God religion? Theology. A many-God or a three-God or a one-God tradition is a religion. A no-God tradition is... Well, there isn't really a word for it, is there? This is a good clue that someone has been tampering with the tools you use to think. Because there must be as many ways to not believe in a God or gods as to believe in them. I am an atheist. You are an atheist. But you are a progressive, and I am not a progressive. If we can have multiple sects of Christianity, why can't we have multiple sects of atheism? Let's rectify this linguistic sabotage by calling a no-God tradition in our religion. A one-God tradition is a uni-religion. A two-God one is a di-religion. A three-God one is a tri-religion. One with more gods than you can shake a stick at is a poly-religion. And so on. We see instantly that while progressivism, 2008 style, is an air religion, it does not at all follow that it is the one true air religion. Oops. Question. In a political conflict between a di-religion and a poly-religion, which side should you support? What about an a-religion versus a tri-religion? Let's assume that, like me, you believe in no gods at all. One easy answer is to say the fewer gods, the better. So we would automatically support the di-religion over the poly-religion, etc. I think the stupidity of this is obvious. We could also say that all traditions which promote gods are false and therefore we should favor the A-religion over the tri-religion. Unfortunately, even if we assume that the A-religion is right on the deity question and not even one of the three gods exists, the two could not engage in a political conflict if they did not disagree on many subjects in the temporal plane. Who is more likely to be right on these mundane matters which actually do matter? We have no reason at all to think that just because the A-religion is right about gods, it is right about anything else. And we have no reason at all to think that just because the tri-religion is wrong about gods, it is wrong about anything else. So this is really just as stupid. And I do hope you haven't been taken in by it. Lots of smart people believe stupid things. The second step is to acknowledge the possibility that, on any issue, both competing traditions could be peddling misperceptions. In fact, we've just seen it. 
Neither side wants you to know that progressivism is the historical mainstream of Protestant Christianity. Only in the pages of smelly old books, and of course here at UR, will you find this little tidbit of history. This is pretty standard for religions, which always have a habit of obscuring their own pasts. Why do both sides agree on this misperception? The fundamentalist motivation is obvious. As a traditionalist Christian, you believe in God. It is obvious that anyone who doesn't believe in God cannot possibly be a Christian. The idea that there could be any kind of historical continuity between people who believe in God and people who don't believe in God is absurd. It's like saying that Jesus was just some dude. But as someone who doesn't believe in God, you have absolutely no reason to accept this argument. Do you care, dear open-minded progressive, what wacky stuff those wacky fundies believe in? Do you care whether they worship God in one person, God in three persons, God in 47 persons, or God in the person of a turtle? Um, no. No. From the progressive side, there is a very different problem. The problem is that if progressivism is indeed a Christian supersect, it is also a criminal conspiracy. Assuming you're an American, dear open-minded progressive, you might have forgotten that it's quite literally illegal for the federal government to make an establishment of religion. While its authors and ratifiers never meant the clause to mean what it means today, we do have a living constitution, the law is what it is now, and over the last half century, our friends in high places have been quite enthusiastic about deploying it against their fundamentalist foes. Perhaps some perspective can be obtained by replacing the words modernist and fundamentalist in Professor Hayes's narrative with Sunni and Shia. The First Amendment does not say Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of Shiism. More to the point, it does not say Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion until that religion manages to sneak God under the carpet, at which point go ahead, dudes. Rather, the obvious spirit of the law is that Congress shall be neutral with respect to the theological disputes of its citizens, such as that described by Professor Hayes. Um, has it been? If you doubt this, maybe it's time to put on the fundamentalins. This is a cute optical accessory that transforms all things Sunni into things Shia and vice versa. When you're wearing the fundamentalins, progressive institutions look fundamentalist and fundamentalist institutions look progressive. In the fundamentalins, Harvard and Stanford and Yale are fundamentalist seminaries. It may not be official, but there is no doubt about it at all. They emit Jesus-freak code words, secret Mormon handshakes, and miscellaneous Bible baloney, the way a baby emits fermented milk. Meanwhile, Bob Jones and Oral Roberts and Patrick Henry are diverse, progressive, socially and environmentally conscious centers of learning. Their entire freshman class lines up to sing Imagine every morning. Would it creep you out, dear open-minded progressive, to live in this country? It would certainly creep me out, and I'm not even a progressive, though I was raised as one. An America where every progressive in any position of influence or authority was replaced by an equal and opposite fundamentalist and vice versa is one you would have no hesitation in describing as a fundamentalist theocracy, which implies quite inexorably that the America we do live in, the real one, can be fairly described as a progressive atheocracy that is a system of government based on an official a religion, progressivism. This a religion is maintained and propagated by the decentralized system of quasi-official educational institutions, which we here at UR have learned to call the cathedral. In this chapter, we'll look purely in a theoretical manner, of course, at what it might take to get rid of this thing. If you find the exercise unpalatable, dear open-minded progressive, just snap the fundamentalins back on and imagine you're trying to free your government from the icy, inexorable grip of Jesus or the Pope. The resemblance between anti-fundamentalism and its older brother, anti-Catholicism, may be too obvious to mention, but I should mention it anyway. Obviously, I don't object to the cathedral on account of its atheism. If a theist can object to theocracy, an atheist can object to atheocracy. I object to the concept of official thought in general, to the details of progressivism in specific, but most of all to the insidious way in which the cathedral has managed to mutate its way around the separation of church and state in which it so hypocritically indoctrinates its acolytes. The cathedral is the apotheosis of chutzpah. It is always poisoning its parents, then pleading for clemency as an orphan. I know, I know. We have been through all this stuff before. On the Internet, it never hurts to repeat, however, 
and let's take a brief look at the cathedral's operations in the case of one James Watson. Here is the transcript of an interview between Dr. Watson and Henry Louis Gates. If you care to go here, you can read Professor Gates' meandering, incoherent summary and even watch some video. Bear in mind that this material, though only recently released, was produced shortly after the struggle session to which Dr. Watson was subjected early this year. The young firebrands over at Gene Expression, many of whom themselves work inside the cathedral, as of course all serious scientists must, had predictable responses, painful to read. Is Watson one of these people who has balls only when he's dealing with people lower down the ladder and none when he is dealing with people who can do him harm? Had to stop reading almost immediately. Presumably, his confession ended with his execution by a pack of trained dogs. What a simpering, mewling, weakling he is in this interview, terrified and cowed. Okay, obviously, as a bitter and negative person myself, I sympathize with these reactions. But I mean, if we compare Dr. Watson to Andrei Sakharov, surely a fair comparison. Did Dr. Sakharov go around shouting, communism is a lie, better dead than red? Somehow I doubt it. In fact, neither Watson nor Sakharov were executed by a pack of trained dogs. These guys aren't completely stupid. They know how far to push it. And Dr. Watson even manages to get Professor Gates, whose career cannot be understood without reference to the color of his skin, to swallow the following harmless-looking red pill. J.W. It was. We shouldn't expect that people in different parts of the world have equal intelligence, because we all know that. And people say that these should be the same. I think the answer is we don't know. Q. We don't know. Not that they are. J.W. No, no, I'm always trying to say is that some people of left-wing persuasion have said that there wasn't enough time for differences. We don't know. That's all. Q. We don't know. We don't know. And we can tell that the pill has gotten deep down inside Professor Gates. It has been swallowed and digested and worked its way through the bloodstream and is starting to produce that awful wiry feeling in the glial cells by a question he asks earlier. Q, but imagine if you were an African or an African-American intellectual, and it's ten years from now, and you pick up the New York Times, its table, and some geneticist says, A, that intelligence is genetic, and B, the difference is measured on standardized tests between black people and white people, is traceable to a genetic basis. What would you, as a black intellectual, do, do you think? Here is the problem. The message our beloved cathedral has been implanting in all the young smart kids at Harvard and Yale and Stanford, the cream of the crop, the top 1%, not to mention the readers of the New York Times who are the top 10%, is not we don't know. Oh, no. The message is we do know, and they are equal. In fact, we are so sure they're equal that if you even start to hint that you might disagree, we will do everything we can to destroy your life, and we will feel good about it, because your opinions are evil and you are too. So it's not even a question of ten years from now. White-coated scientists exercising their papal infallibility through the ordinary magisterium of Times Square do not need to declare their final and inexorable proof of A and B, thus proving that the cathedral has been broadcasting mendacity since 1924 and enforcing it since 1984. We need await nothing. Any intelligent person can already read the contradiction. Professor Gates has said it out loud. If you accept Dr. Watson's fallback position, his intellectual Torres Vedras, as Professor Gates does, the cathedral is already a goner. Its defeat is not a matter for further research. It is a matter of freshman philosophy. The cathedral has chosen to fortify, not as a minor outpost, but as its central keep, the position of not A and not B. Actually, since not A or not B would suffice, the typical insistence on both is a classic sign of a weak position. Its belief in the statistical uniformity of the human brain across all subpopulations presently living is absolute. It has put all its chips on this one, and the evidence for its position is really not much stronger than the evidence for the Holy Trinity, in fact, the Holy Trinity has a big advantage. There may be no evidence for it, but at least there is none against it. There is plenty of evidence against human neurological uniformity. The question is simply what standard of proof you apply. By the standards that most of us apply to most questions of fact, the answer is already obvious, and has been for at least 30 years, if not a 100. Moreover, there is a simple explanation for the reason that so many people believe in human neurological uniformity, HNU. It is a core doctrine of Christianity. Even more precisely, 
It is a core doctrine of the neo-primitive Christianity that we call Protestantism. And specifically, I believe it to be a mutated and metastasized version of the Quaker doctrine of the inner light. Basically, all humans must be neurologically uniform because we all have the same little piece of God inside us. All the American Protestant sects, or at least all the northern ones, became heavily Quakerized during the 19th century, but that's a different discussion. Thus, what we call hate speech is merely a 20th century name for the age-old crime of blasphemy. You might have noticed that it is not, and has never been, illegal to be an asshole. No government in history has ever come close to criminalizing rudeness, nastiness, meanness, or even harassment in general, not even in the workplace. Denying the inner light, however, is another matter entirely. It's all too easy to put in the fundamental ends, transport ourselves to Margaret Atwood world, and imagine the commander processing an assembly line of blasphemers with this handy neo-Quaker catchphrase, scorned the testimony of equality, violated right ordering, denied the inner light. Defendant, I think the case is clear. Five years of orientation. So it is almost impossible for me to answer Professor Gates's question. Asking what a black intellectual should do after A and B are demonstrated is like asking what a professor of Marxist-Leninist studies should do after the fall of the Soviet Union. I don't know, dude. What else are you good at? Professor Gates' entire department consists of the construction of increasingly elaborate persecution theories to explain facts which follow trivially from A and B. Agree on A and B, and the world has no need at all for Professor Gates, nor for any of his colleagues. He seems like a pretty sharp guy. Surely he can find something. If not, there's always pizza delivery. The trouble is that, as we've just seen, a and B need not be shown to demonstrate the presence of official mendacity. It is sufficient to demonstrate that A and B are plausible. More strongly, it is sufficient to demonstrate that they are not implausible, because we are constantly being educated to believe that they are implausible. The proposition is implied a thousand times for every time it is stated, but progressivism without HNU makes about as much sense as Islam without Allah. So if refuting a proposition on which the cathedral has staked its credibility is sufficient to defeat it, and that refutation is agreed on by all serious thinkers, why the heck is it still here? Duh. If institutional mendacity is its stock in trade, why on earth should refutation bother it? You don't have to look far for other cases in which entire departments of the cathedral have been devoted to the propagation of nonsense. What do you expect them to do, say... We're sorry, it's true, we are all a bunch of shills. We'll go work as taxi drivers now? If the cathedral can lie now, it can lie then. It doesn't matter what Dr. Watson and his students produce, now or ten years from now. If it is impossible for the New York Times to produce a story saying that A and B are proven, no such story will appear. Rather, the standard of proof will simply be raised and raised again, as of course it has been already. In other words... If the cathedral were a trustworthy mechanism for producing and distributing information, we would expect it to correct any newly discovered error and propagate the correction. But if it were a trustworthy mechanism, it would not already be in an obvious error state, have maintained that error state for decades, and show no signs at all of nudging Professor Gates out of the building and into his new career as a marketing executive. Therefore, to expect it to correct its own errors is naive, at best. And therefore, you and I have two choices. We can accept that we live in a state of systematic mendacity, as people always have. Note that it may well be getting worse rather than better, and figure out how to live with it. This would be the prudent choice. It demonstrates genuine wisdom, the wisdom of resignation and healthy personal motivation. On the other hand, if you have enough time to read these essays, you have enough time to think about solutions. After all, you already live under a government which demands that you invest a substantial percentage of your neural tissue in the meaningless gabble of politics. This lobe should probably be devoted to dance, literature, or shopping. But we are, after all, human. In addition to our healthier and more positive cogitations, we sometimes express resentment. And what more pleasant repost than to reprogram one's political control module and turn it against its former botmasters? So we can separate the problem into two categories. One is a policy question. How can the American political system be modified to free itself from the cathedral? 
Two is a military question, considering war and politics as a continuum. Since the cathedral does not wish to relinquish power, how can it best be induced to do so? The two are inseparable, of course, but it is convenient to consider them separately. In this chapter, we'll look at the first. There are two basic ways of executing this divorce. We'll call one a soft reset and the other a hard reset. Basically, a hard reset works and a soft reset doesn't. However, a soft reset is more attractive in many ways, and we need to work through it just to see why it can't work. In a soft reset, we leave the current structure of government the same, except that we apply the 20th century First Amendment to all forms of instruction, theistic or secular. In other words, our policy is separation of education and state. In a free country, the government should not be programming its citizens. It should not care at all what people think. It only needs to care what they do. The issue has nothing to do with theism. It is a basic matter of personal freedom. You cannot have official education without official truth, that is, pravda. Most, in fact, I'd say almost all of our pravda is indeed true. Call it 99.9%. The remaining 0.1% is creepy enough. The Third Reich used the wonderful word Aufklarung, meaning enlightenment or literally clearing up. Every time I see a piece of public education designed to improve the world by improving my character, I think of Aufklarung. But, of course, a good Nazi education imparted many true truths as well. There are four major forms of education in a modern Western society. Churches, schools, universities, and the press. Our open-minded progressives have done a fantastic job of separating church and state. I really don't think their work can be improved on. A soft reset is simply a matter of applying the precedent to the other three. First, let's deal with primary schools. This is easy because they are actually formal arms of the government. To separate school and state, liquidate the public school system, selling all its assets to the highest bidder. For every student in or eligible for public school, for every year of eligibility, compute what the school system was getting and send the check to the parents. This is budget neutral for state and family alike. And unlike vouchers, it does not require Uncle Sam or any of his little brothers to decide what education is. If the worst parents in the world spend the money on Xboxes and PCP, it would still be a vast improvement on inner-city schools. The perfect is the enemy of the good. This leaves us with the cathedral proper, the press, and the universities. The great thing about our understanding of the wall of separation is that it works both ways. The distinction between a state-controlled church and a church-controlled state is nil. In the modern interpretation of the First Amendment, both are equally obnoxious, although I suspect most progressives would find the latter especially repugnant. The same amendment prescribes the freedom of the press, but the freedom of the press and the separation of church and state are applied in very different ways. The suggestion of a state-controlled press evokes terrible fear and anger in the progressive mind. The suggestion of a press-controlled state evokes nothing. Even the concept is unfamiliar. Unless they happen to be Tony Blair, I don't think most progressives have even considered the idea that the press could control the state. No points for guessing why this might be. And the same principle applies to our independent universities. Except briefly during the McCarthy period, about which more in a moment, no one in government has ever considered trying to tell the professors what to think, just as no one in government has ever considered telling the preachers what to preach. But while professors and preachers are both free to offer policy suggestions, it would be a scandal if the latter's advice was regularly accepted. Let's take a hat tip from the blogosphere's invaluable inside source in the cathedral, Dr. Evil Timothy Burke, who links with applause to how this works. In the early 21st century, there is no limit or constraint on the desire of public constituencies to profit from the perspective of a university-based historian. Even better, the usual lament of the humanities. There is plenty of money to support work in science and engineering, but very little to support work in the humanities proves to be accurate only if you define work in the humanities in the narrowest and most conventional way. If, by that phrase, you mean only individualistic research directed at arcane topics detached from real-world needs and written in inaccessible and insular jargon, there is indeed very limited money. But for a humanities professor willing to take up applied work, sources of money are unexpectedly abundant. Applied work. I love the phrase. It belongs right up there with manipulating procedural outcomes. 
And what does the author, Professor Limerick, mean by applied work? Another nearly completed project, the nature of justice, racial equity and environmental well-being, spotlights the involvement of ethnic minorities with environmental issues. The center works regularly with federal agencies ranging from the Environmental Protection Agency to the National Park Service. The involvement of ethnic minorities with environmental issues. You can't make this stuff up. I suppose she doesn't mean that they leave used diapers on the beach or engage in the ethnic cleansing of pelicans. I don't think I've linked to Miss Latte before. She appears to be a racist Jewish woman in her 50s. Her signature post is definitely this one. Why is it that Professor Limerick is not just regularly called upon to share her Aufklärung with the EPA? Don't miss the picture. But apparently quite well compensated for it. Whereas Miss Latte has no such opportunity to contribute her insights on the Mexican-Pelican interaction? Well, a lot of reasons, really. But the main one is that EPA, to sound like an insider, dropped the article, recognizes Professor Limerick as an official authority. Uncle Sam may not tell the University of Colorado what to do, but the converse is not the case. And if you are a bureaucrat fighting for some outcome or other, and you can bring Professor Limerick in on your side, you are more likely to win. Apparently, she is compensated for the service. This is not surprising. If we lived in a theocracy as opposed to an atheocracy, she might be Bishop Limerick, and her thoughts would carry just the same weight. They might be different thoughts, of course. They probably would be. Frankly, I would much rather be governed by the Pope than by these people. At least it would be a change, and I do believe in change. To separate university and state the way church and state are separated, we'd need to make some fairly drastic changes. Of course, all the rivers of state cash that flow to the universities need to be plugged. No grants to professors, no subsidies for students, no nothing. But this is the easy part. The hard part is that to divorce itself completely, the state needs to stop recognizing the authority of the universities. For example, it is staffed largely with university graduates, many of whom are students of Professor Burke, Professor Limerick, and the like. Perhaps there is no way to avoid this, but there is a way to make it not matter. Add university credentials to the list of official no-nos in HR decisions. Treat it like race, age, and marital status. Don't even let applicants put it on their resumes. Instead, use the good old system, competitive examination. Professor Limerick's little pep talks aside, in some rare cases, a government does need to conduct actual research. In that case, it needs to hire actual researchers. Want to hire a chemist? Give her a chemistry test. Nor need this be limited to new employees. Why not re-examine the present ones to see if they know anything and have any brains? Okay, that takes care of the universities. Moving on to the press. There is a simple way for the state to separate itself from the press. Adopt the same public communication policies used in private companies. Perhaps the leader in this area is that progressive favorite, Apple. This Google search tells the story. Apple is unusual in that it actually has many deranged fans who want to extract non-public information. But of course, the same can be said of governments. All private companies in the known universe, however, have the same policy. Any unauthorized communication with anyone outside the company, journalist or otherwise, is a firing offense. Often it will also expose you to litigation. Somehow, even Apple manages to be quite successful in enforcing this policy. In general, it simply doesn't happen. If you are familiar with the area of technology journalism, you know that far from making for dull news, the rarity of leaks makes for extremely spicy and scurrilous trade rags, such as this one. The day U.S. foreign policy is reported a la register is the day the cathedral is no more. When it comes to significant operational details that might affect a company's stock price, leaking information, whether authorized or not, is actually a crime. As well it should be. Managements used to be free to leak to the investment community, but this loophole was closed in one of the few positive changes in corporate law in recent years, Reg FD. The reasoning behind Reg FD is excellent. The problem with selective disclosure of financial information is that it creates a power loop between management and selected investors, allowing big fish to benefit from inside information that is more or less a payoff. It still happens, I'm sure. The edges of material information are fuzzy, but much less. Ideally, Reg FD would be extended to prohibit any informal communication with Wall Street. If a company has something to say, its website is the place to do it. 
In government, selective disclosure creates a power network between the press and its sources. This network does not produce money, but just power. The power is shared between the sources and the journalists. The whole system is about as transparent as mud. The case that created the modern American system of government by leak was the Pentagon Papers case, in which McNamara's policy shop at DOD, ironically the ancestor of Douglas Fyth's much maligned operation, wrote a study of Vietnam which revealed that the Viet Cong was not a North Vietnamese puppet, had the support of the Vietnamese people, and could never be defeated militarily, especially not by the corrupt and incompetent ARVN. The Joint Chiefs yawned. Daniel Ellsberg quite illegally leaked his own department's work to the Times, which used it quite effectively to amaze the public, which had no idea that Washington was a place in which the Defense Department might well employ whole nests of pro-VC intellectuals, and regarded the study as a declaration against interest. In the public's mind, the Pentagon was one thing. The fact that it was pursuing a war that its own experts had decided was unwinnable was permanently fatal to its credibility. The Supreme Court ruled that the Pentagon could not restrain publication of the study. They did not rule that the Times could not be prosecuted after the fact. But of course it never was. The coup had been accomplished. A new phase of the Fourth Republic was born. Later, the ARVN defeated the Viet Cong, whose support was based on brutal terror, and which was indeed no more than an arm of the NVA. No one cared. Doubtless Ellsberg's conscience was quite genuine, but facts matter. There's a fine line between speaking truth to power and speaking power to truth. These hidden power networks, I am particularly enchanted by the word whistleblower, which often simply means informer, are one of the main tools that civil servants use to govern Washington from below. As a journalist, you maintain a complicated and delicate relationship with your sources, who are your bread and butter. Most of the power is probably on the side of the sources, but it goes in the other direction as well. In any case, no investigative journalist has to investigate anything. Anyone in the government is perfectly happy to feed him not just information, but often what are essentially pre-written stories under the table. Eliminating selective disclosure terminates this whole nefarious network. When the U.S. government has something to say, it says it. And it says it to all Americans at the same time. There is no privileged network of court historians, a journalist is a historian of now, who get secret, special access. This is not a complicated proposition. The system of officially favored journalists, like so many corruptions of American government, dates largely to FDR. Frankly, these swine have afflicted us too long. So that is the soft reset, the separation of education and state. It doesn't sound too hard, does it? Actually, I think it's impossible. Now that we've explained it, we can look at what's wrong with it. Consider another attempt to deal with the cathedral, McCarthyism. One could call it a crude reset. The idea was that while all of these institutions were good and healthy and true, they had been infiltrated by communists and their dupes. Purging these individuals and organizations listed in publications such as Red Channels would renew America's precious bodily fluids. Can purging work? One answer is provided by Lewick's page on McCarthyism, which could be rewritten as follows. During this time, many thousands of Americans were accused of being racists or racist sympathizers and became the subject of aggressive investigations and questioning before government or private industry panels, committees, and agencies. Suspicions were often given credence despite inconclusive or questionable evidence. And the level of threat posed by a person's real or supposed racist associations or beliefs was often greatly exaggerated. Many people suffered loss of employment, destruction of their careers, and even imprisonment. So in place of red channels, we have the SPLC and so on. The racist scare cannot be called a failure. It is socially unacceptable to express racist ideas in any context I can think of. There are certainly no racist movies, TV shows, etc. The McCarthyists, no doubt, would have been quite pleased if they could have made socialism as politically incorrect as racism is today. They never had a millionth of the power they would have needed to do so. The obvious inspiration for McCarthyism was the way in which the New Deal had succeeded in marginalizing and destroying its critics. If you're the cathedral, this works. If you're an alcoholic senator scripted by a gay child prodigy, it doesn't. McCarthyism failed for many reasons, but the most succinct is what Machiavelli said. 
If you strike at a king, you need to kill him. The cathedral is an institution rather than a person, and certainly no one needs killing. But if you just scratch it, you're just pissing it off. If McCarthy had said, look, we fought the war in the Pacific to save China from the Japanese, and then the State Department handed it to the Russians, this is a failed organization. Let's just dissolve it and build a new foreign policy bureaucracy. He might have succeeded. He was a very popular man for a while. He might well have been able to build enough public support to liquidate state or not. But if he'd succeeded, he would at least have one accomplishment to his name. The soft reset I've described is, with all due respect to Roy Cohn, a much more sophisticated and comprehensive way to attack the cathedral. It might work, but it probably won't. First, the power structures that bind the cathedral to the rest of the apparat are not formal. They are mere social networks. If Professor Burke is right that he has real influence in the region he and his colleagues have devastated, Southern Africa, it is probably because he has trained quite a few students who work at state or in NGOs in the area. If he is wrong, all it means is that it's someone else who has the influence. Short of firing all these people, there is nothing you can do about this structure. You can't prevent people from emailing each other. Second, even if we could break down these social networks, we haven't touched the real problem. The real problem is that, as a political form, democracy is more or less a synonym for theocracy, or in this case, a theocracy. Under the theory of popular sovereignty, those who control public opinion control the government. There is no nation of autodidact philosophers. Call them priests, preachers, professors, bishops, teachers, commissars, or journalists. The botmasters will rule. The only way to escape the domination of canting, moralizing apparatchiks is to abandon the principle of vox populi, vox dei, and return to a system in which government is immune to the mental fluctuations of the masses. A secure, responsible, and effective government may listen to its residents, but it has no reason to either obey or indoctrinate them. In turn, their minds are not jammed by the gaseous emanations of those who would seize power by mastering the mob. So if you manage the Herculean task of separating cathedral and state, but leave both intact, you have no reason to think that the same networks will not just form over again. In fact, you have every reason to believe that they will. Third, and worst, the level of political power you would need to execute a soft reset is precisely the same level of power you would need to execute a hard reset. That is full power, absolute sovereignty, total dictatorship, whatever you want to call it. Except inasmuch as it might be easier to construct a coalition to mandate a soft reset, softness has no advantage. The people who presently enjoy power will resist both with the same energy, all the energy they have. If you have the power to overcome them, why settle for half measures? In a hard reset, we converge legality and reality not by adjusting reality to conform to the First Amendment, but by adjusting the law to recognize the reality of government power. First, a hard reset only makes sense with the definition we gave in Chapter 8, unconditional replacement of all government employees. This will break up your social networks. A hard reset should also be part of a transition to some post-democratic form of government or the same problems will reoccur. But this is a long-term issue. Most important, however, in a hard reset, we actually expand the definition of government. As we've seen, the nominally independent educational organs, the press and the universities are the heart of power in America today. They make decisions and manufacture the consent to ratify them. Fine. They want to be part of the government, make them part of the government. In a hard reset, all organizations dedicated to forming public opinion, making or implementing public policy, or working in the public interest are nationalized. This includes not only the press and the universities, but also the foundations, NGOs, and other nonprofits. It is a bit rich, after all, for any of these outfits to appeal to the sanctity of property rights. They believe in the sanctity of property rights about as much as they believe in the goddess Kali. Once they are nationalized, treat them as the public schools were treated in the soft reset. Retire their employees and liquidate their assets. Universities in particular have lovely campuses, many of which are centrally located and should be quite attractive to developers. The trademarks, however, should be retained and sunk. The former employees of the New York Times can organize and start a newspaper. The former employees of Harvard can organize and start a college. 
but the former can't call it the New York Times nor the latter Harvard any more than you or I could create a publication or a college with those names. The goal of nationalization in a hard reset is not to create official information organs under central control. It is not even to prevent political opponents of a new regime from networking. It is simply to destroy the existing power structure, and in particular to liquidate the reputation capital that these institutions hold at present. Harvard and the Times are authorities. Silly as it sounds, their prestige is simply associated with their names. If some former employees of the Times put up a website and call it, say, the New York Journal, no one knows anything about this journal. Is it telling the truth? Or is it a fountain of lies? It has to be evaluated on its actual track record. If the old regime still exists, it could be restored at any moment. However you manage to construct the level of power you would need in order to reset Washington or any other modern government, broad public opinion will be a significant component of your power base. In a reset, you want to construct this coalition once. You don't want to have to maintain it. Resting public opinion away from the cathedral is hard enough. It should not be an ongoing process, especially since the whole point is to ditch this black art of managing the mass mind. In the cathedral system, real power is held by the educational organs, the press, and the universities, which are nominally outside the government proper. The minimum intervention required to disrupt this system is to withdraw official recognition from the press and the universities. However, any regime that has the power to do this also has the power to liquidate them along with all other extra-governmental institutions. It is much safer to go this extra mile, rather than leaving the former cathedral and its various satellites intact and angry. Most of the historical precedents for this type of operation are pre-20th century. However, before the 20th century, systematic liquidation of information organs was quite common. Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries is an excellent example. Slightly farther afield, we have the suppression of the Jesuits, and in the 20th century, though less comparable, we have denazification. Of course, these steps are all unbelievably extreme by modern American standards. All this means is that they will not happen unless those standards change. And this will not happen until Americans, progressive and fundamentalist alike, are convinced that their government is indisputably malignant and incapable of self-correction, and the only way to improve it is to replace it completely. And how could this be accomplished? Obviously, it can't be. Chapter 10, A Simple Sovereign Bankruptcy Procedure Dear open-minded progressive, as we reach Chapter 10, it is time for some administrivia. First, we are switching to Roman numerals. At least past 10, they are just classier. Also, if anyone wants to provide design suggestions or what would be even more super-duper graphics, logos, templates, free hosting, free money, free beer, or even just free parenting advice, they may, of course, contact me at the usual address, linked to over on the right. I would note, however, that my email responsiveness of late has been unusually poor. In fact, it has been amazingly poor. For some reason, I had entertained the idea that being chained to my daughter would enable me to actually catch up with the large number of extremely interesting and well-written epistles sitting unanswered, many a few months old, in my inbox. You see why you are is not a good source of financial advice. However, my daughter is three months old today, and her brain is growing like a prize melon. She pops out of the zero to six-month hats. She is firmly in the six to nine. She may not scream less but it seems like she screams less. So I will attempt to work into the pile, probably in reverse order. Second, there is a second awful truth, which is that for my daughter's whole life, I haven't even been reading UR's comments section. This is a deed so shameful it is probably unknown in the Western world. In case you accept excuses, however, my excuse is that it is a sort of crude literary device. If it was written in response to its weekly feedback, which in the past has often proved much more interesting than the post, you are would be very different. Chattier, more bloggy, and I suspect less interesting. Or so I claim. We'll never know, though, will we? I will even be brazen enough to suspect that if I were reading them, the comments would not be quite as good. I do get the impression they haven't degenerated into mindless web nonsense, puerile flammage, Jew-baiting, and ads for spineless anal balloons. But if there is any such content, I, of course, disclaim it. After I'm done with this series, I will edit out any and all stupid comments. If they are all stupid, there will be none left. Ha! 
as Terence Stamp put it, kneel before Zod, kneel. I will, however, attempt a collective response to the non-stupid comments, unless they are so devastating as to leave me speechless. Please continue leaving them. You may not be enlightening me, at least not immediately, but you are enlightening others. And speaking of General Zod, if you are finally resolved to consider yourself a pathetic dupe of the mold, you are, of course, free to either describe or not describe yourself as a formalist, a reservationist, a restorationist, or even a mensist. This last coinage sounds faintly ominous and evil, which, of course, is not true. Mensism is all happiness, smiles, and light. In turn, however, be prepared for the fact that anyone can accuse you with perfect accuracy of neo birchery post-phalangism, pseudo habesianism or even rampant mold buggery. To paraphrase Barack Obama, if you don't have a knife, don't start a knife fight. If I had to choose one word and stick with it, I'd pick restorationist. If I have to concede one pejorative which fair writers can fairly apply, I'll go with reactionary. I'll even answer to any compound of the latter, neo-reactionary, post-reactionary, ultra-reactionary, etc. So when I call someone a progressive, what I mean is that his or her creed is more or less the direct opposite of mine. Of course, we both believe that the sky is blue, apple pie is delicious, and Hitler was evil. And since we are both polite, mature, and open-minded people, we can converse despite our disagreements. But just as there is no such thing as a progressive reactionary, there is no such thing as a progressive restorationist, or vice versa. I am comfortable using the word progressive because, and only because, I know of no significant population of English speakers for whom it conveys negative connotations. Similarly, when speaking not of the ideas, but of the set of people who hold these ideas, or as they like to put it, ideals, the name Brahmin is time-honored and non-pejorative. This is not a reference to the Tambrams. In fact, there is a fine practical definition of Brahmin in this video, which is long, 15 minutes, but I feel worth watching. Barak speaks to HQ staff and volunteers. This is, of course, internal video from the Obama campaign. I don't think it was leaked. I think it was intentionally published, and so it has to be taken with a grain of salt. However, the people in it are all their real selves. For once, they are not acting. I recognize the meeting. It reminds me a lot of the first post-IPO meeting at the tech bubble company I worked for. There is one main difference. A few more blacks, and nowhere near so many Tamils. A few more. And the camera eye hilariously stalks and pounces on all the diversity it can find. But it cannot conceal the horrible truth. Almost everyone inside the Good Ones campaign is white. Maybe one in 15 is black. Maybe one in 20. Definitely not one in ten. And I suspect many of these hold positions for which melanin is a job requirement, that is, working with the community. And weirdly, given this explanation, there are no, no, no Mexicans. Okay, maybe one or two. The video is grainy. It's hard to tell a Jeremiah Wright from a Quatamoc Cardenas. But I live in San Francisco. I am quite accustomed to encountering a progressive population with a strong Aslanic contingent. SF State is, after all, the home of the notorious Third World Strike, and I ain't seeing it. And isn't that maneuver with Patty Solis Doyle charming? Doesn't that just show you the maturity level of the whole organization? Bell curves being what they are, you need one thing to achieve the Obama team's rarefied whiteness, an ultra-competitive, race-neutral employee filtering process. These people could be the audience at your average Google Tech Talk. Everyone in the room, whatever their skin color, is not just a Brahmin, but a high Brahmin, a status held by anyone obviously smart enough to get a Ph.D., Maryland, etc., from a top school. There is no mainstream American university whose general student body is anywhere near this segregated, or anywhere near this 31337, I suspect. I wonder why that is. Isn't it curious, then, that so much of Obama's support should come from our wonderful universities to which diversity is so important? Surely. Dear open-minded progressive, one can disagree honestly on whether employment decisions should be made on the basis of skin color. It is, after all, a Humean art. Given how unusual the idea of racial preferences for colored people would have sounded to the Americans of, say, 1908, don't you find it a little unusual that there should be so little, um, variation in all of these supposedly independent decisions in Humean art space? as produced by our glorious variety of supposedly independent universities. But I should be fair to pre-President Obama, whom I really like calling the good one. I feel that if this locution could be persuaded to spread, 
It might be of some benefit to humanity. Needless to say, I don't mean it satirically, because after watching the clip above, my impression is that the good one is exactly that. Good. That is, he is good at his job, which is all you can ask of anyone. More precisely, he talks like a competent manager. If I were working in at a startup and I had a boss who gave pep talks this good, I'd feel quite comfortable with the administration. Management is more than just talk. But can you call the Obama campaign anything but a successful operation? The graphic design alone is brilliant. There is only one problem. This outfit is very good at winning presidential elections. We have no reason to think it is any good at anything else. The candidate is a great presidential candidate. He will probably be a good president, too. Of course, that is to say, he will be good at reading his lines and pretending to be an 18th century statesman, which is the job of a U.S. president in 2008. Perhaps we should just write in Paul Giamatti, who I'm sure could act the good one off the stage. Moreover, the Nazis had an effective campaign team, too, plus some pretty good graphic design to go with it. Most people don't know it, but the SS dress uniform was designed by Hugo Boss. If design is your criterion, the Third Reich was the best government of the century. In fact, even if architecture is your criterion, I will take Nazi architecture over progressive architecture any day of the week and twice on Sundays. And since the quality of architecture is indeed a good rule of thumb on which to judge the general quality of government, this is worrisome indeed. But all it means is that the case is an exception to the rule. Like anyone with any sense, I'd rather be governed by progressives than by Nazis. Nazis matter because a Nazi-like outcome is the most catastrophic failure mode of any restoration effort. Restorationism is to fascism as a bridge is to a pile of rubble in the riverbed. Bridge collapses can be dangerous and unpleasant, but that doesn't make bridges a bad idea. But comparing one's enemies to Nazis is old hat. Progressivism has a much better match on the other pole of the totalitarian continuum. The meter lights up like a Christmas tree and the little arm goes all the way to the right, or left, as it were. Recently in a used bookstore, I found five issues of Soviet life from the mid-late 80s. I had not previously been aware of this publication. I find it quite revealing. Unfortunately for me, but fortunately for you, someone has already scanned three whole issues of Soviet life. So I will not bore you with my endless, golem-like chortling over this bibliomanic coup. But I thought it'd be fun to share one sweet little piece from January 1986. Of course, this is a news story, not an ad. No advertisements sully the pages of Soviet life. Georgian plastic surgeon Dr. Vaktan Kutsidze helps people look younger. Just look at Edith Markson. Would you believe she is 72? Of course not. She is an attractive woman who looks many years younger than her actual age. That's what happens after treatment with Dr. Kutzidze. Many of his satisfied patients maintain. Edith Markson, who has spent several years in the Soviet Union, heard about Dr. Kutzidze's skillful hands when she was in Tbilisi visiting a few of her theater friends. It was then she decided to have cosmetic surgery, particularly since, as she told local reporters, a facelift would cost several thousand dollars back home in the States. In the USSR, the operation costs from 30 to 100 rubles. I'm an ordinary American, Edith Markson said, and I'm not responsible for official policy making. Making friends with people from many countries is the best human politics. And now I've added Vaktang Kutsidze, the Georgian doctor, to my list of friends. 25 years ago, Dr. Kutsidze was one of the first plastic surgeons in the Soviet Union to use the so-called sparing method in nose operations. Ever since then, he has performed approximately thousands of these operations. His work, which requires expert surgical skill, has a lot in common with sculpture, the surgeon maintains. Please don't skip the Edith Markson links. They really round out the episode. The Soviet Life article comes with its own photograph, but I feared younger readers might find it disturbing, although, frankly, the results are pretty good for 30 to 100 rubles. Then, for maximum disorienting effect, skip directly to this time story, which appeared on Tuesday. Do you notice any resemblance? Any at all? Obama, Prince Royal of the Blood, beloved by all God's children, but especially the colored ones from Bolivia to clichy sous bois What is he, the second coming of Comrade Brezhnev? Is the Times going to continue this kind of coverage after he's elected? That would really be turning the obvious up to 11. I especially love how the Times' last piece describes Edith Markson as if she were an ordinary retiree, perhaps a cashier at Macy's or as a dental hygienist, 
who just happens to have moved to Manhattan in her late 70s, despite the fear of crime, grime, and hassles in the city that never sleeps. Edith Markson stumbled and crash-landed on the sidewalk in Greenwich Village shortly after her return to New York more than a year ago. The badly injured 80-year-old woman was spotted by two homeless men, one of whom swooped her in his arms and majestically carried her one block to a nearby medical laboratory. Even in old age, with a mending broken hip and a metal valve in her ailing heart, Mrs. Markson is surprised at how uplifting New York City can be. Coaxed back here from San Francisco by anxious relatives who wanted to keep an eye on her, she has found that the city has much to offer an old lady like herself. It's wonderful to know when you really get into trouble, somebody will come to help you, said Mrs. Markson, a widow who had left New York for what she thought was the last time four years ago. Instead, she now lives in a midtown Manhattan apartment where the management installed bars on her bathtub and security guards occasionally check on her. Despite the fear of crime, grime, and hassles in the city that never sleeps, experts say Mrs. Markson is one of a growing number of retirees who are bucking decades-old migration patterns by actually moving to New York for its quality of life. Words fail me, dear open-minded progressive, they really do. As my wife, who happens to be a playwright in the city where Edith Markson's little theater company, now essentially a permanent branch of the U.S. government, remains the 31337, puts it, does a theater promoter ever really retire? And the fact that the two homeless men scooped her up, not just lovingly, not just respectfully, not just adoringly, but no less than majestically, really takes the cake. Presumably, they carry around spare Burger King crowns to supply stumbling princesses of the arts with the requisite majesty. I assert, dear open-minded progressive, that attempting to understand the world of today by reading the New York Times and its fellow authorized channels is a lot like trying to understand the Soviet Union by reading Soviet life. Any such publication will be informative to a trained student of the period, but a proper appreciation of its real meaning requires significant independent understanding and a willingness to, dare I say it, deconstruct. For example... The wonderful story of Edith Markson shows us that even still in 1986, the social networks in which a New York Times reporter might travel actually connected into the Soviet Union. At least to her great new friend, Vaktang Kutsidze, and to the hip young apparatchik who wrote them both up for Soviet life. Historically, this Greenwich Village connection had always run straight from the cathedral's high Brahmins to the Soviet nomenklatura a word that explains Miss Markson and Dr. Kutzidze with equal precision. By the 80s, this, like everything else about the Warsaw Pact, was fraying. But what is Red October without John Reed? Flash forward to Judge Guevara, and it is all so perfectly clear. It looks like the same thing because it is the same thing. Moreover, if you read the political essays in Soviet life, about a third of the magazine seems to be political content, you realize that the Edith Marksons of the world followed and did their level best to persuade everyone else to follow. The exact same party line on every political topic that appears in any of my Soviet life issues, from the nuclear freeze to the Middle East to the abominable persecution of the black man. Of course, this last horror, our vast Caucasian conspiracy, has persisted to this day. It almost cost the good one the nomination, etc., etc. Do I really need to mock this any further? But if you are still not convinced, there are always the Obama videos. Dear open-minded progressive, frankly, progressivism is just creepy. Do you really want to associate yourself with it? And if the answer is yes, do you think you'll, you still want to be associated with it after the good one's vigorous musky buttocks have spent a year or two in George W. Bush's air on? If the answer is still yes, I'm afraid you are just not spiritually prepared for the grueling mental ordeal that follows. Deep down inside, you are still a hippie. At the very least, do not continue reading this essay without at least one massive bong hit. Frankly, you'll need it. Because finally, there are the lines for which the good one will always, I feel, be known. I face this challenge with profound humility and knowledge of my own limitations. But I also face it with limitless faith in the capacity of the American people. Because if we are willing to work for it and fight for it and believe in it, then I am absolutely certain that generations from now, we will be able to look back and tell our children that this was the moment when we began to provide care for the sick and good jobs to the jobless. 
This was the moment when the rise of the oceans began to slow and our planet began to heal. This was the moment when we ended a war and secured our nation and restored our image as the last best hope on earth. Some people are inspired by this kind of emanation. If you are one, how can I fault you? You are probably a pretty nice guy or gal. There is probably something else in your life besides the good one or, of course, his good causes. As your attorney, I recommend a real effort to figure out what that thing might be and maybe focus on it a little more. For the rest of us, let me note merely that at present, the ocean's cold and inexorable rise, the salty revenge of Gaia's tears, the wave looming over Manhattan is three millimeters per year. This puts us well within the new DSM-4 guidelines for fulminating hydrophobia. And I see no reason to tolerate such systematic civility to such a blatant case of contagious hypochondria. This suggests a trivial test, a sort of pons asinorum, for any potential restoration. I suggest that as its initial act, any responsible and effective transitional government will set its tone and establish its good faith by assisting the good one, along with his wife, his people, his wife's people, and frankly anyone who for whatever reason chooses to accompany him to transfer their lives pleasantly and with a minimum of personal disruption to the good one's scenic paternal homeland, the great African nation of Kenya. It's entirely possible that Kenya will demand compensation for accepting this crowd. While hard to count in advance, it could easily number in the millions. If so, there is a simple solution. Ask the Kenyans how much they want and pay it. Think of it as a small but symbolic reparation for the vast tragedy of post-colonial Africa. Of course, there would be no hard feelings on either side of this expatriation. In fact, the Kenyans might well make the good one president for life. His people, the Luo, are riding high these days. And I actually think the good one might prove a wonderful ruler of Kenya, which, if troubled, remains one of the most beautiful countries on earth. For open-minded progressives who doubt that deporting political opponents has anything to do with responsible, effective government, the value of selective relocation as a security measure can hardly be doubted, of course, I have a question for you. I'm going to play a magic trick. I'm going to pick a historical period in the recent past, in the memory of many of those now living. And I'm going to pick two sources of information. To you, source A will be a source of automatic, near-absolute reliability. To you, source B will be a blatant outlet of mendacious propaganda produced by some of the nastiest people in history. But on the major issue on which the two disagreed, hindsight has provided an answer. At least in my opinion, it is impossible to argue the proposition that source A was right and source B was wrong. And it is trivial to argue the converse. To even debate the issue is a sign of complete detachment from reality. Quite simply, B was right and A was wrong. Even Professor Burke admits it. Our period is 1965 through 1980. Our source A is the International Press Corps. Our source B is the Rhodesian Ministry of Information. Our issue is the perspective of post-colonial African governments in general, the liberation movements in specific, and Robert Mugabe to be exact. Dear open-minded progressive, if you can produce any explanation of this trust failure which is coherent, scholarly, realistic, and consistent with progressive ideals, I will admit defeat. Please do remember that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I don't like to hear hypotheses that involve UFOs, international Jewish conspiracies, Freemasons, or the like. In fact, let's wail on UR's favorite crash test dummy, Professor Burke, for a little while here. As I've said, this man, an assistant professor at Swarthmore is my current case study for the fundamentally and irreparably evil character of the cathedral. He comes across as a perfectly nice guy, of course, and I suspect that's exactly what he is. So was Albert Speer, who once wrote that you can't expect to recognize the devil when he puts his hand on your shoulder. You probably think it's excessive to compare Burke to Speer. Oh, no. Think again. The really major thing, I think, is that the Soweto uprising of 1976 and subsequent campaigns to make South Africa's townships ungovernable put the apartheid regime under what proved to be unbearable pressure, largely on the pure grounds of resource limitations. The apartheid state simply couldn't cope in the end with the demands that ungovernability put upon it, even when it put up a pretty good show of having everything under a tight authoritarian lid. Few of us saw this clearly in 1986 to 87, precisely because the state was putting on such a good performance. But underneath, the leadership was increasingly seeing collapse as inevitable. 
Let's review what led to ungovernability. The vast majority of the population without any vote or democratic outlet. An authoritarian state that legally defined almost all dissent as terrorism and gave itself entitlement to retaliate against dissent with imprisonment, torture, and murder. A state which routinely censored all media. A state which ignored property rights of most of its citizens. In short, a state which was in every respect the antithesis of liberalism, in which there was literally no avenue for democratic or liberal protest for the vast majority of its citizens. Let's review what ungovernability consisted of. Refusal to cooperate with any institution controlled directly or indirectly by the national government. So leaving school, refusing to pay any rents or fees assessed by governmental bodies, refusal to comply with orders from authorities no matter how routine those orders might be, and an embrace of violent resistance to the state and any perceived agents of the state. Making large areas of the country no-go areas for civil authorities unless they were accompanied by strong military forces. Murder or threat of murder of suspected collaborators. As I said, I think it worked. I think it was justified not just because it worked, but because there were no other alternatives. The apartheid state and the National Party spent 20 years steadily crushing all other avenues for political change and rewriting the laws and constitution of South Africa so as to define itself as the permanent and unchanging ruler of South Africa. That's right. Our sweet jocular Dan D. playing history professor has just endorsed the practice of putting car tires full of gasoline around his fellow humans' necks, then lighting them afire. I wonder how many D6 of damage that attack does? Professor Burke's historical analysis is also self-serving in the extreme. The proximate cause of the end of apartheid was the 1992 referendum in which a majority of whites effectively voted to hand over their country to the ANC, a decision they would never have taken if they could have known the consequences. This was the victory of the Verlita, or enlightened Afrikaners, over their Verkrampte, or narrow cousins. In other words, it is best seen as a triumph of psychological warfare, no points for telling us who was enlightening the enlightened. As for the wonderful omelette cooked from these eggs, see this BBC documentary, whose title is misleading. The BBC doesn't really mean that the international community should never again hand over a first world country to the well-spoken frontman of a murderous gang, but whose transcript is glorious, keen. But you see, here's what I can't understand, and I've known this country for a long time. It's just the ease with which people kill nowadays. Youth. Yeah, keen. How did that happen? Youth. When I get up, I can go to town or I can took your car. Keen. Would it bother you to kill me to get the car? Youth. If you don't want to give me your keys, I'll kill you. It's nothing to kill you because of what? I need the money to survive. You see, I need more money. You see, it feels like using a gun. There's no feeling. There's no feeling. It's just yourself. You're the big boss. You got a gun. No one will tell you shit or fuck you. No one can tell you fuck you. If you said fuck me, I took out my firearm and I shoot you in your ears, then what will you say? You're dead. I will took all the things. If you don't get money, if you don't get a car, you're nothing. Keen. Do you think that the life that you're living and the way that you're carrying on is what Mandela? Youth. But, Keen. No, but hang on a second. Is this what Mandela spent 27 years in jail for so you could go around killing people? Youths. No, no, Keen. So why do you still do it? Youth. Because we want money. Listen, listen to me, because it's money. I have to rob this thing now. Keen, you want to rob the camera? Youth, yeah, Keen. You could do that if you wanted. I know you could do that, but it wouldn't achieve any purpose. You might have money for a day, and it's just brought trouble on you. When they suggested stealing the camera, we decided to leave. Crime is being fueled by another legacy of apartheid, poverty. There is democracy, free speech, and economic growth, but real wealth is in the hands of the few. Even though millions more now access electricity and water, Two million new homes have been built, and there are grants for the poorest of the poor. The growing economy hasn't delivered jobs. Official figures say 25% are out of work, though many economists estimate it could be as high as 40%. Millions of South Africans still live in squatter camps. Sunday afternoon in Soweto. How many of you live in this shed? Woman. Four. Keen. What do you feel about the life you have here? Woman. Translated. Life here isn't good. We've no electricity, and so we have to use paraffin, which makes the children sick. Keen. Do you ever think your life is going to get better, Joseph? Joseph. Maybe my life would change if the Nationalist Party came back, not the ANC. Keen. 
I don't believe you. Come on. It was a white government that put you down, that treated you terribly. You can't really believe that, Joseph. But in terms of work, they didn't oppress us. We didn't struggle for work then. Keen. Now, do I really think that he is serious about wanting a white government back? I don't think so. Not back to the days of forced removals and passbooks and all of that. But I'll tell you what it does do. When you listen to somebody expressing that kind of anger and frustration, you really get a sense of how the ANC, the people at the top, the elite, have drifted away from their core constituency, the people of the squatter camps, South Africa's dispossessed. The ANC has indeed drifted away from its core constituency. But that constituency has nothing to do with Joseph or youth. It consists of Fergal Keane and Timothy Burke, and of course, a few others like them. Unlike Albert Speer, all these individuals are replaceable. What we're seeing here is a power structure which has lost its connection to reality. Its rulers consider it the most ethical and responsible system of government in human history. In fact, it is morally and intellectually bankrupt. There is no simple procedure for moral and intellectual restructuring. However, this system of government is not just morally and intellectually bankrupt. It is also financially bankrupt. This is a disaster, of course, but it gives us a concrete way to think about fixing all three of these problems at once. A restoration is a regime change procedure designed to safely and effectively reverse the damage which progressivism has inflicted on civilization. Acting under the principles of good government that prevailed in theory, if not always in practice, in the late classical or Victorian period, and producing a new era in which secure, responsible, and effective government is as easy to take for granted as tap water you can drink, electricity that is always on, or a search engine that returns porn only if you searched for porn. A good way to define a restoration is to model it as a sovereign bankruptcy. Since a government is just a corporation, albeit one whose rights are protected not by any higher authority but by its own military force, it is subject to the same inexorable laws of accounting. More specifically, a restoration is a sovereign bankruptcy with restructuring. There are always three options in a bankruptcy, restructuring, liquidation, and acquisition. While it can be interesting to wonder what the People's Liberation Army would do with West Oakland, in general, restructuring is the only practical option at the sovereign level. In any restructuring, a restoration delivers temporary control to a bankruptcy receiver. The receiver's goal is to render the company both solvent and profitable. Solvency is achieved by converting debt to equity, diluting existing equity holders, and treating equal commitments equitably. Profitability is achieved by optimizing corporate operations as the receiver sees fit. In a sovereign bankruptcy, there is one extra quirk. At least in today's real world, the corporation which we are restructuring does not think of itself as a mere corporation. It doesn't even think of itself as a sovereign corporation. It thinks of itself as a mystical pact which echoes across the centuries from generation to generation, bonding human souls across time, space, language, gender, and race. So we can expect its accounting to be a little funky. But accounting still is accounting, and not rocket science. Let's start by taking a closer look at the general principles of restructuring. First, restructuring starts with an enterprise which is in some way financially broken. Most commonly, it has defaulted on its debts. Sovereign corporations, however, have another failure mode, which is especially hairy and which we'll discuss in a moment. Second, restructuring assumes an enterprise which is intrinsically profitable. In the sovereign case, this is almost automatic. An asset which cannot produce profits is worthless by definition, and no real country is worthless. Invite people to reside there, tax them, profit. Third, restructuring produces an enterprise which is unlikely to renege on its commitments. In other words, it creates a new allocation of the future profits of the restructured enterprise. Typically, these profits are inherently uncertain, so a common result of restructuring is a company with all equity and no debt. An equity instrument is one that pays some percentage of a completely unpredictable profit. While we do not know the magnitude of the restructured corporation's future profits, we can still divide them into formal shares. These shares are distributed among beneficiaries who receive their dividends. Shares are typically allocated according to the commitments made by the bankrupt enterprise. Fourth, 
There is no requirement that the bankruptcy receiver preserve any policies, assets, divisions, brands, or employees of the old company. He or she has full operational authority, as of course is normal in the productive economy. Of course, the receiver must be responsible to some board, regulator, or other supervisory agent. In a sovereign context, it is probably appropriate to capitalize the title, the receiver. The goal of the receiver is to convert the bankrupt government into one that produces maximum dividends for its beneficiaries, who may be internal or external. A restoration plan should give the receiver a set of goals and a time frame and let her do the rest. One way to imagine the receiver's job is to imagine her endowed with a mythical symbol of power, the wand of Fenargal. Within the country it controls, the wand turns its holder into a sort of superhero. He can strike down anything or anyone with a bolt of fire, and he is invulnerable to all attacks. However, the wand has a serious downside. It is disposable. After two years, it crumbles away to nothing. Therefore, the receiver has two years in which she holds full sovereign power. At the end of this period, she should leave a secure, responsible, and effective government which can sustain its sovereignty without recourse to magical instruments. While there is no wand of Fenagal, its powers are clear and can be reproduced, albeit imperfectly, by more mundane technologies. Sovereignty is a very well-defined concept. Thus, it is a legitimate question to ask anyone what he or she would do if appointed receiver and handed the wand. For some distance, let's assume we are restructuring the country of Elbonia. At present, Elbonia uses its own fiat currency. It has no formal distribution of benefits or clear ownership structure. Its decision-making procedures are Byzantine, opaque, and mutable. It is plagued by internal violence. It exercises significant power outside its own borders, and its decisions are often affected by external aggression. After restructuring, Elbonia will be on a metallic standard. All its financial commitments will be formal. It will be, as America's first chief justice liked to put it, governed by those who own it. Its owners will establish precise and immutable decision-making structures. They will eliminate systematic internal violence, and they will neither tolerate external interference nor interfere themselves. Our policy in regard to Europe, which was adopted at an early stage of the wars which have so long agitated that quarter of the globe, nevertheless remains the same, which is not to interfere in the internal concerns of any of its powers, to consider the government de facto as the legitimate government for us, to cultivate friendly relations with it, and to preserve those relations by a frank, firm, and manly policy meeting in all instances the just claims of every power submitting to injuries from none. Any restructuring must start with the currency. Elbonia's debts are denominated in its own fiat currency, so it cannot never default. Does that mean it's not bankrupt? No, that means it is sovereign. Bankruptcy is any state of indefensible accounting. The Elbonian currency is, of course, the grubnik. What is a grubnik? It is certainly not a note certifying that the issuer holds or will deliver on demand a specified quantity of anything. Once upon a time, believe it or not, this was considered rather tacky. The dollar, like so many of the world's greatest, inspires at first sight interest, but hardly affection. From a casual study of the monetary controversy now raging in this country, I had been led to expect that the dollar was a gold dollar and that Mr. Bryan wanted to turn it into silver. It cannot be too widely known that the dollar as he has spent is neither gold nor silver. He is a piece of paper. Not only so, but often a very worn and dirty piece of paper at that. It is astonishing how a dollar will age in three or four years. True, the paper reflects the greatest credit on its inventor. It never tears, though perhaps this is because no strong man ever really tries to tear it. Still, it is but a piece of paper after all. It bears on its weather-beaten face an inscription to the effect that there has been deposited in the treasury of the United States one silver dollar which will be paid to the bearer on demand. Others of the breed merely assert that the United States of America will pay one dollar without specifying its material. The mysterious philanthropist who deposited the silver dollar apparently prefers to remain anonymous, while where or how you cash it is left equally dark. It must certainly be somewhere in Washington, whence the United States of America date their promise. But the American eagle is too old a bird to give any more precise address. The dollar, so far as my experience goes, is always illustrated, 
usually with a vignette photograph of some eminent citizen or other, occasionally also with scenes from the life of Columbus or some other appropriate subject. This gives an aesthetic as well as a commercial interest to the dollar, which cannot be too highly prized. Its nominal value is 4 S2D. What we see in Mr. Stevens's snarky reporting from 1898 is a currency in the middle of the transition from old-fashioned warehouse receipt to our modern, up-to-date Federal Reserve note, or Grubnik. From the accounting perspective, what is a Grubnik? The answer is simple. It is not a receipt because it does not denote title to some stored object. It is not debt because it does not denote an obligation that is cancelled by some delivery. Therefore, it can only be equity. A Grubnik, in other words, is a share. It is a fraction of some great total right. We do not know exactly what it is a share in because we do not know what rights you would control if you had all the Grubniks in the world. If you manage to buy up all the Federal Reserve notes in the world, do you own the Federal Reserve? If you get your hands on all the Grubniks, are you the sole and undisputed owner of Elbonia? These questions are without meaning. In other words, we can define fiat currency as dubious equity. Owning a Grubnik is like owning a share in Yukos. If you own all the shares of Yukos, you own a lawsuit against the Russian government. What is this worth? It's up to the Russian government. At present, the answer appears to be nothing, but Putin might always change his mind. What we do know is that every dollar is equal to every other dollar. Every $5 bill has the same value, whether in dollars or gold or crude oil, as five $1 bills. Note that exactly the same is true for Grubniks, Yukos shares, etc., etc. Whatever they may be worth, more accurately exchangeable for, they are amenable to mathematics. Thus, if there are one trillion dollars in the world, and we accept the dubious assumption that if you own all the dollars you own the Federal Reserve, each dollar is a right to one trillionth of the Federal Reserve. Perhaps this is obvious, but it implies some corollaries. One, creating new dollars does not affect the value of the Federal Reserve, however we choose to measure that value, nor does it affect the value of Elbonia, Yukos, or any other right. It is common or garden variety stock dilution. Dilution is often more convenient than transferring shares from old owners to new owners, but the principle is the same. If there exist one trillion dollars and we print ten billion new ones and give them to X, the effect is just as if we replaced each dollar held by anyone but X with 99 cents, added up the spare cents, and gave them to X. Now we can see just how screwy the accounting system of Elbonia is. Imagine a company which chooses to denominate its accounting in its own stock. Say Google valued its assets, such as its buildings, in Google shares. Its debt would be promises to pay Google shares. If it paid dividends, each share might spawn 0.05 new shares. This would be truly perverse accounting. But it would not be as perverse as a system in which Google ran its numbers in terms of shares in an internal tracking stock which represented a subsidiary whose assets and liabilities were not defined at all. That's fiat currency for you. To restructure this bizarre financial teratoma, we need to A, fix the number of Grubniks in the world, and B, define the rights divided among all Grubnik holders. B is easy. We convert Grubniks into proper Elbonian equity. In a liquid market, elbow shares can be converted to gold, crude oil, Hummel figurines, or any other commodity. The only question is, if you start with fraction X of all the Grubniks, what fraction of all the elbow shares do you end up with? Let's say, quite arbitrarily, that a third of the equity in elbow will go to present Grubnik holders. A is more interesting. Why don't we know how many Grubniks there are in the world? Isn't each one numbered? Indeed, each one is numbered. But the Elbonian Reserve has the power to create more Grubniks, and it always uses this power when it has to. Thus, when Elbonia promises you a Grubnik, that promise is worth exactly as much as a Grubnik, because there is no reason for Elbonia to break its promise. But there is also no constraint on Elbonia's ability to promise more Grubniks than it has actually created. Thus, we have two kinds of Grubniks, actual Grubniks and virtual Grubniks. If Elbonia is anything like America, the latter vastly outnumber the former. For example, when you deposit a dollar in a bank, you do not own a dollar. You own a promise of a dollar from the bank, the bank is not the Federal Reserve, but via the FDIC, the Federal Reserve insures your bank. The FDIC owns very few dollars, certainly not enough to protect all the banks in the world. But the Fed can print as many dollars as it likes. So your dollar deposit, because it is backed by a chain that ends in a virtual promise from the Fed, 
is risk-free. A treasury bond is risk-free for the same reason. Uncle Sam is implicitly backed by Uncle Sam's own printing press. Thus, the bond is equivalent to a specialized kind of dollar bill, one that says not valid until a certain date, the date when the bond matures. In the world of equity, this is what we call restricted stock. Only a market can tell you how many grubniks a restricted grubnik will trade for. But a restricted grubnik is still a grubnik. Obviously, this is a financial Rube Goldberg machine. It can only be understood historically. Fortunately, there is a simple way to get the virtual grubniks under control. One, find all the assets, such as bank deposits, whose price in grubniks is protected by Albonia's power to print new grubniks. Two, print the grubniks and buy the assets for their formal price. Three, fix the number of grubniks outstanding. Four, convert grubniks to elbow shares as desired. Five, sell the assets you nationalized, exchanging them for whatever monetary commodity your new accounting system uses. Let's say it's gold. Doing this right will involve creating a lot of grubniks. The best way to rationalize this is to understand that these grubniks already exist. They just exist informally, and we need to formalize them. At present, for example, the U.S. owes about $10 trillion in debt in a world that contains less than $1 trillion actual dollars. Unless you are accustomed to the presence of virtual dollars, these numbers simply make no sense. In the uneducated folk economics by which policymakers make their rule-of-thumb decisions today, this is held to be inflationary. The general assumption, made more on the basis of sympathetic magic than anything else, is that more grubniks means higher prices. But this is not true when we replace virtual grubniks with real grubniks, because the change is portfolio neutral. Your loan of 1,000 grubniks to the bank is replaced by 1,000 actual grubniks. Thus, you have no more or less money. Thus, your spending patterns do not change. And thus, if everyone is affected in the same way, there is no effect on market prices. The receiver has thus gained an important power. In order to make the transition as smooth as possible, she can declare any obligation of Albonia, formal or informal, to be a debt which is denominated in grubniks and guaranteed by virtual grubniks. Albonia will then acquire that debt, since it is, after all, guaranteed paying out in freshly printed grubniks. Rampant equity dilution is a very, very normal practice in any restructuring. Suppose, for example, Albonia has guaranteed lifetime medical care to all its residents. To the receiver, this is an obligation like any other, even if it is not a formal obligation in the same sense as paying off a bond. Albonia, at least in her unrestructured state, is too ramshackle a barge to make any useful distinction between formal and informal debts. Therefore, Albonia can shed this politically complex and nasty obligation by calculating the cost of an equivalent insurance policy for each resident, assuming the resident has such a policy, and buying it back with fresh grubniks. If the resident wants to use those grubniks to buy medical insurance, by definition she can afford it or she can spend them on beer and heroin. It's up to her. The whole conversion is a Pareto optimization. This flood of new cash has no chance of descending into a hyperinflationary spiral because it is part of a one-time restructuring in which the semantics and quantity of shares become fixed. Hyperinflation is what happens when a government falls into a state in which it is continually funding operating losses by paying off its creditors with freshly diluted stock. In the financial markets, the same effect is produced by a toxic convertible. This is a device one might use in a desperate attempt to avoid bankruptcy, a fate to which we have already reconciled ourselves. To prevent fluctuations in grubnik purchasing power, the receiver can also create restricted grubniks with a not valid until date. Thus, when buying out a medical insurance policy or other annual obligation, the compensated parties may receive restricted grubniks that can pay each year's policy as it falls due rather than getting a giant lump sum that can be spent on a yacht and will drive the yacht market haywire. Thus armed not only with absolute political and military sovereignty, but also with the weird economic superpower of the fiat currency printing press, our receiver faces her next challenge. Dealing with the horde of Elbonian government employees, most of whose occupations are not in any realistic sense productive, the basic principle of a sovereign restructuring is to separate all outlays of the government into two classes, essential payments and inessential payments. Obviously, wages paid to an inessential employee, such as a sociology professor, remember we are nationalizing the universities, are inessential payments. 
Another word for inessential payment is dividend. From an accounting perspective, inessential employees are performing make work to hide the fact that they are actually receiving dividends, that is, acting as blood-sucking parasites. Of course, with the wand of Fnagel, the receiver could just fire them. Quite literally, in fact. But is this fair? Our sociology professor jumped through quite a few hoops, none of which he invented himself, in order to receive what is probably not a very large payment. His so-called career may be pointless, but that means he should be retired, not fired. And he should be retired on a pension that includes a significant fraction of his present pay, maybe even all of it. He has, in short, acquired a certain level of ownership in Albonia. He has done so through means that were entirely fair and open to all, and it is not our place to decide whether or not he deserves these spoils. Since Elbonia is already paying him, it can obviously afford to continue doing so. Moreover, as a sociology professor, he is part of the ruling class, and the wand of Fnagel does not last forever. Keep your friends close, as they say, and your enemies closer. He is already being paid to lie for money to support the old regime. If you continue to pay his salary, but let him say and do whatever he wants, will he turn around and bite you? Perhaps some will, but it is not human nature. A more likely response is permanent dog-like loyalty. This response can be accentuated, if need be, by requiring the professor to put his name on a list of prominent figures who support the new government. If he changes his mind, he can stop or restart his pension to match the fluctuations of his conscience. This gets even better when we get to the few parts of the cathedral that are relatively healthy. One example is biomedical research, which requires delicate and expensive toys, and so commands a considerable amount of funding over and above faculty salaries. To destroy the institutions while making the researchers very, very happy, simply make everyone's grant or stipend their own permanent property. Divide the funding among the whole team, right down to the grad students. Result? A class of financially independent researchers who can work on whatever they want, wherever they want, sans paperwork. Perhaps a few will decide they don't care about curing cancer and do care about living in the south of France, but they will not be the cream of the crop. Is there anyone who really believes that the grant review process adds value or improves the quality of science? The receiver has thus brought order to Elbonia's books. Essential expenses, spending on goods and services that are actually necessary to maximize the Elbonian revenue, turn out to be a small proportion of budgetary outlays. The rest is profit. Elbonia, as we always knew, is massively profitable. The receiver's goal is not to redirect this profit, although she can redirect it if need be, but simply to understand it. Who is profiting? How much are they profiting? We find these profiteers, who in many cases are not wealthy fat cats, but philanthropists who provide vital services to the needy and exchange their informal commitments for formal securities, that is, grubniks. We eliminate any make-work or other pointless camouflage that may have been used to disguise the profit relationship, and everyone is happy. Albonia does need revenue, of course. Since the new Albonia will keep its books in gold, it should collect taxes in gold. The simplest way to tax, which is also one that affects all uses of Albonian soil and cannot be evaded, is a self-assessed tax on all land and fixed structures. As a property owner, you assess your own property, which is offered for sale at the assessed price. If you don't want to sell, set your price above the market and pay a little more tax. Elbonia can also make a market for elbow shares in gold. Since grubniks are to be converted to elbow shares, this market will produce the critical grubnik to gold ratio. As people realize how weird it is to buy a cup of coffee with shares, the financial system will gradually return from equity to metallic currency. The receiver thus has the finances of Elbonia straight. She can then turn her powers toward repairing the sadly decayed framework of government. Her fiduciary responsibility is not just to preserve the value of the Albonian franchise while the financial restructuring completes, but also to enhance it as much as possible. Given the low quality of government that Albonia has suffered in the past, this is not hard. The best target for the receiver is to concentrate on restoring the Belle Epoque. This implies that in two years, A, all systematic criminal activity will terminate. B, anyone of any skin color will be able to walk anywhere in any city at any time of day or night. C, no graffiti, litter, or other evidence of institutional lawlessness will be visible. And D, all 20th century buildings of a socialist, brutalist, or other anti-decorative character will be demolished. 
We can see how far the U.S. at present is from this goal by this awful, hilarious story in the L.A. Times. I simply cannot muster the mockery to do justice to this piece. Read it all. Well, if I tell you who shot Ray Ray, I'll never work again in this community. Indeed. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the basin, loose-knit bands of blacks and Latinos prowl the streets, looking for people of the other color to shoot. Visit South Africa before South Africa visits you. This is just over. It doesn't work. It's done. Stick a fork in it. First, the receiver recognizes that this is a military problem. These gangs are militias. Not only that, they are militias with an ideology, and that ideology is violently hostile to the society that hosts them. You are not going to convert them into Quakers by giving them big hugs, nor is there any rational reason to deal with them via judicial procedures designed to contain the sporadic deviancy or even psychopathy that appears in any healthy society. The ideology of the gangs is an ideology of pure war and hatred. It is no more tolerable than neo-Nazism, and in fact the best way to deal with these subcultures is to think of them as Nazi. They are certainly adept at converting hate into violence. On the other hand, the fact that these formations are essentially barbaric paramilitary units validates one of the main arguments of the loony left. America's brimming prisons are essentially POW camps. Their inhabitants do not recognize the laws they were convicted under or accept the society that convicted them. In terms of cultural reality, they are aliens. The receiver's message is, the war is over. Your side lost. Reconcile yourself to this. Demonstrate that you have done so, and you can return to society. We can use all the manual labor you can put out. For one, we have ugly buildings to tear down, graffiti to remove, and so on. Modern technology makes it easy for Elbonia to destroy any Morlock subcultures the former management may have inflicted on it. A trivial database query can identify the set of humans in the country who are either A, productively employed, B, independently wealthy, or C, a well-supervised dependent of A or B. Everyone else, including all miners, gets the tag. This inconspicuous device fits on your ankle and continuously reports your position to the authorities. If no crimes are committed near your location, you have nothing to worry about. This is just the start. Elbonia is saddled with a large number of residents who are effectively dependents of the state. For example, those who receive housing subsidies. These people need to be reprocessed to determine whether they can become members of productive society. And during this time, there is no reason to leave them where they are. Elbonia's revenue comes from its property values. And the presence of a Morlock population is not good for same. Therefore, we can expect the receiver to establish secure relocation centers in which the 20th century's artificially decivilized subpopulations will receive social services in a controlled environment while they are reintroduced to civilized society. Mandatory apprenticeship in productive skills, language training to ensure all residents are fluent acrolect speakers, and in general, a high degree of personal discipline will be hallmarks of these facilities. There is no need to allow dysfunctional subcultures to persist in any context, not even in prison. The 20th century prison is, like so many features of present society, a dead end. Modern technology can realize the ideal of many 19th century penological reformers, universal solitary confinement. In the 19th century, solitary confinement drove prisoners insane. In the 21st, adequate social interaction can be delivered electronically. Individual cells with virtual reality consoles are not a recipe for insanity. Virtualized prisoners are much easier to control, guide, and evaluate. They are also easier and cheaper to guard and feed. In third world conditions, entire slums can be surrounded, secured, and the residents moved into modular data hotels with sealed individual or family cells in which they can live perfectly fulfilling second lives. There is simply no reason for open squalor and barbarism to persist anywhere on the planet. Outdoor relief is an idea whose time has come and gone. From the standpoint of a society from which all forms of modern barbarism have been eradicated, the old, unrestored Elbonia will look almost unimaginably brutal and unlivable. When you have lived all your life in a country in which there is no crime and the streets are safe, the idea of no-go zones or random muggings, rapes, etc., will terrify you much as if the same assaults were committed by uncontrolled wild animals. For example, I simply can't imagine what it would be like to live in San Francisco if there were 50 or 60 leopards loose in the city. 
but I can see how people would get used to it. Leopards are nocturnal, so you stay in at night. They hide in trees, so you cut down the trees. They tend to hunt in certain areas, so you avoid those areas. And the situation could develop gradually. The first leopard is a huge news story, the second is a smaller story, and they build up over time. After a while, the experience of walking down the street while checking for leopards would strike you as completely normal and unremarkable. If one day the leopards were removed, however, you would definitely notice it. Chapter 11. The Truth About Left and Right. Dear open-minded progressive, perhaps you were horrified by Chapter 10. I mean, I did propose the liquidation of democracy, the constitution and the rule of law, and the transfer of absolute power to a mysterious figure known only as the receiver, who in the process of converting Washington into a heavily armed, ultra-profitable corporation will abolish the press, smash the universities, sell the public schools, and transfer decivilized populations to secure relocation facilities where they will be assigned to mandatory apprenticeships. If this doesn't horrify you, I'm not sure what would. And do I even mean it seriously? Or am I just ripping off Daniel Defoe? Dear open-minded progressive, perhaps you have come to realize that your narrator is not always a reliable one. He has played tricks on you in the past. He will probably do it again. The game is deep and not for the unwatchful. The first thing to remember is that by even reading these horrible, horrible things, you have demonstrated exactly how open your mind is. You are in the 99.99th percentile of open-minded progressives. You are certainly one of the most open-minded people in the world. Your only conceivable worry is that your mind is so open that your brain has fallen out. Obviously, this is a real danger, but life is dangerous. The second thing to remember is that no one else endorses this plan, or even anything close. In the political world of 2008, restorationism is completely off the map. It is off the table. It is outside the room. It is outside the building. It is running stark naked and crazy through the woods. In a word, it is pure mold buggery. And because at present we do live in a democracy, this means it is not dangerous. At least not at present. It could become dangerous, of course, perhaps if you are was as popular as stuff white people like, which it ain't and which it won't be. But what better reason to keep an eye on it? The third thing to remember is that the whole plan of restoration through national bankruptcy is predicated on the assumption that the bankruptcy administrator, the nefarious receiver, is responsible, effective, and not least sane. Clearly, if he or she turns out to be Hitler or Stalin, we have just recreated Nazism or Stalinism. Even if you agree with me that Washington is the malignant tumor of the ages, morally, intellectually, and financially bankrupt, dead in the water and drifting toward Niagara, you can't cure cancer with cyanide and LSD. And the fourth thing to remember, dear open-minded progressive, is that if perhaps you can be convinced that some things you used to think were good are actually evil, you can be convinced that some things you used to think were evil are actually good. After all, you do have an open mind. No sensible mind is very open on this side of the skull, though, and for good reason. If there is a crack, it is a narrow one. What hopes to fit it must fit a postcard. So let's swing straight at the ball. The problem of political alignment. Should you be leftist, a rightist, or a centrist? Perhaps we can answer the question from first principles. Suppose a great wind whips us into space and sets us down on an Earth-like planet, Erplat, which is completely foreign to us. We quickly discover that Erplat has a democratic political system just like ours. Moreover, Erplat's political thinkers are always squabbling, just like ours. And even better, an Erplatian position in this long-standing conflict can be described usefully by a single linear dimension, just like our left and right. However, the political axis of Erplat is transformed in some unknown way from ours. Its poles are not left and right, but M and Q. You have no way of knowing how M and Q might map to Earth terms. M, Q could be left-right or right-left or some other weird thing. What you know is that M and Q are contradictory principles. Each is some fundamental understanding of human society which indisputably contradicts the other. Of course, it is possible for any person to maintain some combination of M beliefs and Q beliefs, most simply by using the M principle to understand one issue and the Q principle for another. This creates the weird phenomenon of a continuous dimension between M and Q, when the question obviously has a fundamentally Boolean quality. Furthermore, M and Q can be easily misapplied. 
and either can be combined with any sort of venal or sadistic nastiness. Thus, evaluating the actions of individuals who claim to follow the M or Q principles is not a straightforward way to evaluate the choice between M and Q. We know there is a choice because we know that at most one of M and Q can be good and true. We must therefore conclude that the other is evil and wrong. Of course, both could be evil and wrong. If we find that one is evil and wrong, we should do another checkup to ensure that the other is good and true. But if we find that one is good and true, the matter is settled. The other is the dark side of the force. Moreover, the choice matters, because on Urplat, humans have special Jedi powers. Only we can wield the weapon of the Urplatan Jedi, the Iron Mouse. And it takes both of us, you, dear open-minded progressive, and me, the closed-minded reactionary. If we can agree, we can either end the conflict permanently in favor of M or Q or any mixture of the two. Any dissent will be promptly silenced by the mouse. So what criteria can we use to decide between M and Q? The many followers of each great way, of course, are lobbying us with beluga and Porsches and blondes, or at least the Urplatin equivalent of these fine goods. Nonetheless, we are stern and will choose only the truth. A simple test, A, might be to take a vote. If more Urplatins prefer M, their planet will be governed for the indefinite future on the M principle. If they favor Q, likewise. But frankly, this is shite. If Q is evil and the Urplatins vote for Q, we have just condemned them and their children to a world of infinite suffering. Past Qist movements have perhaps been tempered by a modicum of M, mere personal decency or mitigating venality. But if we enforce Q with the Iron Mouse, there will be no escape. If Q is wrong, wrong shall result. You may not have a problem with this, but I do, and it takes both of us to move the mouse. And is there any way in which we can guarantee that the headcount of Urpleton supporters corresponds to the absolute truth or falsity of M or Q? Answer, no. Many, perhaps even most, of the Urpletons are dumb as rocks. Therefore, this test is not useful. A simple way to fix the test, B, is to restrict the vote to Urpletons who are at least as smart as whichever of the two of us is dumber. That way we cannot possibly agree to describe any voter as dumb as a rock. The description is inherently insulting to one of us, so we are only considering the view of smart Urplatons. Even better, if we see a difference between smart Urplatons and dumb Urplatons, we can penalize whichever principle M or Q is popular with the dumb ones. If we see that Q is generally believed by the smarter Urplatons and M is more popular with the dumb ones, we pretty much have the answer, right? Okay, let's assume Q is the smart position and M is the dumb position. We know one fact about Urplet. Does this tell us that Q is good and true and M is wrong and evil? At the very least, this proposition depends on the intelligence of Urplatins. If a dumb Urplatin has an IQ of 80 in Earth terms and a smart one has an IQ of 120, we can pretty easily see that on any question on which they might disagree, the latter is more likely to be right. Or can we? How do we know this? And is our result the same if the IQs are, say, 120 and 160, respectively? What about 160 and 250? Surely it is neurologically possible for an Urplatian to have an arbitrarily high intelligence, at least as measured by any human scale. And if the proposition is true for stupid equals 160 and smart equals 250, it means that an Urplatin with an IQ of 160 can be fooled by whichever of M or Q is evil and wrong. If so, one with an IQ of 120 can surely be fooled. Since one can never be so stupid that one can't discover the truth by throwing darts, it is therefore possible for the Urplatins of IQ 80 to be right and those of IQ 120 to be wrong, which violates the proposition. So we cannot learn that M or Q is right or wrong just because the smart Urplatins follow Q and the stupid ones cling to M. However, this fact does tell us something. Q is more competitive than M. Think of Q and M as two populations of parasites competing for a one population of hosts. Ignoring the fact that Urplatins can harbor a mixture of Q and M perspectives on different subjects or simply not care, simplify the problem by imagining that each Urplatin has a Boolean flag, Q or M. Although neither Q nor M may have any central organizing body responsible for the propagation of Qism or Mness, if there was such an intellectual central planner, it would choose the smart hosts over the less smart ones. If you're a sexually transmitted virus, you want to be in a promiscuous gay host, preferably an airline steward. If you're an intellectually transmitted principal, you want to be in a smart and loquacious host, 
preferably a university professor. We expect to see some corollaries of this QM asymmetry, and we do. If smart people are more likely to host Q, we'd expect Q to be more fashionable than M. If you want to get ahead in life, acting smart is always a good start, whether you're smart or not. If smart people tend to host Q, hosting Q is a great way to look smart. Q becomes a kind of social lubricant. Anywhere, anytime, the best way to meet and mate with other young, fashionable people is to broadcast one's Q-ness as loudly and proudly as possible. Also, if Q is more competitive than M, we'd expect to see Q progressing against M over time. Again, this is exactly what we see. The M-Q conflict is at least a hundred years old, and when we exhume the frozen thoughts of century-old Qists from dusty old libraries, their specific beliefs would put them deep in the M range often at extreme M levels, if they live today. But does any of this answer the question? It does not. At least one of Q or M is darkness, but we cannot tell which. If Q is the dark side and M is mere sanity, we see immediately what Q is, a transmissible mental disease which spreads by infecting education workers. If Q is mere sanity and M is the dark side, this same system is in the business of overcoming superstition and leading the people of Urplat despite the ancient prejudices to which they stubbornly cling toward the truth. And this is certainly how Qists see the matter. And if they are both evil, but this is difficult to imagine. If both M and Q are dark, there must be some truth which contradicts them both, and it must be less successful than either M or Q. To a Qist, the situation makes perfect sense. The progress toward Q is the slow and painful victory of good over evil. Evil has many advantages because it can avail itself of evil strategies, whereas the good restrict themselves to achieving good ends by good means. However, the truth has a great advantage. It rings clear like a bell. No lie can fake it. There is just one small problem with this explanation. We would expect M to disappear much more quickly than it already has. If M is a lie and it is socially disadvantageous to express it, why, after 200 years, do we still have M? All the cards are stacked against it. Whereas if Q is a lie and M is the truth, we have all the ingredients for an eternal soap opera. Q has the snaky suppleness of mendacity, its tasty apple flavor, its stylish and sinful delights. M has the rigid backbone of a truth that can be suppressed but never quite crushed, that reappears spontaneously wherever men and women, often of the socially awkward subspecies, have the misfortune to think for themselves. We've constructed what Professor Burke would call a narrative, but compared to the level of tough thinking that we'd need to actually demonstrate that Q is the dark side and M is the light, our narrative has the strength of tissue paper. It is enough for suspicion and no more. Therefore, we need to pull the veil aside and see, look at what M and Q actually mean. Note that we are still on Urplat. We are not claiming that M and Q correspond to right and left or left and right or anything of the sort. We are just devising abstract meanings for M and Q that could on this imaginary planet we've made up, correspond to the facts we've stipulated. M and Q can coexist. M and Q are contradictory, and Q is consistently more fashionable than M. Our definitions of M and Q revolve around the ancient Urplatan word nomos. If you are for M, you are for the nomos, which makes you a pronomian. If you are for Q, you are against the nomos, which makes you an antinomian. The contradiction is obvious. Let's start by explaining the nomos and its supporters, the pronomians. The nomos is the natural structure of formal promises around which Urplatins organize their lives. To a pronomian, any Urplatin should be free to make any promise. In return, he or she can expect to be held responsible for that promise. There is no freedom to break it. All promises are voluntary until they are made and involuntary afterward. A pair of reciprocal promises, a common phenomenon on Urplat, is an agreement. The details of individual promises and agreements are infinite and constantly changing. But the high-level structure of the nomos is a consequence of reality, and it changes little. To demonstrate this point, let's derive the nomos from pure reality. First, Urplatians are not robots. They breed in families, just as we do. An Urplatian family is based on two agreements, one between the parents of the little Urplatian type and one between the child and its parents. To a pronomian, the relationship between parents and children is simple. The agreement has only one side. Children promise their parents everything, including complete obedience for as long as the parents require. Parents need make no promise to a newborn infant because an infant is helpless and cannot compel any concession. 
If they choose, they can emancipate the child when it comes of age, but if they choose, they can require it to serve them all their lives. They even hold the power of life and death over it, again, until they relinquish this power. The pronomian supports both prenatal and postnatal abortion. Note that this regime, which does not exactly match the family law of, say, California, but is more or less an accurate description of the situation in early Rome, is optimal for the parents. In other words, parents can have no reason to prefer a legal system which gives them less power over their children. If they want to relinquish this power or even assign it to others, nothing is stopping them. Note also the asymmetry of the agreement between parents and child. By recognizing the helplessness of the infant, we recognize that it has no choice but to accept any definition of the relationship that its parents may propose. The agreement is a promise in one direction because the child has no power to compel any reciprocal promise. The pronomian sees these kinds of patterns everywhere in the nomos. There is only one nomos because there is only one reality. The parameters of parenting do not change. The power dynamics are known. The answer is final. If men and women, not to mention children, were in all cases honest and trustworthy, they could cooperate without a structure of formal promises. Since they are not, they benefit from formal promises and mechanisms for enforcing those promises. But, to the pronomian, this structure is no more than a recognition of reality. One of the simplest patterns of agreement is property. Property is a system in which one erplatin claims the sole power to dominate some good, play with a toy, drive a car, fence off a plot of land, and all other Urplatins promise to respect that right. As with the relationship between parents and infants, the origin of property is the balance of power. In a world which contains no property agreements whatsoever, Urplatins can construct a property system based on the reality of current possession. Another key pattern is the proprietorship. The marriage we saw above is a simple case of partnership. In general, however, a proprietorship exists whenever multiple Urplatins decide to work collaboratively on a shared enterprise. There are two ingredients to a proprietorship, collective identity and fractional ownership. Collective identity allows the proprietorship to act as a unit, to make and collect promises of its own. Fractional ownership divides the enterprise into precisely defined shares, which in an anonymous proprietorship can be traded as property. It's probably best not to define your marriage as an anonymous proprietorship. The natural structure of a proprietorship is that ownership, benefit, and control are synonymous, i.e., if you divide the enterprise into a hundred shares, each share owns a hundredth of the business, receives a hundredth of the profit, and exercises a hundredth of the decision-making power. Of course, it is possible to construct a system of agreements which does not follow this pattern, but in most cases, there is no need to. Again, the nomos is not prescriptive. These structures emerge as natural patterns of agreement. But the most important structure in the nomos is the hierarchy of protection. Protection is what makes all these promises work. A protector is an enforcer of promises. For some promises in some contexts, protection is not necessary. The cost of breaking any promise may exceed the gain to the promise breaker. For example, someone who has a reputation for breaking promises may have trouble forming new agreements. This is an unusual condition, however, and not to be relied on. In many contexts, e.g. insider trading, a broken promise can be worth all an individual's reputation and more. By definition, above the top level of the hierarchy of protection, there is no protector. That top level, therefore, consists of unprotected authorities, typically proprietorships, but sometimes persons. These unauthorities have no authority which can settle their disputes. They must resort to war, which in Urplatin is called the ultima ratio regum, i.e., the last resort of unauthorities. Unauthorities do, however, make promises to each other. For example, an unauthority must possess an area of land to which it maintains exclusive control and undomain because its operations must be somewhere. If it lacks an undomain, it is subject to the protection of some other unauthority and thus cannot be an unauthority itself. The undomain of the unauthority is its property because, as described above, all others have agreed to respect it, but it has no protector other than itself. The key to success as an unauthority is to ensure that no other unauthority has a positive incentive to violate its promises to you. For example, 
disrespect of property rights, invasion, is the simplest form of unprotected promise violation. To prevent such assaults, an unauthority must maintain the military and political strength to make the assailant regret the decision to attack. Any less punishment is inadequate. Any more is vindictive. An unauthority makes a crucial mistake when it relinquishes the responsibility of protecting itself to another, stronger unauthority. If unauthorities cooperate against a common threat, they should cooperate for a limited time and a specific reason, and their league should be a league of equals. For an Earth example, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Romania make a good defense league. Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and England do not make a good defense league because the best case of the relationship is that the first three have become protectorates of the last, i.e., they are already halfway to being its property. Every Erplitin living within an unauthority's undomain is its client. To be the client of an undomain is to promise it absolute and unconditional obedience. No unauthority has any use for internal enemies. Moreover, an unauthority cannot be compelled to respect any promise it may make to its clients. There is no force that can compel it. Clients must rely on the desire of the unauthority to maintain its reputation for fair dealing. Fortunately, an unauthority is a business by definition. Its undermain is capital, on which it naturally desires a maximum return. Its return on the property defines the value of the business and is defined by the value of the sub-rights to the same property that it concedes to its clients. If its actions decrease this valuation, the unauthority's own stock goes down. And property in a lawless and mercurial undermain is certainly worth less than property protected by an unauthority which is careful of its reputation. On the same principle, because an unauthority maintains exclusive control within its undermain, it can and should enforce the promises that its clients make to each other. As we saw in the case of the parents, maximum promise enforcement is optimal customer service. Since the better the customer service, the higher the value of the property, and the higher the value of the property, the higher the value of the undermain, a prudent unauthority will do its best to uphold the nomos. So, for example, A may promise to B that he will serve B faithfully for the rest of his life, and B may have him whipped if he disobeys. In fact, since parents own their children, A may consign his child C to this same relationship and so on through the generations. B, of course, presumably makes some promise in return for this remarkable concession. That's right. We have just reinvented hereditary slavery. We have also reinvented absolutist or divine right monarchy, the just gentium, and in fact a whole menagerie of blasts from the past. We start to see why not everyone wants to be a pronomian. It is a separate discussion, really, but while we're talking about hereditary slavery, I can't resist mentioning a South Side view of slavery by Reverend Nehemiah Adams. If your knowledge of the peculiar institution is derived entirely from Uncle Tom's Cabin, perhaps it's worth reminding you that Uncle Tom's Cabin was a propaganda novel. It's not quite like getting your views on Jews from Judd Suss, but, and if you prefer modern sources by respected academics, Try this remarkably unpresentist presentation, whose agreement with the Reverend Adams is quite impressive. Now let's look at the antinomian side of the ledger. As you may know, antinomian is actually an English word, and nomos is Greek. Okay, I lied, but I warned you. It is usually applied in the archaic sense of religious law, but the derivation is sound, and the word is defensible in the present day. An antinomian is anyone who seeks, consciously or unconsciously, to disrupt or destroy the nomos. He is a breaker of oaths, a burner of deeds, a mocker of laws, at least from the pronomian perspective. From his own perspective, he is a champion of freedom and justice. I admit it. I am a pronomian. I endorse the nomos without condition. Fortunately, I do not have to endorse hereditary slavery, because any restoration of the nomos begins with the present state of possession. And at present, there are no hereditary slaves. However, if you want to sell yourself and your children into slavery, I don't believe it is my business to object. Try and strike a hard bargain, at least. A slightly weakened form of pronomianism, perhaps more palatable in this day and age, might include mandatory emancipation at 21. So my idea of the antinomian perspective will be a little jaundiced. But I'll try to be fair. Perhaps the most refined form of modern antinomianism is libertarianism. Libertarianism is a fine example of the antinomian form because the elements of the nomos that it attacks are specified with the elegant design sense that
that one would expect from the founder of modern libertarianism, probably the 20th century's greatest political theorist, Murray Rothbard. Rothbardian libertarianism rejects two aspects of the nomos. First, it rejects the entire concept of the unauthority, in earth speak, the principle of sovereignty. Rothbardians are called anarcho-capitalists for a reason. They deny the legitimacy of the state unless operated according to strict Rothbardian principles. Note that they do not require, say, Disney to operate Disneyland according to libertarian principles. This is because to a Rothbardian, Disney's title to Disneyland is legitimate, whereas, say, Iceland's title to Iceland is not. Rothbard has an intricate system, borrowed originally from Locke, for determining whether or not a title is legitimate. To say that this system is unamenable to objective interpretation is to put it mildly. But the titles of existing unauthorities all appear to be illegitimate. This makes libertarianism a revolutionary ideology. Since its antinomianism is so restricted and its lust for blood is minimal, however, it is not an especially dangerous or effective one. Antinomians who reject sovereignty have two main alternatives. Either they support private, amorphous, and even territorially overlapping protection agencies, a design whose military plausibility is, to put it kindly, small, or they believe that government is legitimate if and only if it obeys a set of natural laws. Again, here we see the proximity to the pronomian. But the Rothbardian concept of natural law misses the Hobbesian fact that in the true nomos, there is no party that can enforce a state's promises to its clients. This matters because legalism without sovereignty has a simple result, the personal rule of judges. The error is to imagine the existence of a superhuman legal authority which can bind a state against itself, enforcing a government of laws, not men. As the bizarre incrustations of precedent that history builds up around every written constitution demonstrate, this is simply a political perpetual motion device. All governments are governments of men. If final decisions are taken by a council of nine, these nine are the nine who rule. Whether you call them a court, a junta, or a politburo is irrelevant. Since I am a bit of a geek, though, the Rothbardian interpretation that interests me most is his approach to contract law. Note how Rothbard rejects the idea of binding promises and is forced to construct impossibly elaborate structures of property rights. If I promise to paint your house, I have really sold you a title to a paint job. And if I do not then paint your house, I'm guilty of theft for having stolen said paint job, I think. The Rothbardian design breaks down completely in a frequently mentioned exception, the case of insider trading. Here is a randomly Googled example of the kind of Jesuitic Talmudry to which libertarians resort when confronted with this problem. To a pronomian, the answer is simple. If you are to be given material non-public information, you promise to go to jail if you disclose it. Note that this is exactly how it works now. Note also that to anyone who has ever had a real job, the idea of legal insider trading is transparently ridiculous. The tactical error of the libertarian, Rothbardian or otherwise, is to believe that the state can be made smaller and simpler by making it weaker. Historically, the converse is the case. Attempts to weaken an unauthority either destroy it, resulting in chaos and death, or force it to compensate by enlarging resulting in the familiar red giant state. The pronomian prefers a state that is small, simple, and very strong. It respects the rights of its clients, not because it is forced to respect them, but because it has a financial incentive to respect them. And it obeys that financial incentive because it is managed responsibly and effectively. All things considered, however, libertarianism is a mild, innocuous form of antinomianism. Let's skip immediately to the writer who may be the most popular philosopher on earth today, Slavoj Zizek. Here we see antinomianism in an almost pure, indiscriminate form, as in this lovely passage. The Benjaminian divine violence should be thus conceived as divine in the precise sense of the old Latin motto, vox populi, vox dei, not in the perverse sense of we are doing it as mere instruments of the people's will but as the heroic assumption of the solitude of sovereign decision. It is a decision to kill, to risk or lose one's own life, made in the absolute solitude with no cover in the big other. If it is extra moral, it is not immoral. It does not give the agent the license to just kill with some kind of angelic innocence. The motto of divine violence is fiat justitia, periat mundus. It is justice, 
the point of non-distinction between justice and vengeance in which people, the anonymous part of no part, imposes its terror and makes other parts pay the price, the judgment day for the long history of oppression, exploitation, suffering. The anonymous part of no part, the big other. Listen to this scoundrel, this charlatan, this truly evil man, or buy his book with its lovely cover. You won't be the first. If I, dear open-minded progressive, ever become as popular on America's college campuses as Slavoj Zizek, you may feel free to expend as much concern over my secure relocation facilities as Professor Zizek's rusty old guillotine, which has lost not a drop of its eternal thirst. Did I mention that I'm not an antinomian? From Rothbard to Robespierre is a long leap, no doubt, but we can observe some commonalities. Antinomians believe that the present state of affairs is unsatisfactory. So, of course, do I. The nomos is horribly corroded and encrusted with all sorts of gunk. However, the pronomian's goal is to discern the real structure of order under this heap of garbage, scrape it down to the bare skeleton, replace any missing bones, and let the healthy tissue of reality grow around it. To the pronomian, this structure is arbitrary. Weirdly shaped borders, leave them as they are. High taxes, all that tax revenue is paid to someone who probably thinks of it as his property. Who am I to say it isn't? There are some property structures, notably patent rights, which I, like most libertarians, find very unproductive. If so, the government needs to print money and buy them back. Fortunately, it has a large, high-speed intaglio press. The pronomian seeks to restore the nomos, whose outlines are clear under the mountain of Byzantine procedure. Wholesale make-work and vote-buying, criminal miseducation and other horrors of the liberal democratic state. The antinomian sees many of the same horrors, but he does not share the pronomian's goal, minimizing the reallocation of property and authority. Where the pronomian simply wants to replace the management, reorganize the staff, and discard the inscrutable volumes of precedent that have absconded with the name of law, the antinomian wants to destroy power structures that he conceives as illegitimate, and of course he wants to rebuild them according to his ideals, unless he is a complete nihilist, which of course some are, but it is the destructive tendency that makes antinomianism so successful. The utopia is never constructed, or if it is, it is not a utopia. Success is a precondition to utopia, and success involves achieving the power to destroy. The most common species of antinomian is, of course, the simple anarchist. The most bloodthirsty and intrusive states of the 20th century were based on a philosophy, Marxism, which saw itself as fundamentally opposed to government. People really did believe that the socialist paradise would be something other than a state. Near where I live, on one of the most fashionable shopping streets in the world, is an anarchist bookstore. On its side wall is a mural. The mural contains two slogans. History remembers two kinds of people, those who kill and those who fight back. Anarchism strives toward a social organization which will establish well-being for all. I am flabbergasted by how revealing these slogans are. History, at least when written by honest historians, remembers one kind of people, those who kill. It also notes that those who kill always conceive of themselves as fighting back. As for a social organization, it is simply our old friend, the state. Thus, anarchism defines itself. It is an attempt to capture the state and its juicy revenues through extortion, robbery, and murder. When it succeeds, it will distribute the loot among its accomplices and establish well-being for all, at least in theory. As we've seen, the one thing an antinomian cannot abide is a formal and immutable distribution of the revenues of state. He must constantly redistribute. He must wash his hands on the stream of cash, giving to Peter and taking from Paul, or his supporters have no reason to support him. In other words, he is basically a criminal. Why is antinomianism, this criminal ideology, so popular? Fashionable, even? Why is it such a good fit for Q? Because people love power, and any movement with the power to destroy anything or even just change it has just that. Power. Antinomianism allows young aristocrats to engage in the activity that has been the favorite sport of young aristocrats since Alcibiades was a little boy, scheming for power. According to this article, for example, there are over 7,500 non-profits in the Bay Area, 3,800 of which deal with sustainability issues. These appear to employ approximately half of our fair city's jeunesse dorée. 
occupying the best years of their lives and paying them squat. Meanwhile, container ships full of empty boxes thunder out the Golden Gate, along with approximately $2 trillion a year of little green pieces of paper. However, if you're 23 and all you care about is getting laid, interning at a non-profit is definitely the way to go. Amidst all this appalling nonsense, productive people keep their heads down and manage to engage in a few remaining productive pursuits. The nomos endures. Nor, not even if the good one is elected, will the guillotine and the tumbrils reappear any time soon. But antinomianism leaves its scars nonetheless, almost literally. The simplicity and flexibility of the nomos creates, or should create, an endless stream of diversity in the best sense of the word. It's almost impossible to imagine the variety of schools, for example, that would spring up if all parents could educate their children as they saw fit. Structures of voluntary agreement tend to rely heavily on mere personal decision, and the products and services they create tend to embody personal style. For example, one of the many reasons that Belle Epoque buildings tend to be so much more attractive than post-war buildings is, I think, that sign-off on the design was much more likely to be in the hands of an individual than a committee. Antinomianism, with its love for reaching into these structures of private agreement and breaking them to serve some nominally noble purpose, has the general effect of replacing individual decisions with committee decisions, personal responsibility with process, and personal taste with official aesthetics. The final stage is the worst form of bureaucracy, litigation, an invisible tyrant whose arms wrap tighter and tighter around us every year. This is sclerosis, scar tissue, Dilbert, Brezhnev, boredom and incompetence for everyone everywhere. Most observers interpret bureaucratic sclerosis as a sign of a government which is too powerful. In fact, it is a sign of a government which is too weak. If 17 officials need to provide sign-off for you to repaint the fence in your front yard, this is not because George W. Bush, El Maximo Jefe, was so concerned about the toxicity of red paint that he wants to make 17 times sure that no wandering fruit flies are spattered with the nefarious chemical. It is because a lot of people have succeeded in making work for themselves, and that work has been spread wide and well. They are thriving off tiny pinholes through which power leaks out of the state. A strong unauthority would plug the leaks and retire the officials. Outside the communist bloc proper, of course, the ultimate in power leakage and resulting bureaucracy was India's infamous permit Raj, which still to some extent exists. Needless to say, if the subcontinent was run on a profit basis, the permit Raj would not be good business. In fact, quite amusingly and with no apparent sense of irony, our favorite newspaper recently printed an article in which the following lines appear. Vietnam's biggest selling point for many companies is its political stability. Like China, it has a nominally communist one-party system that crushes dissent, keeps the military under tight control, and changes government policies and leaders slowly. Communism means more stability, Mr. Xu, the chief financial officer of Texhong, said, voicing a common view among Asian executives who make investment decisions. At least a few American executives agree, although they never say so on the record. Democracies like those in Thailand and the Philippines have proved more vulnerable to military coups and instability. A military coup in Thailand in September 2006 was briefly followed by an attempt, never completed, to impose nationalistic legislation penalizing foreign companies. That sent the wrong signal that we would not welcome foreign investment. This has ruined the confidence of investors locally and internationally the finance minister, Surapong Swabwangli, said in an interview in Bangkok. The ironies. Of course, perhaps it is not so ironic after all as perhaps the main reason that the old China hands, the men, such as Owen Lattimore, who by manipulating procedural outcomes gave China to Mao, thought the communists were the shizzle is that they were obviously so strong. America could really do great things in Asia with the ruthlessly indoctrinated divisions of the PLA on its side, as opposed to Chiang Kai-shek, who looked like his main interests were opium and little boys. After 50 million deaths and the annihilation of traditional Chinese culture, what still remains is that strength. There is not much antinomianism in China, which has reduced its totalitarian pretensions to one simple and easily obeyed rule. Do not challenge the party for power. The result, though profoundly flawed, is the most successful capitalist country in the world. 
All things considered, it is certainly one of the best to do business in, as the article describes. And there is another effect of antinomianism. This. That's how we do it out here, man. In my primitive search of the Pravda, I find no evidence that this happened. Therefore, I must conclude that it did not, and the video is faked. Because imagine the breach of the limes between barbarism and civilization that this would represent. If you could show this video to an American of 1908, he would simply conclude that civilization has collapsed. It has not. It lives. 580 is safe, mostly, I think. This sort of thing simply can't happen. But it can, and it can go on for quite a while without, probably, affecting my life too much. Nonetheless, it is not getting better. It is getting worse. And nobody is proposing anything like anything that would fix it, except, of course, for me. And I'm crazy. So Q, of course, is left and M is right. That is, M, pronomianism, is the essential principle of the political right wing. We very rarely see this principle in anything like its undiluted form. But still, why dilute it? Why look around for partial fixes? Why not cure the problem in one step? Pure Toryism of this sort has a hidden advantage. It is a shelling point. True, it is very difficult to persuade people to abandon all of the different strains of antinomianism that have nested in their brain, each of which assures them that a simple restoration of the nomos with sovereign bankruptcy and a plenary receiver is unthinkably fascist. However, the eternal problem in organizing any kind of reactionary movement is that if you can get two conservatives together in a room, you can generally persuade them to form three political parties. Dissidents, by definition, are people who think for themselves. They do not have the advantage of the Q virus, which pulls them all together around the good one. And like normal people, they tend to disagree. This is why the search for the essential principle, the nomos, the philosopher's stone of the right wing, matters. If you can persuade those who distrust the system as it is to discard everything, liberal or conservative, not just diversity, and the good one, and police who hug criminals, but even the Constitution and the flag and the world wars and democracy and the pledge and the Bill of Rights and all the rest of that stale mythology. If you can talk your audience down to the bare metal, convince them that their political system is scrap, that it is not even remotely recoverable, and then present them with a single principle of government that is at or near this level of simplicity, you'll have a group of people who are all on exactly the same page. This, in a word, is organization. And organization is what gets things done. Chapter 12. What is to be done? Dear open-minded progressive, every true conversation is a whole life long. Isn't that the sort of thing a progressive would say? I can almost imagine it on a Starbucks cup. Also, every journey starts with a single step, and all good things come to an end, and no meeting may adjourn without action items. So, in the famous words of Lenin, what is to be done? As briefly as possible, without jeopardizing UR's reputation for pompous prolixity, let's review the problem. The leading cause of violent death and misery galore in the modern era is bad government. Most of us grew up thinking we live in a time and place in which science and democracy, which put a man on the moon and brought him back with Tang, have either cured this ill or reduced it to a manageable and improving condition. That is, most of us grew up believing, and most Americans, whatever their party registration, still believe, in progress. Both these statements are facts, but there are two ways to interpret the second. Either A, blue pill, the belief in progress is an accurate assessment of reality, or B, red pill, it isn't. Our pills correspond to visions of the future, and neither is my invention. The blue pill is marked millennium. The red pill is marked anachyclosis. To choose B we have to believe that hundreds of millions of people living in a more or less free society, many of whom are literate and even reasonably knowledgeable, completely misunderstand reality, and more specifically, history. A hard pill to swallow? Not at all, because the blue pill tastes just as big going down. To believe in progress, you have to believe that similar numbers of our ancestors were just as misguided, enthralled by racism, classism, and other nefarious ideologies from which humanity is in the progress of cleansing itself. Both pills, in other words, claim to be red. But when we note that progressive ideas flow freely through the most influential circles in our society, whereas reactionary ideas are scorned, marginalized, and often even criminalized, we can tell the difference. 
This week I tried a small experiment. I went over to Professor Burke's, having previously emailed a chivalrous warning that I was talking trash about him on my blog, and on no real provocation at all, viciously attacked the man. After all, presumably if you're a full professor specializing in the history of Southern Africa, it should be no problem for you to brush away any catcalls from the peanut gallery on this matter, perhaps even brutally humiliating the catcaller if his persistence exceeds your patience and your feeling sadistic this morning. Rank hath its duties and its pleasures, too. Obviously, I'm a biased observer, but this is not my impression of the interaction. Feel free to draw your own conclusions. Threads are opening and a little awkwardly on my part here, mainly here and closing here. At the very least, don't miss the professor's own post on the last. Big wonkery. The inspiration is unclear, but this is more or less his restatement of the cathedral hypothesis, from within the nave, as it were. Everything he says is 100% true, and I do like the phrase, big wonkery. Didn't I tell you the man had a conscience? The reason Professor Burke and his henchmen have such difficulty in handling the reactionary onslaught is not that I am smarter than him. It is certainly not that I know more about Rhodesia. He is a professional historian. I am an armchair historiographer. The reason is that since his narrative is hegemonic and mine is marginalized, I have heard all his arguments and he has heard few of mine. Also, the facts of the case could hardly be more glaring. The professor is a sort of professional moderate, a one-eyed man in the kingdom of the blind. Put him next to your stock post-colonial theorist, and the man looks positively level-headed. His thunderbolt of rage is pure reactionary righteousness. Through La Wick, I discovered this wonderful evocation of the modern reactionary experience. Reactionary airfield. Thora means revolution, of course. But something, inertia, ambition, tradition, or mere medical incapacity, keeps the professor from opening his other eye, and maybe always will. There were many such figures in the late Soviet Union. Indeed, Gorbachev himself was one. It's also fascinating to observe how what we might call kindly, a policy-oriented historian, thinks and operates. For comparison, here is the blog of a history-oriented historian. The blog's author, Christopher Knowles, has taken the motto of Ranker, V.S. Eigentlich Gewesen, as his blog title, and his personal affection for the world he studies is obvious. Indeed, some study the past because they love it, others because they hate it. Not to be too inflammatory, but Professor Burke studies Rhodesia much as the scholars of Rasenkunda once studied Jews. If Rhodesia or Rhodesians ever did anything stupid, evil, or both, the professor is sure to be an expert on the matter. And again, he is far, far superior to your average post-colonial theorist. I wonder if he knows that Rhodesian MRAP designs are saving American lives as we speak, or if he cares, or if he even approves. Anyway, enough of this dinner theater. I've tried a good many arguments for the red pill, or declinist narrative, as Professor Burke would put it. The audience being inherently irregular, I try to throw in one a week, and I don't think I've trotted out the following for a while. Imagine that there had been no scientific or technical progress at all during the 20th century, that the government of 2008 had to function with the technical base of 1908. Surely, if the quality of government has increased or even just remained constant, its performance with the same tools should be just as good, and with better technology, it should do even better. But without computers, cell phones, or even motor vehicles, 19th century America could rebuild destroyed cities instantly, at least instantly by today's standards. Imagine what this vanished society, which if we could see it with our own eyes, would strike us as no less foreign than any country in the world today, could accomplish if it got its hands on 21 saint century gadgets without any of the intervening social and political progress. When we think of progress, we tend to think of two curves summed. X the change in our understanding and control of nature slopes upward except in the most dire circumstances, the fall of Rome, for example. But X is a confounding variable. Y, the change in our quality of government, is the matter at hand. Extracting Y from X plus Y is not a trivial exercise. But broad thought experiments, like imagining what would become of 1908 America if said continent magically popped up in the mid-Atlantic in 2008, and had to modernize and compete in the global economy, tell a different story. I am very confident that old America would be the world's leading industrial power within the decade, and I suspect it would attract a lot of immigration from new America. 
The seeds of decay were there, certainly, but they had hardly begun to sprout, at least by today's standards. Surely a healthy, stable society should be able to thrive in a steady state without any technical improvements at all. But if we imagine the 20th century without technical progress, we see an almost pure century of disaster. Even when we restrict our imagination to the second half of the 20th century, to imagine the America of 2008 reduced to the technology of 1950 is a bleak, bleak thought. If you are still taking the blue pills, to what force do you ascribe this anomalous decay? Whereas the red pill gives us an easy explanation. A decaying system of government has been camouflaged and ameliorated by the advance of technology. Of course, X may overcome Y and lead us to the singularity in which misgovernment is no more troublesome than acne. Or Y may overcome X and produce the anti-singularity, a new fall of Rome. It's a little difficult to invent self-inventing AI when you're eating cold beans behind the perimeter of a refugee camp in Redwood Shores and Palo Alto is RPG squeals, mortar wumps and puffs of black smoke on the horizon as the Nortenos and the Zetas finally have it out over the charred remains of your old office park. Unlikely, sure, but do you understand the XY interaction well enough to preclude this outcome? Because I don't. Swallowing the red pill leads us like Neo into a completely different reality. In reality, B, bad government has not been defeated at all. History is not over. Oh, no, we are still living it. Perhaps we are in the positions of the French of 1780 or the Russians of 1914, who had no idea that the worlds they lived in could degenerate so rapidly into misery and terror. Is the abyss this close? I don't think so, but surely the materials are present. The spark is a long way from the gasoline. Ayers and his ilk strike most of Americans as more clownish than anything and our modern revolutionaries have never been so out of touch with the urban underclass for whom John Derbyshire proposes the wonderful Shakespearean word Bisonian. Nonetheless, the first political entrepreneur who finds a way to deploy gangsters as stormtroopers, a trick the SDS often threatened but never quite mastered, will have pure dynamite on his hands. More probable, in my opinion, is a slow decline into a Brezhnevian future in which nothing good or new or exciting or beautiful is legal. Ex Peters to a crawl. Y continues, and only after many, many decades, probably not in our lifetimes, does the real dystopian experience start, or the system could fail catastrophically and produce not the rarefied algorithmic authoritarianism of UR, but some kind of awful stormfront neo-fascism. Why is it that the more Nazi you are, the uglier your website is? Never mind, I think I know. Or it could all just work out fine, but can we count on this? We cannot. So as thoughtful and concerned people, we have three reasons to think about solutions. One is that we are thoughtful and concerned people. Two is that thinking about government in a post-democratic context is an excellent way to clear our minds of the antinomian cant with which our educators so thoroughly larded us. And three is that once the cant is cleared, it's actually kind of fun and refreshing to think about government. The problem is not new, but it has been lying fallow for a while. First the problem. Our goal is to convert a 20th century government such as USG or WashCorp into a sovereign organization which is stable, responsible, and effective. For simplicity, I'll assume you're an American. If you are not an American, you almost certainly live under an American-style post-1945 government. Substitute as necessary. Our logic is that secured real estate is the oldest and most important form of capital, i.e., it is a productive asset. There is only one responsible and effective way to manage a productive asset. Make it turn a profit. To maximize the profit is to maximize the price of the asset. To maximize the price of a sovereign jurisdiction is to maximize the price of the properties within it. To maximize real estate prices is to maximize the desirability of the neighborhood. To maximize the desirability of the neighborhood is to maximize the quality of life therein. To maximize the quality of life is the goal of good government. Ergo, responsible and effective government is best achieved by sovereign capitalism, that is, neocameralism. Watch the Austrian economist Hans Hermann Hoppe, since Rothbard's premature demise, probably the superstar of the school today, struggle with this problem. Professor Hoppe is an antinomian of the libertarian species. He is a sound formalist at every layer up to the top, where he rejects the concept of sovereign property as a royalist plot. Actually, in medieval Europe, sovereign fiefs could easily be bought and sold 
and note that no natural rights protected the Quetzals from the Hohenzollerns. Professor Hopper writes, under these circumstances, a completely new option has become viable, the provision of law and order by freely competing private profit and loss insurance agencies. Even though hampered by the state, insurance agencies protect private property owners upon payment of a premium against a multitude of natural and social disasters, from floods and hurricanes to theft and fraud. Thus, it would seem that the production of security and protection is the very purpose of insurance. Moreover, people would not turn to just anyone for a service as essential as that of protection. There's one difference. An insurance agency exists under the protection of a government which enforces its contracts, whereas English actually has a word for an unprotected protection agency. It's called a gang. The Russian word krisha, meaning roof, is also quite evocative. In real life, for obvious military reasons, gangs tend to organize themselves around territories or contiguous blocks of real estate. Historically, situations in which gang territories overlap are unusual. As formal rules develop for the internal organization of the gang and its relations with other gangs, the gang becomes a country. Formalization maximizes the gang's profits and greatly improves its client's quality of life. We are starting from the other direction, a gigantic, mature, if not senescent, vegetable marrow of a government. Awful as it is, Degenerate as its laws have become, it is still a government, and a government is still a good thing. It is considerably easier to liquidate and restructure USG than to turn MS-13 and the Black Gorilla family into the Habsburgs and Hohenzollerns. When we left off this problem, we had liquidated USG and transferred full operating control of its assets to a mysterious bankruptcy administrator known only as the Receiver, Chapter 10. We had not described... A, how the process is initiated, B, how the receiver is selected, or C, what policies beyond terminating foreign policy, quelling the Bazonians, and installing a sensible tax system, we can expect the receiver to follow. Frankly, C is not worth a lot of speculation. The democratic habit in which ordinary people, or even you, our readers, who are very unlikely to be ordinary people, conceive ourselves capable of understanding how a country is best administered is one to be broken at all costs. I drive a car on a regular basis, but I have no idea what I would do if someone put me in charge of Ford. I am typing this message on a Mac, but my first act as CEO of Apple would be to resign. Well, I might do something about the blasted batteries first. I love film, but don't try to make me direct one. And so on. Moreover, the fact that we have assigned the receiver full administrative authority means, by definition that he or she is not constrained by the whims and fancies of whatever movement produced the office. A restoration has one goal, responsible and effective government. The details are out of its planner's hands. However, we can think about some things. For example, there are very few decisions that need to be taken on a continental level. USG provides continental defense, hardly hard in North America, but whose absence would eventually be felt. There are certainly some continent-scale environmental issues. I can't think of much else. In a country with responsible and effective government, even immigration can be a local issue. If you don't have permission to live and or work somewhere, the technology required to prevent you is hardly Orwellian. So I suspect the receiver's restructuring plans might involve dividing North America into, say, its largest 100 or 200 or 500 metropolitan areas, USG's historical internal boundaries being of little importance, each of which gets its own little mini-receiver, devoted as usual to maximizing asset value. To paraphrase Tom Hayden, one, two, three, many Monacos. Eventually, there is no reason why these principalities could not be independently traded and even locally sovereign, perhaps owning the continental assets of USG consortium style rather than the other way around. Initially, however, USG's financial liabilities are as vast as its assets, exactly as vast, since it needs to become solvent. Unless we want to make the dollar worthless, which we don't, the entire country must remain federal property. Imagining restructuring at a local level helps in a couple of ways. First, redundancy counts. If Seattle, for some reason, winds up with Kim Jong-il as its receiver, and he promises to be good but quickly resorts to his old habits, the residents can always flee to Portland. If Kim gets the whole continent, the continent is screwed. Second, it is simply easier to imagine how a city could be restored, especially if you happen to live in that city. 
The San Francisco Bay Area, for example, is a jewel even in its present dilapidated state. It's no-go areas, modernist crimes against architecture, froth of beggars and rim of tacky sprawl. I can scarcely imagine what a Steve Jobs, a Frederick the Great, a Mount Stuart Elphinstone, or an administrator of similar caliber would make of it. But how be do we select such an administrator? The crucial question is the back end of this administrative structure. A receiver is not a benevolent dictator. If angels were available to meet our staffing needs, that would be one thing. They are not. There is no responsibility without accountability. The trick is in preventing accountability from degenerating into parliamentary government, that is, politics, which is how we got where we are at present. To prevent the emergence of politics, a stable, established, neo-cameralist state relies on the fact that its shares are held by a widely distributed body of investors, each of whose management control is precisely proportional to the share of the profits the investor receives, and none of whom has any way to profit privately by causing the enterprise to be mismanaged. The result is a perfect alignment of interests among all shareholders, all of whom have exactly the same one-dimensional goal, maximizing the value of their shares. Experience in private corporate governance shows that such a body tends to be reasonably competent in selecting managers and almost never succumbs to anything like politics. When converting a democratic state into a neo-cameralist one, however, a great deal of care is needed. For example, since any bankruptcy procedure converts debt to equity, quite a few shares must end up in the hands of those who now hold dollars, bank or treasury obligations, rights to entitlement payments, etc., etc. Will these individuals be A, rationally motivated to maximize the value of their assets, and B, effective in selecting competent management that will act according to A? Or won't they? There is no way to know. I think I am on reasonably firm ground in asserting that once democratic politics can be made to go away, this design offers no avenues by which it can revive itself. However, keeping the thing dead is one thing. Killing it is quite another. Today's administrative states are irresponsible because their actions tend to be the consequence of vast chains of procedure which separate individual decisions from results. The result is hopelessly dysfunctional and ineffective, often becomes seriously detached from reality, and demands an immense quantity of pointless busywork. However, it has the Burkean, Ed, not Tim, virtues of stability, consistency, and predictability. It works, sort of. When you take all this process, policy, and precedent, rip it up and revert to responsible personal authority, you gain enormously in effectiveness and efficiency. But the design places a tremendous engineering load on the assumption of responsibility and the absence of politics. This simply can't be screwed up. If it is, the consequences can be disastrous. Hello, Hitler. Also, did I mention Hitler? Finally, there is the possibility of creating a new Hitler. Obviously, it's time for us to have a serious discussion of Hitler. Anyone who proposes anything even remotely resembling an absolute personal dictatorship needs a Hitler position, because after all, I mean Hitler. Albert J. Nock, who needs no introduction here at UR, and many of whose words will stand the test of time long after we are dead, wrote the following in his diary for July 23, 1933. The wretched state of things in Germany continues. It is a manifestation of a nationwide sentiment that any honest-minded person must sympathize with, but its expression, under the direction of a lunatic adventurer, takes shape in the most revolting enormities. This is simply the best summary of national socialism I have ever seen and it was written only six months after the swine came to power. Fascist-style approaches to terminating democracy in the 21th century face two unsolvable problems. One is that the democracies have, in their usual style, overdone the job of arming themselves against anything like fascism. They are absurdly terrified of it. Fascism is a salmon trying to jump over Boulder Dam. Two is that even if your salmon could jump over Boulder Dam, the result would be fascism, which would certainly be an improvement in some regards, but not in others. The Boulder Dam analogy is well demonstrated by La Wick's page for direct action. Note that every example on the page is in the revolutionary or progressive category. The term does not seem to apply to reactionary or fascist direct action, although tactics have no alignment. Of course, the gangster methods that Hitler and Mussolini used in coming to power were direct action in a nutshell as were the actions of the southern redeemers. 
The answer is that direct action depends on the tolerance and or connivance of the police, military and or judicial system. In Weimar Germany, nationalists had all three, mostly relics of the Wilhelmine government, on their side. Denazification reversed this. Today in Europe, Antifas can beat up their opponents with a wink and a nod from the authorities, whereas neo-Nazis get the book thrown at them. The answer? Duh. Don't be a neo-Nazi. Anyone interested in overthrowing democracy desperately needs to read the great memoir of Ernst von Salomon, Der Fragebogen, published in English as The Answers, but better translated as The Questionnaire. The title is a reference to the denazification questionnaires which all Germans seeking any responsible post-war position had to complete. Salomon, who despite his name was not Jewish, though his wife was, was never a Nazi. He was, however, a hardcore nationalist, and not just any hardcore nationalist. He was a member of the notorious post freikorps Death Squad, organization consul, and personally involved in the assassination of Rathenau, for which he served time. If it's any defense, he was 19, and his role was limited to procuring the getaway car. He was also a brilliant writer who made a living turning out movie scripts, before, during, and after the Third Reich. A good comparison is Ernst Junger, also wonderfully readable, if a little more abstruse. Der Fragebogen is a gloriously fresh introduction to the world of Weimar, which most of us have encountered only from the liberal side. If you have trouble understanding how Nock could sympathize with the destruction of Weimar while abhorring Hitlerism, von Salomon is your man. The opening alone is a work of genius. Military Government of Germany. Fragebogen. Warning. Read the entire Fragebogen carefully before you start to fill it out. The English language will prevail if discrepancies exist between it and the German translation. Answers must be typewritten or printed clearly in block letters. Every question must be answered precisely and no space is to be left blank. If a question is to be answered by either yes or no, print the word yes or no in the appropriate space. If the question is inapplicable, so indicate by some appropriate word or phrase such as none or not applicable. Add supplementary sheets if there is not enough space in the questionnaire. Omissions or false or incomplete statements are offenses against military government and will result in prosecution and punishment. I have now read the entire Fragebogen or questionnaire carefully. Although not specifically told to do so, I have even read it through more than once, word for word, question for question. This is not by any means the first questionnaire with which I have grappled. I have already filled in many identical Fragebogens and a great number of similar ones at a time and in circumstances concerning which I shall have a certain amount to say under the heading Remarks. Apart from that group of Fragebogens, there were others. During the period January 30th, 1933 to May 6th, 1945, which is usually called the Third Reich, or with cheap wit, the Thousand Year Reich, or briefly the Nazi regime, or correctly the period of the National Socialist Government in Germany. During those years, too, I was frequently confronted with Fragebogens. I can confidently assert that I invariably read them through with care. In order to satisfy any doubts on the matter, let me say at once that the perusal of all these questionnaires has always produced the same effect on me. A tumult of sensations is let loose within my breast, in which the first and the strongest is that of acute discomfort. When I try to identify this sensation of discomfort more exactly, it seems to me to be very close to that experienced by a schoolboy caught at some mischief, a very young person on the threshold of experience suddenly face to face with an enormous and ominous power which claims for itself all the force of law, custom, order, and morality. He cannot yet judge the world's pretension that whatever is right, at present his conscience is good when he is in harmony with that world, bad when he is not. He cannot yet guess that a happy moment will one day come when he will weigh the world and its institutions in the scales of that still dormant conscience of his, will weigh it, and will find it wanting and in need of rebuilding from the foundations up. Now, in view of the matters which I have had to discuss in my answer to question 19, I am clearly nowise entitled to express my opinions on matters of conscience, nor is it I who wish to do so. Yet how am I to account for the tone and arrangement of this questionnaire if its general intention is not a new incitement to me to examine this conscience of mine? The institution which in all the world seems to me most worthy of admiration, the Catholic Church, has its system of confession and absolution. The Church recognizes that men may be sinners, 
but does not brand them as criminals. Furthermore, there is only one unforgivable sin, that against the Holy Ghost. The Catholic Church seeks to convert and save the heathen who is striving to be happy according to his lights. But for the heretic, who has once heard the call and has yet refused to follow it, there can be no forgiveness. This attitude is straightforward and consistent and entails certain sublime consequences. It leads directly to the secrecy of the confessional. It also means that each man, in his search for grace, is very largely dependent on his own innermost determination. A fine attitude, and one that I might myself embrace, did not I fear that the very quintessence of the church's teaching, yes, the Ten Commandments themselves, were in painful contradiction to a whole series of laws that I have recently been compelled to observe. For it is not the Catholic Church that has approached me and requested that I examine my conscience, but another and far less admirable institution, Allied Military Government in Germany. Sublimity here is at a discount. Unlike the priest with the poor sinner remote from the world in the secrecy of the quiet confessional, AMG sends its questionnaire into my home and, like an examining judge with a criminal, barks its 131 questions at me. It demands coldly and flatly, nothing less than the truth. It even threatens twice, once at the beginning and once at the end, to punish me. And the nature and scope of the punishment envisaged I can only too vividly imagine. See remarks at the end of this questionnaire. Salomon was badly beaten and his wife was raped by American soldiers in a post-war detention camp. M.M. It was representatives of A.M.G., men in well-creased uniforms with many brightly colored decorations who made it unambiguously clear to me that every man worthy to be called a man should study his conscience before deciding whether or not to act in any specific way. They sat in front of me, one after the other, those agreeable and well-groomed young people, and spoke with glibness and self-assurance about so great a matter as a man's conscience. I admired them for their apodictic certainty. I envied them their closed and narrow view of the world. Salomon's book was a bestseller in post-war Germany. It is now anathema, of course, in that thoroughly occupied country in which only the faintest trace of any pre-American culture can still be detected. Here, to get back to Hitler, are some of Salomon's observations on the Nazis. At that time, it was high summer of 1922, and the Oberammergau Passion Play was being acted, Munich was filled with foreigners. Even the natives had not the time to attend big political rallies. Thus, I did not even have a chance to hear Hitler, and now I shall go to my grave without ever having once attended a meeting where I could hear this most remarkable figure of the first half of the 20th century speak in person. What does he actually say? I asked the Capitan's adjutant. He says more or less this, the adjutant began and it was significant that he could not help mimicking the throaty voice with the vengeful undertones. He says quite calmly, My enemies have sneered at me, saying that you can't attack a tank with a walking stick. Then his voice gets louder, and he says, But I tell you, and then he shouts with the utmost intensity, that a man who hasn't the guts to attack a tank with a walking stick will achieve nothing. And then there's tremendous senseless applause. The Capitan said, Tanks I know nothing about, but I do know that a man who tries to ram an ironclad with a fishing smack isn't a hero. He's an idiot. I know not whether the Capitan, lacking in powers of oratory as he was, found Hitler's methods of influencing the masses as repugnant as I did, but I assumed this to be the case. I also obscurely felt that for the Capitan, deeply involved in his political concept, to be carried forward on the tide of a mass movement must seem unclean. Policy could only be laid down from above, not from below. The state must always think for the people, never through the people. Again, I obscurely felt that there could be no compromise here, that all compromise would mean falsification. But it was precisely his effect on the masses that led to Hitler's success in Munich. He employed new methods of propaganda, hitherto unthought of. The banners of his party were everywhere to be seen, as was the gesture of recognition, the raised right arm used by his supporters. The deliberate effort involved in this gesture was in itself indicative of faith. And everywhere was to be heard the greeting, the slogan, Heil Hitler. Never before had a man dared to include his essentially private name in an essentially public phrase. 
It implied among his followers a degree of self-alienation that was perhaps significant. No longer could the individual establish direct contact with his neighbor. This third party was needed as intermediary. And ten pages later, the word democracy is one that I have only very rarely and with great reluctance employed. I do not know what it is, and I have never yet met anyone who could explain its meaning to me in terms that I am capable of understanding. But I fear that Hitler's assertion that his ideological concept was the democratic concept will prove a hard one to refute. The enlightenment of the world from a single central position, the winning of mass support through convincing arguments, the legitimate road to power by way of the ballot box, the legitimization by the people itself of power achieved, I fear it is hard to deny that these are democratic stigmata, revelatory perhaps of democracy in a decadent and feverish form, but democratic nonetheless. I further fear that the contrary assertion that the totalitarian system as set up by Hitler was not democratic will prove a hard one to justify. The totalitarian state is the exact opposite of the authoritarian state, which latter, of course, bears no democratic stigmata but hierarchical ones instead. Some people seem to believe that forms of government are estimable in accordance with their progressive development. Since totalitarianism is certainly more modern than the authoritarian state system, they must logically give Hitler the advantage in the political field. And I fear, dear open-minded progressive, that this is the first time in your life you've seen the word authoritarian in a positive context. The weird crawlies that crawl in when we leave our minds ajar. Perhaps yours is too open after all. Better stop reading now. In case Salomon isn't quite clear, let me paraphrase his theory of Hitler and the state. Salomon and his hero, Capitan Erhardt, were essentially militarists and monarchists, believers in the old Prussian system of government. In 1849, when Friedrich Wilhelm IV refused to accept a crown from the gutter, in other words, to become constitutional monarch of Germany under an English-style liberal system created by the revolutions of 1848, he was expressing much the same philosophy. While there is more mysticism to it, and anyone raised in a democratic society must cringe instinctively at the militaristic tone, Salomon's philosophy is more or less the same as neo cameralism Understandably, since after all, it was Frederick the Great who gave us cameralism. Salomon's view of public opinion is mine, that it simply has nothing to do with the difficult craft of state administration, any more than the passengers' views on aerodynamics are relevant to the pilot of a 747. In particular, most Americans today know next to nothing about the reality of Washington, and frankly, I don't see why they should have to learn. In the totalitarian system as practiced by Hitler and the Bolsheviks, public opinion is not irrelevant at all. Oh no, it is the cement that holds the regime together. Most people do not know, for example, of the frequent plebiscites by which the Nazis validated their power. But they do have a sense that Nazism was broadly popular, at least until the war and they are right. Moreover, even a totalitarian regime that does not elicit genuine popularity can, like the Bolsheviks, elicit the pretense of popularity, and this has much the same power. When describing any political design, a good principle to follow is that the weak are never the masters of the strong. If the design presents itself as one in which the weak control the strong, try erasing the arrowhead on the strong end and redrawing it on the weak end. Odds are you will end up with a more realistic picture. Popular sovereignty was a basic precept of both the Nazi and Bolshevik designs, and in both the official story was that the party expressed the views of the masses. In reality, of course, the party controlled those views. Thus, the link which Salomon draws between democracy and the Orwellian mind control state, two tropes which we children of progress were raised to imagine as the ultimate opposites. Salomon is obviously not a libertarian, or at least not as much of a libertarian as me, and I suspect that what disturbs him is less the corruption of public opinion by the German state than the corruption of the German state by public opinion. Regardless of the direction, the phenomenon was a feedback loop that, in the case of Nazism, led straight to perdition. Here is another description of democracy. Try to guess where it was written and when. The new democracy. What is this freedom by which so many minds are agitated, which inspires so many insensate actions, so many wild speeches, which leads the people so often to misfortune. In the democratic sense of the word, freedom is the right of political power 
or to express it otherwise, the right to participate in the government of the state. This universal aspiration for a share in government has no constant limitations and seeks no definite issue, but incessantly extends, so that we might apply to it the words of the ancient poet about dropsy, crescit indulgent sibi. For ever extending its base, the new democracy aspires to universal suffrage, a fatal error, and one of the most remarkable in the history of mankind. By this means, the political power so passionately demanded by democracy would be shattered into a number of infinitesimal bits, of which each citizen acquires a single one. What will he do with it, then? How will he employ it? In the result, it has undoubtedly been shown that in the attainment of this aim, democracy violates its sacred formula of freedom indissolubly joined with equality. It is shown that this apparently equal distribution of freedom among all involves the total destruction of equality. Each vote, representing an inconsiderable fragment of power, by itself signifies nothing. An aggregation of votes alone has a relative value. The result may be likened to the general meetings of shareholders in public companies. By themselves, individuals are ineffective, but he who controls a number of these fragmentary forces is master of all power and directs all decisions and dispositions. We may well ask in what consists the superiority of democracy. Everywhere the strongest man becomes master of the state, sometimes a fortunate and resolute general, sometimes a monarch or administrator with knowledge, dexterity, a clear plan of action, and a determined will. In a democracy, the real rulers are the dexterous manipulators of votes with their placemen, the mechanics who so skillfully operate the hidden springs which move the puppets in the arena of democratic elections. Men of this kind are ever ready with loud speeches lauding equality, in reality, they rule the people as any despot or military dictator might rule it. The extension of the right to participate in elections is regarded as progress and as the conquest of freedom by democratic theorists, who hold that the more numerous the participants in political rights, the greater is the probability that all will employ this right in the interests of the public welfare and for the increase of the freedom of the people. Experience proves a very different thing. The history of mankind bears witness that the most necessary and fruitful reforms, the most durable measures, emanated from the supreme will of statesmen, or from a minority enlightened by lofty ideas and deep knowledge, and that, on the contrary, the extension of the representative principle is accompanied by an abasement of political ideas and the vulgarization of opinions in the mass of the electors. It shows also that this extension in great states was inspired by secret aims to the centralization of power or led directly to dictatorship. In France, universal suffrage was suppressed with the end of the terror and was re-established twice merely to affirm the autocracy of the two Napoleons. In Germany, the establishment of universal suffrage served merely to strengthen the high authority of a famous statesman who had acquired popularity by the success of his policy. What its ultimate consequences will be, heaven only knows. The manipulation of votes in the game of democracy is of the commonest occurrence in most European states, and its falsehood, it would seem, has been exposed to all, yet few dare openly to rebel against it. The unhappy people must bear the burden, while the press, herald of a suppositious public opinion, stifles the cry of the people with its shibboleth, great is Diana of the Ephesians. But to an impartial mind, all this is nothing better than a struggle of parties and a shuffling with numbers and names. The voters, by themselves inconsiderable unities, acquire a value in the hands of dexterous agents. This value is realized by many means, mainly by bribery in innumerable forms, from gifts of money and trifling articles to the distribution of places in the services, the financial departments, and the administration. Little by little, a class of electors has been formed which lives by the sale of votes to one or another of the political organizations. So far has this gone in France, for instance, that serious, intelligent, and industrious citizens in immense numbers abstain from voting through the difficulty of contending with the cliques of political agents. With bribery go violence and threats, and reigns of terror are organized at elections, by the help of which the respective cliques advance their candidates. Hence the stormy scenes at electoral demonstrations in which arms have been used, and the field of battle strewn with the bodies of the killed and wounded. Organization and bribery, 
These are the two mighty instruments which are employed with such success for the manipulation of the mass of electors. Such methods are in no way new. Thucydides depicts in vivid colors their employment in the ancient republics of Greece. The history of the Roman Republic presents monstrous examples of corruption as the chief instrument of factions at elections. But in our times, a new means has been found of working the masses for political aims and joining them in adventitious alliances by provoking a fictitious community of views. This is the art of rapid and dexterous generalization of ideas, the composition of phrase and formulas, disseminated with the confidence of burning conviction as the last word of science, as dogmas of politicology, as infallible appreciations of events, of men, and of institutions. At one time, it was believed that the faculty of analyzing facts and deducing general principles was the privilege of a few enlightened minds and deep thinkers. Now it is considered an universal attainment, and under the name of convictions, the generalities of political science have become a sort of current money coined by newspapers and rhetoricians. The faculty of seizing and assimilating on faith these abstract ideas has spread among the mass and become infectious, more especially to men insufficiently or superficially educated who constitute the great majority everywhere. This tendency of the people is exploited with success by politicians who seek power. The art of creating generalities serves for them as a most convenient instrument. All deduction proceeds by the path of abstraction. From a number of facts, the immaterial are eliminated, the essential elements collated, classified, and general formulas deduced. It is plain that the justice and value of these formulas depend upon how many of the premises are essential and how many of those eliminated are irrelevant. The speed and ease with which abstract conclusions are arrived at are explained by the unceremonious methods observed in this process of selection of relevant facts and in their treatment. Hence, the great success of orators and the extraordinary effect of the abstractions which they cast to the people. The crowd is easily attracted by commonplaces and generalities invested in sonorous phrases. It cares nothing for proof which is inaccessible to it. Thus is formed unanimity of thought, and unanimity fictitious and visionary, but in its consequences actual enough. This is called the voice of the people, with the pendant, the voice of God. The ease with which men are drawn by commonplaces leads everywhere to extreme demoralization of public thought and to the weakening of the political sense of the people. Of this, France today presents a striking example, and England also has not escaped the infection. The author is the great Russian statesman and reactionary Konstantin Pobedonostsev. The book is Reflections of a Russian Statesman, a fascinating mix of cogent observations of the West and impenetrable orthodox mysticism. I recommend it highly. The date is 1869. Is there anything in Pobedonostsev's description of democracy that does not apply to the contest of Obama and McCain? Not that I can see. So much for the inevitable triumph of truth. There is not a single significant American writer, even if you count Confederates as American, which is a big if, as right-wing as Pobedonostsev. He is to the right of everyone. He may even be to the right of Carlyle, even the old Carlyle who, two years earlier, produced the terrifying vision of shooting Niagara. Well, we shot Niagara all right, and Russia got her parliament. For a few months. And as for Germany, the consequences are no longer heaven's secret. We have moved no closer to answering Lenin's question. But we have a better idea of what is not to be done. A restoration can't be produced by fascist violence and intimidation because fascism today has no sympathizers in high places. It can't be produced by democratic demagoguery, both because the concept itself would be corrupted by filtration through the mass mind, and because said mind is simply not smart enough to evaluate the proposition logically, and logic is its only strength. It's certainly not emotionally appealing. Moreover, when democratic techniques are used to seize absolute power, the result is Hitler. Yet at the same time, we can't expect the truth to triumph on its own because said truth has been floating around since the 1860s at least, and it has gotten nowhere at all. And worst of all, the design is reliable only in the steady state. Even if the political energy to make it happen, without either thug intimidation or democratic hypnotism, can somehow be produced, there is no magical reason to expect the initial shareholders, who know nothing more about managing a country than you or I, 
to be free from politics, to choose a receiver who knows his ass from his elbow, or even to let one who does know his ass from his elbow do his job. So perhaps nothing can be done. We should just bend over and enjoy it. Do you, dear open-minded progressive or other you are reader, have any suggestions? Chapter 13, Tactics and Structures of Any Prospective Restoration. Dear open-minded progressive, I've been holding out on this one way too long. What is to be done? Let's try and actually answer the question this time. To be precise, by what procedures might a 20th century liberal democracy be converted safely, permanently, and with reasonable continuity of administration into a sovereign corporation that can be trusted to deliver secure, reliable, and effective government? If you, dear open-minded progressive, chose to agree with me that this is actually a good idea, how might we go about trying to make it happen? As I've mentioned a couple of times, my father's parents were CPUSA activists, so I do have a personal heritage of quasi-religious conspiratorial revolutionary thinking, but revolutionary tactics and structures are not, in general, useful to reactionaries. A restoration is the opposite of a revolution. Both imply regime change, but both apoptosis and necrosis involve cell death. There is no continuum between the two. The signature performance of the modern revolution is the irregular military parade, i.e. cars or pickup trucks full of well-armed youths in their colorful native attire, driving up and down your street while A, honking, B, waving hand-lettered banners, C, chanting catchy slogans, and D, discharging their firearms in a vaguely vertical direction. Occasionally, one of the vehicles will pull up in front of a house and discharge its occupants, who enter the building and emerge with an infidel, racist, Jew, spy, polluter, Nazi, or other criminal. The offender is either restrained for transportation to an educational facility or enlightened on the spot as an act of radical social justice. Yes, we can. Whereas in the ideal restoration, the transfer of power from old to new regime is as predictable and seamless as any electoral transition with all rites, procedures, and rituals correct down to the fringe on the Grand Lama's robe, the Armani suits on his oozy-toting bodyguards, and the scrimshaw on the yak-butter skull candle he lights and blows out three times while chanting, Obama, Obama, Lama Alpaca Obama. The Heavenly Grand Council releases itself from the harsh bonds of existence, identifies its successor, asks all employees to remove their personal belongings from their offices, and instructs senior eunuchs to report for temporary detention. Obviously, we live in America and we have no Grand Lama. However, our government has a clear procedure for 100% legal closure. It can pass a constitutional amendment which terminates the Constitution. While it would be foolish to insist on this level of legal purity, it would be crass not to aspire to it. But let's acquire a little neutral distance by saying that we live in Plainland. We are presently ruled by Plaingoff, and we wish to replace it with Plain Corp. The transition should be a total reset. The policies, personnel, and procedures of Plainkov have nothing in common except by coincidence with the operations of Plaingoff. Of course, Plaingoff inherits Plaingoff's assets, but with a completely new decision framework. Arbitrary restructuring can be expected. For obvious reasons, I prefer the word reset. But English does have a word, borrowed from French, for a discontinuous transition in sovereignty, coup. Not every coup is a reset, but every reset is a coup. The French meaning, a blow or strike, is a perfect shorthand for a discontinuous transition of sovereignty. If this transition involves a complete replacement of the sovereign decision structure, it is a reset. For example, if Plangov's military initiates a reset, as obviously it will always have the power to, we would be looking at a military reset. I am not a high-ranking military officer, and I doubt you are either. And if the military reset is the only possible transition structure, neither of us has much to contribute. While in my opinion, just about every country on earth today would benefit from a transition to military government, the whole point of a military coup is that unless you are actually a member of the general staff, your opinion doesn't matter. So why should we care? It is hard to be interested in the matter. I should note, however, that according to Gallup, America's most trusted institution is, you guessed it, followed directly by small business and the police. The military is almost three times as popular as the press. It is six times as popular as Congress. You do the math, kids. When the tanks finally roll, there will be no shortage of cheering. And oddly enough, the other half of the cathedral did not make the poll. 
Perhaps it fell off the bottom and was discarded. The only alternative to a military coup is a political coup, or to be catchy, a demo coup. In a demo coup, the government is overthrown by organizing a critical mass of political opposition to which it surrenders, ideally just as the result of overwhelming peer pressure. Certainly the most salient example is the fall of the Soviet Union, including its puppet states and the wonderfully, if inaccurately named, Velvet Revolution. Again, a reaction is not a revolution. Other examples include the Southern Redemption, the Meiji Restoration, and of course the English Restoration. In each of these events, a broad political coalition deployed more or less non-violent, if seldom perfectly legal, tactics to replace a failed administration with a new regime which was dedicated to the restoration of responsible and effective government. Note that all of these are real historical events, which actually happened in the real world. I did not just make them up and edit them into Wikipedia. Yes, dear open-minded progressive, change can happen. If there is one fact to remember about a restoration via Demoku, it's that this program has nothing to do with the traditional 11-3 grade civics class notion of democratic participation. Obviously, we are not trying to replace one or two officials whose role is primarily symbolic. We are trying to replace not the current occupants of the temporary and largely ceremonial political offices of Plaingoff, but Plaingoff itself, lock, stock, and barrel. Indeed, we are using democratic tactics to abolish democracy itself. There is nothing at all ironic in this. Is it ironic when an absolute monarch decrees a democratic constitution? By definition, a reset is a non-incremental transition. To the extent that there is some gradual algorithm which slowly weakens Plaingov and pulls it inexorably toward the brink of implosion, gradualist tactics may be of use. But the tactics are useful only as they promote the goal, and the goal is not gradual. We are all familiar with gradual revolutions on the Fabian or Gramscian plan. And tactics are tactics for good or evil. In the war between the hosts of heaven and the armies of Satan, both the demons and the angels drive tanks and fly jet fighters. So why is it that history affords many examples of sudden revolution, many examples of gradual revolution, some examples of sudden reaction, and almost no examples of gradual reaction? Even if we had no explanation for this observation, it is always imprudent to mess with Cleo. But we do have an explanation. Revolution, being fundamentally antinomian, opposed to law and order, is entropic. Revolution is the destruction of order, degradation into complexity. Slow destruction is decay, cancer, and corrosion. Rapid destruction is annihilation, fire, and gangrene. Both are possible. Sometimes they form a delightful cocktail. But reaction being pronomian, favoring law and order, is the replacement of complex disorder with simple geometric forms. If we assume that disorder snowballs and creates further disorder, a common entropic phenomenon, think of the cascade of events that turns a normal cell into a cancerous cell. Any attempt at a gradual reaction is fighting uphill. You treat cancer cells by killing them, not by turning them back into healthy, normal tissue. Of course, this is just a metaphor. We are not killing people. We are liquidating institutions. Let's try and keep this in mind, kids. But not too much in mind, because the metaphor of termination is critical. Metaphorically, here is how we're going to liquidate Plaingoff. We're going to hit it extremely hard in the head with a sharp, heavy object which traverses a short throw at very high speed. Then we'll crush its body under an enormous roller, dry the pancake in a high-temperature oven, and grind it into a fine powder which is mixed with molten glass and cast as ingots for storage in a deep geological cavity such as a salt mine. The shaft is filled with concrete and enclosed by a dog-patrolled double fence with the razor wire facing inward. This still may not work, but at least it's a shot. Less metaphorically, the starting point for a demo coup is a program. Call it X. Success involves A, convincing a large number of people to support the proposition that X should be done, and B, organizing them to act collectively so as to make X happen. To define the demo coup, we have to explain what it's not. Civics class democracy. Let's try a farcical experiment in civics class democracy just to see how pointless it is. We start, obviously, by forming the Mensist Party, a new product in the marketplace of ideas. Of course, we have new ideas, so we need a new brand. In the classic democratic spirit, our new party must organize itself around either A, a shared vision of government policy, racist corporate fascism, let's say, B, a flamboyant personality, me, obviously, or C, both. The Mensist party faces obstacles so huge as to be comical. First, what is racist corporate fascism? 
Since mensism is out beyond the fringes of the fringes, it will only attract supporters who are genuinely passionate about our vision of racist corporate fascism. Of course, this label is designed to attract only the most independent-minded of independent thinkers, to put it gently. Therefore, racist corporate fascism must become a big tent, which, for the sake of enlarging itself and appearing important, embraces all supporters whose views can be vaguely described as racist corporate fascist. In fact, I have no idea what racist corporate fascism might be. I just like the name. But this is reckless, and it causes problems. For example, is RCF anti-Semitic or not? Of course, I, Mencius, am not anti-Semitic. But do I strain every muscle to purge Mencists who express what may be very mild anti-Semitic views? If so, the Mencius party will become an Avakian-esque exercise in cult leadership. If not, it will become a blurry, lager-soaked exercise in vulgar plebeian puerility a la Stormfront. Of course, all Mencius must support the political candidacy of Mencius, who will no doubt decline into referring to himself in the third person. But will anyone else? Ha! Huh. More generally, it's easy to see the organizational difficulty of constructing a movement around a vision of government, whether a detailed policy vision, Sailor's Plan for School Reform comes to mind, or a general theory of government such as libertarianism. If our supporters are required to think in the democratic tense, to imagine themselves or at least their ideas in power, we have taken on an extraordinary boat anchor of unproductive internal infighting. What is libertarianism? Dear God, there's a fine line between herding cats and being herded by them. And if supporters are required to elect a public personality whom they conceive as a personal friend, much as the readers of people imagine that they know Brad Pitt, it, A, only takes one tiff to estrange this fragile bond, and B, does not ensure that the leader will have any actual power when he does get into office. Like today's presidents, all of whom have been actors, that is, their job is to read from scripts written by others, for the last 75 years, he will spend most of his time trying to retain the fickle sycophants who put him where he is. Our modern democratic elections are an extremely poor substitute for actual regime change. As we've seen, democracy is to government as gray, slimy cancer is to pink and healthy living tissue. It is a degenerate neoplastic form. The only reason America has lasted as long as she has, and even still has more than a few years left, is that this malignancy is at present insisted in a thick husk of sclerotic scar tissue, our permanent civil service. Democracy implies politics, and political is a dirty word to the civil service state, as well it should be. Its job is to resist democracy, and it does it very well. Therefore, any attempt to defeat the sclerotic cathedral state by a restoration of representative democracy in the classic sense of the word, in which public policy is actually formulated by elected officials, such as the leader, Mencius, is a bayonet charge at the Maginot Line. The Mencius party could go all the way and elect President Mencius and it would still be shredded into gobbets of meat by pre-sighted bureaucratic machine guns. In short, a total waste of time. Much better to bend over and pretend to enjoy it. When we think of a democu instead of a democratic party, all of these problems disappear. They are replaced by other problems, but we'll deal with those in their turn. Supporters of a democu propose a program of action, not a policy vision or a personality. The demonstrators who chanted Wir sind das Volk were not seeking election to the East German parliament. They were seeking the termination of state socialism. Everyone in the crowd had exactly the same goal. The movement was coherent, a laser, not a flashlight. Racist corporate fascism is a flashlight. Elect President Mencius is a flashlight. Even secure, responsible, and effective government is something of a flashlight, although the beam starts to be reasonably tight. Compare, for example, to Sono Joy. Restore the Stuarts is a laser. It may not be the best possible laser, we'll look at others, but it is definitely a laser. One common democratic assumption is that a movement cannot succeed in wielding power without accumulating a proper majority of support. In fact, none of the movements involved in the fall of communism mobilized anywhere near a majority. The demonstrations did not have half the country in the streets. They were pure exercises of brutal democratic power, and they succeeded but they had nothing to do with elections or majorities. And of course, our Western version of socialism, largely because it has not entirely pulled the fangs of democratic politics, is much more responsive to public opinion than any communist state. Last year, the immigration restriction lobby numbers USA 
almost single-handedly deprived the inner party of the pleasure of importing what would have certainly been millions of loyal voters. How many people contacted Congress at their behest? I'd be amazed if it was a hundred thousand. When we look beyond elections and consider direct influence on government, we see the tremendous power of cohesion, commitment, and organization. It is pretty clear, for example, that a minority of Americans supported the American Revolution. But the patriots were far more motivated and energetic than the Tories. We may deplore the result, but it certainly can't hurt to look into the tactics. A curious example of reactionary cohesion has emerged recently in, of all places, my hometown of San Francisco. SF's awful local Pravda, the Chronicle, recently introduced a comment section. Unlike its more careful large competitors, the Cron A supports comments on every article and B allows commenters to vote each other both up and down. Note that this allows the casual reader to compare the respective political strength of two opposing currents of opinion, because up and down votes do not cancel each other. And the result in the progressive capital of the world? Threads like this one in which comments like this makes me embarrassed to live in San Francisco. This scenario is absolutely absurd. Why not just invite all escaped convicts, paroled sex offenders, child molesters, and drug dealers to SF and give them free housing and free food? Simply ridiculous. LOL, hello, innocent or not, deport all illegal immigrants. As long as it's illegal, it's not innocent. Fair is fair. Our government is insane on this issue. Far-left liberalism is not a political philosophy. It is a form of mental illness. Okay, expletive deleted, that does it, that's it. I've never had even a traffic ticket in this mid-lifetime of mine, but that's it. Give me a six-shooter, some ammo, some places to rob and pilfer. Who's going to join me in one long party of criminal behavior? Look, face it, we're suckers, suckers. There's no incentive in God's earth to obey the law anymore. Why? I've been doing it wrong all this time. There's no sanction for crime anymore. I could use $5,000 for a vacation. I'm just going to borrow it by force. Why obey laws anymore can be elected by scores of, respectively, 426 to 4, 371 to 17, 346 to 55, and 484 to 15. The best one of these threads ever, though, was one I saw about the homeless. There was one page in which about a third of the comments were deleted by SF Gate, and the remaining two-thirds were peppered with ones like, and I remember this specifically, I'm not making it up, I used to really care about the homeless, but these days I could care less. As far as I'm concerned, we might as well roll them up in carpets and throw them in the bay. To wild virtual applause, of course. Congratulations, San Francisco. The city of Herb Kahn, the Hungry Eye, and the Barbary Coast has delivered a new treat, the Burger Braukeller at SF Gate. Even more interestingly, after the Honduran crack dealer articles and these reactions appeared, the latest thread, which promises to be glorious, is here, our notoriously spineless mayor, or rather his producers, chose to pseudo-reverse his earlier pseudo-non-decision. Where did he get his pox vopuli from? Where do you think? The Chronicle has spawned a monster. This humble corporate BBS, intended as anything but a weapon for reactionary information warfare, is on the way to becoming a real thorn in the side of its Pravda masters. Indeed, the tone of all minor newspapers in America is increasingly reminiscent of Soviet life. The cheery self-adulation, the sock-sucking worship of venal petty bureaucrats, and everywhere the icy plastic chill of Occam's butter knife. On many occasions, I had the opportunity to discuss the service industries with Western colleagues. They invariably noted differences with the services that are available in the USSR and what they are accustomed to at home. They told me that compared to Western standards, this sector is poorly developed in the USSR, but they didn't hesitate to add how fabulously inexpensive most of our services are. For instance, the cost of laundering a man's shirt is about 10 kopecks, 20 cents. However, this second point is not widely known. People are now buying more. A separate apartment for every family, a rarity in the mid-50s, has now become the rule. Today, 8 out of 10 urban families live in their own apartments and many more refrigerators, TV sets, vacuum cleaners, and shoes are being produced in the country. The demand for laundries, dry cleaners, repair shops, and car care centers has risen accordingly. To speed up progress in all areas of the service industries and to more efficiently employ the advantages of a planned economy, the USSR State Planning Committee, GOSPLAN, 
has developed a comprehensive program for the expansion of consumer goods production and the sphere of everyday services for the period 1986 to 2000. From 1986 to 1990, the number of telephones will increase by from 1.6 to 1.7 times as compared to the current five-year period and five times by the year 2000. By then, it is projected that all residents of small towns will have their own telephones installed in their homes, etc., etc., etc. No wonder the most successful new newspaper in America can make a steady living by parodying our version of this material. The form is deathless. It speaks from beyond the grave of socialism. We're not filling the shafts on those salt mines for nothing. Imagine if the actual Pravda, in 1986, had set up some little comment board, using paper and cork, probably. The threads would have filled up with exactly the same flavor of reckless, petty dissidents. This little board has become what might be called a focus of political energy. A couple of crucial points about the SF Gate Sturmabteilung, who might also be described as the Ku Klux Kron, or more historically as the Third Vigilance Committee, I can just picture a hip 3VC logo. One, the denizens of these boards are a tiny minority of San Francisco voters. A thousand votes is not a hill of beans in a city of 750,000. Many of them probably live in the suburbs, not SF proper. The idea that they are representative of SF public opinion proper is ludicrous. Two, these lopsided percentages are not even representative of the opinions of Chronicle readers. There are certainly plenty of articles on which progressive commenters and comment upvoters congregate, though the ratios are never this glaring. I suspect that there is a small hooligan community which skims SF Gate for a certain type of article and flocks as naturally as any specialized moth to its rare orchid in the dankest, fleshiest navels of the urban underbelly. It is simply obvious that these are not good and healthy people. Why should their opinions count? They count because the power of a democratic signal is proportional to five variables. The size of the antenna, the material of the antenna, the coherence of the message, the broadcast wattage, and the clarity of reception. In other words, the number of people who agree, the social status of those people, the extent to which they actually agree on any one thing, how much they actually care, and the extent to which the decision-maker, the signal's recipient, can trust the poll. If you have 10% of the American population who answers yes to a cold-call telemarketer pitching some stupid survey which asks a dumb question whose answer no one knows anything about, like, should the U.S. bomb Iran? You have a pathetically weak signal. People of average social status are being asked an obvious question that they can be expected to have a casual opinion on, and no more. They have about two neurons devoted to Iran policy. One of these cells may know where Iran is, and the other may know that they wear turbans there. No one will be tempted to bomb Iran, or even consider it, on the strength of this signal. If you have 10% of the American population, each one a homeowner whose identity has been validated and whose preferences are regularly refreshed in the database, who are on record in favor of abolishing Washington and restoring the Stuarts, and have agreed to vote as a block toward this objective, you have a very different phenomenon. Is this enough to abolish Washington, etc.? Probably not, but it might be enough to get a Stuart prince in the cabinet. While it is not clear that this would be of any value, the principle should be clear. I suspect the SF gate signal is getting through because it is extremely clear. The people expressing their opinions are extremely vehement, and it is clear that no one is vehement enough in opposition to them to descend into the muck of the dank orchid articles and vote the Nazi comments down. So the hooked cross rises again in the cradle of the United Nations. How ironic. Of course, in reality, I'm sure the commenters are all good people, and I regret being tempted to refer to them as the Ku Klux Kron. In fact, they're constantly saying things like, I'm not a Republican, but conquest's law is always at work. In any case, back to the program. We have already described X, chapter 10, but our program is incomplete. We have the formula for a responsible and effective government, a financial structure designed to maximize tax receipts by maximizing property values. We have a program for converting Plaingoff into Plaingoff, deliver the former bag and baggage to a bankruptcy administrator or receiver who restructures the operation and converts its many financial obligations to well-structured securities. We have even suggested some restructuring options, 
although these matters cannot, of course, be predecided, as the receiver's sovereignty is undivided. We do not know whom this receiver guy or gal is, other than Steve Jobs. Let's say it's a gal. If Steve wants the job, I'm afraid he'll have to have himself cut. We do not know who selects the receiver and or reviews her performance. In other words, we have the second half of Program X, but not the first. Frankly, I presented it this way in order to make it sound as shocking and unappealing as possible. Dear open-minded progressive, you have already read through the dramatic climax. Your mind is as open as an oyster on the half shell. You have seriously considered the idea that your country might be a better place if democracy is terminated, the constitution is cancelled, and the government is handed over to an absolute dictator whose first act is to impose martial law and whose long-term plan is to convert your country into a for-profit corporation. Now we can try to translate these shocking suggestions into a more palatable form. First, it is a mistake to focus on the receiver. She is not a dictator in the classic sense. A dictator or even an absolute monarch has both power and authority. His person is the source of all decisions. His decisions are final. His position is not subject to any external review. The receiver, or her long-term replacement, the director, you might say I subscribe to the auteur theory of management. The receiver's job is to convert Plaingov into Plaincorp. The director is the chief executive of Plaincorp going forward, is in a different position. Her decisions are final, so she has absolute authority. But she is an employee, so she has no power. She is just there to do a job. And if she is doing it badly, she will be removed. In the long term, power in Plaincorp belongs to the proprietors, the shareholders, the owners of Plaincorp's equity instruments. But as we discussed in Chapter 12, the right people to hold initial equity in Plaincorp, probably for the most part holders of Plaincorp's old paper currency and equivalent obligations, may not be the best people to manage Plaincorp, especially during the critical transition period. Rather, any plan in which Plaingoff relinquishes its sovereign power must involve a transfer of that power to an agency which is intrinsically trustworthy. Let's call this the trust. The receiver is an employee of the trust, which selects her, reviews her performance regularly, and replaces her if there is any doubt as to her excellence. Sovereignty is an attribute of the trust, not of the receiver. Once Plain Corp is on its feet and running, it will provide a test of the proposition that good government equals sound stewardship of sovereign capital. However, the trust must start off by assuming this proposition, that is, its mission is to provide good government, on the assumption that good government maximizes the value of plain land to plain corp. If this assumption appears mistaken, the trust should not complete the transition to neocameralism. Rather, it should find something else to do and do it instead. All responsibility is in its hands. Of course, a degenerate form of the trust receiver design is the old royalist model. The trust is the royal family. There may even be just one trustee, the receiver herself. This is the result we'd obtain by restoring the Stuarts through the House of Liechtenstein. It succeeds if it succeeds by putting all the eggs in one very sound basket. The princes of Liechtenstein are experienced rulers and blatantly responsible. The royalist design is tried and tested, if hardly perfect, and the option can be described without too much genealogical contortion as a restoration of legal authority in any country which traces its sovereignty to the British Empire. Still, the saleability of the proposition has to be considered. Most people living today have been heavily catechized in the virtues of democracy, the magical wisdom of crowds, and the evils of personal government. There is no getting around it. We have to change their minds on the first point. Rearing a fresh crop of Jacobites, however, may exceed even the Internet's vast, untapped potential as an information warfare medium. So there is a more palatable design for the trust, a good old-fashioned parliament, updated, of course, for the 21st century. This is not democracy, however. Its members each have one vote, but they are not chosen by any sort of election. Voters raised in the democratic tradition will only be willing to trust sovereignty in the hands of a collective governing body which operates internally on the basis of one man, one vote. Internally, the trust is an extremely simple and elegant democracy of trustees. Presumably following the classic corporate governance model, the trustees elect a board who select the receiver and review her performance. Just as the board can fire the receiver at any time, the trustees can fire the board. 
all true power is held by the trustees. Ideally, there are at least thousands, preferably tens or even hundreds of thousands of trustees. In a pinch, sovereignty can be handed to the trust simply by running Plaingoff's present-day electoral system but restricting suffrage to trustees, an ugly but functional transition plan. The only question is, who are these people? Or more precisely, who should they be? Think about it, dear open-minded progressive. Presumably, you believe in democracy. Presumably, your belief is not motivated by the opinion that the average voter has any particular insight into or understanding of the difficult problem of government. Therefore, you believe that there is some sort of amplification effect which somehow transforms the averageness of hominids into the famed wisdom of crowds. Actually, as Tocqueville noted, at least when it comes to government by crowd, we are generally looking at an information cascade at best and a particularly wicked feedback loop at worst. But never mind. However, whether or not you believe in the wisdom of crowds, you surely believe that any wisdom they may express is derived from the wisdom of their component individuals. There is certainly no hundredth monkey effect in which simply collecting a large number of bipeds and collating their multiple choice tests can somehow draw truth out of the vasty deep. Therefore, you will always be able to improve the quality of representatives generated by any democratic system by improving the quality of the voters. This is the point of the trust, to dramatically improve the quality of government by replacing universal suffrage with highly qualified suffrage. Our trustees should be just that, extremely trustworthy. Okay, this is good. Let's say our goal is to select the 100,000 most trustworthy and responsible adults in Plainland. They will serve as the trustees who oversee the complicated and dangerous transition from Plain Golf to Plain Corp. By definition, each of these individuals is in the 99.95th percentile of trustworthiness and responsibility. I'm certainly not in this group. Is it not obvious that these people would select competent management? I think it's obvious. But the plan is unworkable, so there is no reason to debate it. By what process will we select these individuals? Who shall recruit the recruiters? It is difficult and expensive to find just one individual with these executive qualifications. Moreover, in a sovereign context, the filtering process itself will serve as a political football. Many progressives might decide, for example, that only progressives can be trusted. It is impossible to end a fight by starting a new fight. This insane recruiting process cannot occur either under Plaingov or under Plaingov. It cannot occur under Plaingov because it will be subject to Plaingov politics and will carry those politics, which are uniformly poisonous, forward into Plaingov. At this point, the reset is not a reset, but it cannot occur under plain corp because the trustees are needed to select the receiver and there can be no intervening period of anarchy. But there is a hack which can work around this obstacle. You might think it's a cute hack or you might think it's an ugly hack. It probably depends on your taste. I think it's pretty cute. The hack is a precise heuristic test to select trustees. The result of the test is one bit for every citizen of Plainland. He or she either is or is not a trustee. The test is precise because its result is not a matter of debate. It can be verified trivially. And it is heuristic because it should produce a good result on average, with only occasional horrifying exceptions. My favorite PhT defines the trustees as the set of all active, certified, non-student pilots who accept the responsibility of trusteeship as of the termination date of plane golf. The set does not expand. You cannot become a trustee by taking flying lessons and any rejection or resignation of the responsibility is irreversible. In other words, to paraphrase Lenin, all power to the pilots. There are about 500,000 of them. Let's look at the advantages of this PhT. I am not myself a pilot. I am neither wealthy enough nor responsible enough. But everyone I've ever met who was a pilot, whether private, military, or commercial, has struck me as not only responsible, but also independent-minded, often even adventurous. This is a particularly rare combination. To be precise, it is an aristocratic combination, and the word aristocracy is, after all, just Greek for good government. Pilots are a fraternity of intelligent, practical, and careful people who are already trusted on a regular basis with the lives of others. What's not to like? If we care to broaden this set, we can extend it by adding all practicing medical doctors or all active and retired police and military officers, or better yet, both. Believe it or not, doctors were once one of America's most reactionary professions in the forefront of the struggle against FDR. They also made house calls. Now they are a bunch of communist bureaucrats, 
But the boys in blue can keep them in line. Our fighting men know what to do with a communist if they have a free hand. More to the point, each of these professions is a technically demanding task in which the professional is trusted with the lives of others. So we have a nice, clear, laser-like program. Washington has failed. The Constitution has failed. Democracy has failed. It is time for restoration, for national salvation, for a full reboot. We need a new government, a clean slate, a fresh hand which is smart, strong, and fair. All power to the pilots. Chapter 14, Rules for Reactionaries. Dear open-minded progressive, I hope you've enjoyed this weird excursion. We all like to think we have open minds, but only a few of us are tough enough to snort any strange powder that's shoved under our noses. You have joined that elite crew. Thirteen chapters ago, you may have been a mere space cadet. Now you are at least a space lieutenant, perhaps even a captain or a major. And what fresh galaxies remain to explore? But first, the solution. Well, first, the problem. This is a blog, after all. We can't really expect everyone to have read all the back issues. Repetition is a necessity and a virtue as well. A true space lieutenant, surprised by the slime beast of Vega, has his acid blaster on full auto and is pumping a massive drug bolus into its sticky green hide before he even knows what's happening. His reaction is not thought, but drill, the apotheosis of practice. Our problem is democracy. Democracy is a dangerous, malignant form of government which tends to degenerate, sometimes slowly and sometimes with shocking, gut-wrenching speed, into tyranny and chaos. You've been taught to worship democracy. This is because you are ruled by democracy. If you were ruled by the slime beast of Vega, you would worship the slime beast of Vega. A more earthly comparison is communism or people's democracy, whose claim to be a more advanced form of its Western cousin was perfectly accurate, if we mean advanced in the sense of, say, advanced leukemia. There are two problems with democracy, the first order and the second order. The first order problem, since a governed territory is capital, that is a valuable asset, it generates revenue. Participation in government is also the definition of power, which all men and quite a few women crave. At its best, democracy is a permanent gunless civil war for this gigantic pot of money and power. At its worst, the guns come out. Any democratic faction has an incentive to mismanage the whole to enlarge its share. Without quite understanding this problem, Noah Webster, in his 1794 pamphlet on the French Revolution, described its symptoms perfectly. Webster was writing during the quasi-monarchist Federalist Restoration when Americans had convinced themselves that it was possible to create a republic without political parties. The Federalists held faction to be the root of all democratic evils, much as their progressive successors are constantly yearning for a post-partisan democracy. Both are right, but complaining that democracy is too political is like complaining that the slime beast of Vega is too slimy. Webster wrote, as the tendency of such associations is probably not fully understood by most of the persons composing them in this country, and many of them are doubtless well-meaning citizens. It may be useful to trace the progress of party spirit to faction first, and then, of course, to tyranny. My second remark is that contention between parties is usually violent in proportion to the trifling nature of the point in question, or to the uncertainty of its tendency to promote public happiness. When an object of great magnitude is in question, and its utility obvious, a great majority is usually found in its favor, and vice versa, and a large majority usually quiets all opposition. But when a point is of less magnitude or less visible utility, the parties may be and often are nearly equal. Then it becomes a trial of strength. Each party acquires confidence from the very circumstance of equality. Both become assured they are right. Confidence inspires boldness and expectation of success. Pride comes in aid of argument. The passions are inflamed. The merits of the cause become a subordinate consideration. Victory is the object and not public good. At length, the question is decided by a small majority. Success inspires one party with pride, and they assume the airs of conquerors. Disappointment sours the minds of the other, and thus the contest ends in creating violent passions which are always ready to enlist into every other cause. Such is the progress of party spirit, and a single question will often give rise to a party that will continue for generations, and the same men or their adherents will continue to divide on other questions that have not the remotest connection with the first point of contention. 
This observation gives rise to my third remark, that nothing is more dangerous to the cause of truth and liberty than a party spirit. When men are once united in whatever form or upon whatever occasion, the union creates a partiality or friendship for each member of the party or society. A coalition for any purpose creates an attachment and inspires a confidence in the individuals of the party which does not die with the cause which united them, but continues and extends to every other object of social intercourse. Thus, we see men first united in some system of religious faith generally agree in their political opinions. Natives of the same country, even in a foreign country, unite and form a separate private society. The Masons feel attached to each other, though in distant parts of the world. The same may be said of Episcopalians, Quakers, Presbyterians, Roman Catholics, Federalists and Anti-Federalists, Mechanic Societies, Chambers of Commerce, Jacobin and Democratic Societies. It is altogether immaterial what circumstance first unites a number of men into a society, whether they first rally round the church, a square and compass, a cross or a cap. The general effect is always the same. While the union continues, the members of the association feel a particular confidence in each other, which leads them to believe each other's opinions, to catch each other's passions, and to act in concert on every question in which they are interested. Hence arises what is called bigotry or illiberality. Persons who are united on any occasion are more apt to believe the prevailing opinions of their society than the prevailing opinions of another society. They examine their own creeds more fully and perhaps with a mind predisposed to believe them, than they do the creeds of other societies. Hence the full persuasion in every society that theirs is right. And if I am right, others, of course, are wrong. Perhaps, therefore, I am warranted in saying there is a species of bigotry in every society on earth, and indeed in every man's own particular faith. While each man and each society is freely indulged in his own opinion, and that opinion is mere speculation, there is peace, harmony, and good understanding. But the moment a man or a society attempts to oppose the prevailing opinions of another man or society, even his arguments rouse passion, it being difficult for two men of opposite creeds to dispute for any time without becoming angry. And when one party attempts in practice to interfere with the opinions of another party, violence most generally succeeds. Note that Webster, A, assumes that the problem of factions is solvable, B, assumes that voters start with a generally accurate understanding of the problem of government, which will generate the right answer on all important questions. C. Assumes that voters will not form coalitions for the mere sordid purpose of looting the state, that is, achieving social justice. And D. Of course, demonstrates the correct or dictionary definition of the word bigotry. All these assumptions, which in 1794 were at least plausible, are now anything but and our modern bigots are as diverse as can be. Yet the juggernaut of democracy rolls on. New excuses are needed, new excuses are found. This leads us to the second order problem. While democracy may start with a population of voters who understand the art of government, as America indeed did, the extent to which 18th century Americans understood the basic principles of practical government, while hardly perfect, was mind-boggling by today's standards. It seldom stays that way. Its fans believe that participation in the democratic process actually improves the mental qualities of the citizen. I suppose this is true for certain values of the words improves. The real problem with democracies is that, in the long run, a democratic government elects its own people. I refer here to Brecht's verse. After the uprising of the 17th June, the secretary of the Writers' Union had leaflets distributed in the Stalin alley stating that the people had forfeited the confidence of the government and could win it back only by redoubled efforts. Would it not be easier in that case for the government to dissolve the people and elect another? One way to elect a new people is to import them, of course. For example, to put it bluntly, the Democratic Party has captured California, once a Republican stronghold, by importing arbitrary numbers of Mexicans. Indeed, the third world is stocked with literally billions of potential Democrats just waiting to come to America so that Washington can buy their votes. Inner party functionaries cackle gleefully over this achievement. For all this, 2008 primary season's obsession with the single and declining demographic of white working class men in Rust Belt states, America is changing rapidly across all racial, generational, and ethnic lines. 
The Census Bureau announced last week that half the country's population growth since 2000 is due to Hispanics, another group in addition to blacks, understandably alienated from the GOP. Anyone who does the math knows that America is on track to become a white minority nation in three to four decades. Yet if there's any coherent message to be gleaned from the hypocrisy whipped up by Hurricane Jeremiah, it's that this nation's perennially promised candid conversation on race has yet to begin. BTW, isn't that photo of Frank Rich amazing? Doesn't it just radiate pure power and contempt? Henry VIII would probably have asked the painter to make him look less like Xerxes, king of kings. But this act of brutal Machiavellian thug politics larded as usual with the most gushing of sentimental platitudes, is picayune next to the ordinary practice of democratic governments, to elect a new people by re-educating the children of the old. In the long run, power in a democracy belongs to its information organs, the press, the schools, and most of all the universities who mint the thoughts the others disperse. For simplicity, we have dubbed this complex the cathedral. The cathedral is a feedback loop. It has no center, no master planners. Everyone, even the Sulzbergers, is replaceable. In a democracy, mass opinion creates power. Power diverts funds to the manufacturers of opinion who manufacture more, etc. Not a terribly complicated cycle. This feedback loop generates a playing field on which the most competitive ideas are not those which best correspond to reality, but those which produce the strongest feedback. The cathedral is constantly electing a new people who A, support the cathedral more and more, and B, support a political system which makes the cathedral stronger and stronger. For example, libertarian policies are not competitive in the cathedral because libertarianism minimizes employment for public policy experts. Thus, we would expect libertarians to come in two flavors, the intellectually marginalized and the intellectually compromised. Many of the Ludwig von Mises Institute types feel quite free to be skeptical of democracy but they are skipping quite a few steps between problem and solution. They are still thinking in the democratic tense. Their plan for achieving libertarianism, if it can be described as a plan, is to convince as many people as possible that libertarian policies are good ones. These will then elect libertarian politicians, etc., etc. When you say, I am a libertarian, what you mean is, I, as a customer of government, prefer to live in a state which does not apply non-libertarian policies. The best results in this line will be achieved by capturing a state yourself and becoming its supreme ruler. Then no bureaucrats will bother you. Given that most of us are not capable of this feat, and given that the absence of government is a military impossibility, the libertarian should search for a structure of government in which the state has no incentive to apply non-libertarian policies. Obviously, democracy is not such a structure. Thus, a libertarian democracy is simply an engineering contradiction like a flying whale or a water-powered car. Water is a lot cheaper than gas, and I think a flying whale would make a wonderful pet. I could tether it to my deck, perhaps. Does it matter? Defeating democracy is difficult. Making democracy libertarian is impossible. The difference is subtle, but... Worse, the most competitive ideas in the democratic feedback loop tend to be policies which are, in fact, counterproductive. That is, they actually cause the problem they pretend to be curing. They are quack medicines. They keep the patient coming back. For example, Britain today is suffering from an epidemic of knife crime. To wit, every day in Great Britain, 60 people are stabbed or mugged with a knife. Admire for a moment the passive voice. Presumably the knives are floating disembodied in the air, directing themselves with Jedi powers. The solution... On Tuesday, Jackie Smith, the Home Secretary, will publish her Youth Crime Action Plan. It includes a proposal to make young offenders visit casualty wards to examine knife wounds in an attempt to shock them into mending their ways. I swear I am not making this up. Meanwhile, experts agree prison terms should be abolished for minor crimes, such as burglary. The Independent Sentencing Advisory Panel also said that there should be a presumption that thieves burglars and anyone convicted of dishonesty should not receive a jail term. I'm sure that'll help. Scientists around the world conclude it takes a multi-level approach to prevention. If you want to approach violence protection with juveniles, you need to engage in prevention early on, with social skills and anger coping lessons in schools from a young age. The real experts, of course, are the youths themselves. However, the government should be praised for not taking an automatically authoritarian approach. 
Their policy of getting young people to talk to stabbing victims rests on the belief that kids respond to education and are capable of empathy, something that the conservative policy of locking anyone up caught carrying a knife doesn't seem to appreciate, to say the least. It wouldn't be the first time the narrow-minded have defied scientific research, but researchers at Manchester University's School of Law found evidence which directly contradicts core assumptions of government policy. Having spoken to and won the trust of more than 100 gang members, associates, and informers, they concluded that in general, gangs are not tightly organized. They do not specialize in dealing drugs, and their violence is not provoked primarily by turf wars. They also found no basis for the popular belief that most street gangs are black. Robert Ralphs, the project's lead field worker, said, Police and other statutory agencies respond to gangs as clearly identifiable groups of criminally involved young people where membership is undisputed. In reality, gangs are loose, messy, changing friendship networks, less organized and less criminally active than widely believed, with unclear, shifting, and unstable leadership. By failing to understand this basic structure, the researchers say, Police mistakenly target and sometimes harass individuals who, though gang members, are not breaking any law. The police also repeatedly follow, stop, and search the gang members' family, friends, and classmates. This alienated both the gang members and their associates who might otherwise have helped police. Judith Aldridge, who led the research, said, They are mainly victims. So there is a desperate need to appropriately assess the needs of these young people and their families and not blame them, etc. I'm sure none of this is new to you. Britain makes such a wonderful example, however, because its descent into Quaker thug hell is so fresh and proceeded from such a height. Witness, for example, this lovely story from the Times archive, which is barely 50 years old, in the lives of those now living, unless, of course, they have since been stabbed, judge on race gang warfare, seven-year sentences. Two men were each sentenced at Central Criminal Court yesterday to seven years' imprisonment for their part in an attack on John Frederick Carter, fruit trader of Sydney Square, Glengall Road, Peckham, who received injuries to his face and head which required 60 stitches. They were Raymond David Rosa, aged 31, bookmaker's clerk of Northborough Road, Norbury SW, and Richard Frett, aged 34, dealer of Wickstead House, Falmouth Road, S.E., the jury had found them both guilty of wounding Carter with intent to cause him grievous bodily harm. Passing sentence, Mr. Justice Donovan said, I have not the least doubt that there are other and very wicked persons behind you, but the tools of those persons must realize that if discovery follows, punishment will be condign. More like Chicago. Summing up yesterday, his lordship said that the facts of this case sounded more like Chicago and the worst days of prohibition than London in 1956. Putting two and two together, the jury might think this was another case of race-gang warfare. If that was so, then it raised the question of whether the reluctance of Mr. and Mrs. Carter to swear that the two men they had previously picked out were concerned in the attack was due to fear. It was that possibility which put this case into quite a different category. It put it into a category where gross violence had been perpetrated upon a man but after identifying his assailants, he and his wife had expressed doubts in the witness box. The jury were not concerned with the merits or demerits of Carter. The issue was much wider than Carter's skin. It was simply one of the maintenance of law and order without which none could go about with safety, etc., etc. Notice that both of these miscreants are in possession of at least nominal occupations. Mr. Justice Donovan, honey, with all due respect, you don't know nothing about no race-gang warfare. And finally, completing our tour of the British criminal justice system, we learn that two South Africans who overstayed their British visas were jailed for life on Friday for the murders of two men strangled during a series of violent muggings. Gabriel Beng, 27, and Jabu Mbawani, 26, will be deported after serving life sentences. No, that's not a misprint. A life sentence normally lasts around 15 years. Orwell could not be more satisfied. A life sentence normally lasts around 15 years. With not a hint of irony in the building, something is normal here, and it is either 1956 or 2008. It can't be both. If Mr. Justice Donovan or the Times reporter who considered a mere 60 stitches somehow newsworthy were to reappear in modern London, their perspective on the art of government in a democratic society unchanged, they would be far to the right not only of Professor Aldridge, 
but also of the Tories, the BNP, and perhaps even Spearhead, they would not be normal people. But in 1956, their reactions were completely unremarkable. What's happened is that Britain, which before World War II was still in many respects an aristocracy, became Americanized and democratized after the war. As a democracy, it elected its own people, who now tolerate what their grandparents would have found unimaginable. Of course, many British voters, probably even most, still do believe that burglars should go to prison, etc., etc. But these views are on the way out, and the politics of love is on the way in. Politicians who are uniformly devoid of character or personality have the good sense to side with the future electorate rather than with the past electorate. And why are the studies of Professor Aldridge and her ilk so successful, despite their obvious effects? One, they result in a tremendous level of crime, which generates a tremendous level of funding for criminologists. Two, they are counterintuitive, that is, obviously wrong. No one would pay a social scientist to admit the obvious. Three, as per Noah Webster, they appeal to the ruling class simply because they are so abhorrent to the ruled class. And four, they are not disprovable, because if pure, undiluted Quaker love ever becomes the only way for British civilization to deal with its ferals, they won't leave much of Professor Aldridge. She might, like Judith Todd, regard her suffering as a Christ-like badge of distinction. She would certainly, like Miss Todd, express no guilt over her actions. But it won't happen because Britain will retain the unprincipled exceptions and the few rough men it needs to keep it from the abyss for the indefinite future. And for that same future, Professor Aldridge and her like will be able to explain the debacle in terms of the cycle of violence. As Chesterton put it, we have actually contrived to invent a new kind of hypocrite. The old hypocrite, Tartuffe or Pecksniff, was a man whose aims were really worldly and practical, while he pretended that they were religious. The new hypocrite is one whose aims are really religious, while he pretends that they are worldly and practical. From the perspective of the customer of government, however, it is irrelevant why these events happen. What matters is that they do happen, and that they do not have to happen. If statistics did not confirm that stabbings in London were not, in the lives of those now living, a routine event, the Times article should be sufficient. In fact, I'll take one good primary source over all the statistics in the world. And this, in my reactionary judgment, makes New Labour responsible for these events, as surely as if Gordon Brown and Professor Aldridge themselves had gone on a stabbing spree. Consider the following fact. In April 2007, an American Special Forces captain, Robert Williams, forced his way into the home of a young Iraqi journalist whom he raped, tortured, and attempted to murder. Williams ordered the woman to stab out her own eyes. When she tried and failed, he sliced up her face with a butcher knife. After asking her if she liked Americans, he forced her to swallow handfuls of pills, which destroyed her liver. And when leaving the building after an 18-hour ordeal, he tied her to a sofa and set a fire under it. She escaped only by using the fire to burn away the ropes around her hands. And why haven't you heard of this event? Obviously, you don't read the papers. Williams, it turns out, was linked to a fundamentalist Christian cell inside the U.S. military, one of whose leaders, General William Boykin, was a mentor to none other than John McCain. Okay, at this point, I am obviously just making stuff up. If this event had happened, you wouldn't need to read the papers or watch television. The only way you would not know of the event is if you were a hermit in the deep bush in Alaska and it was the middle of winter. It would be the defining event of the American occupation of Iraq. And as soon as the snow thawed and the caribou came back, a dog team would arrive at your cabin and bark out the news, unless the Pentagon covered it up. And given that this search produces almost two million hits, doesn't that seem a likely possibility? It did happen, however, not in Baghdad, but in Manhattan. The real Robert Williams is not a white supremacist, but a black one. The anonymous victim is a journalism student at Columbia. And how many stories in the local newspaper of record many of whose employees must be Facebook friends of the victim, did these events generate? I found six, all of them buried deep in the New York region section, whose crime reporters, I'm sure, are on the fast track to superstar status at the NYT, not. Note that this is exactly how the Pentagon, in our imaginary Baghdad rape, would have wanted the situation handled. 
A cover-up is always a possibility, but risky. It can leak, whereas if the journalists themselves agree that the event is not important, that it is fundamentally random, that it certainly does not deserve the crime of the century treatment that the Times of London in 1956 would have given the real Robert Williams. It is very unfortunate, of course, that a special forces officer abused a young Iraqi woman. But it is the exception, not the rule. It has nothing to do with the special forces as a whole, or with General Boykin, or certainly with John McCain. A few stories in the back of the paper, and the whole sad event is documented for the record. And our troops continue their honorable work in Iraq, saving babies from gangrene and bringing happiness to orphaned goats. Would I accept this whitewash? Probably not, but I would be more likely to accept it than the New York Times. Clearly, the real Robert Williams and his ilk have no enemies at the Times, but they have an enemy in Larry Oster, who wrote, So here's a question that ought to be asked of Obama at a presidential debate. Sen Obama, you said in your speech on race last March 18th that as long as whites have not ended racial inequality in America, Whites have to expect the sort of hatred and rage that comes from Jeremiah Wright, who identifies the source of evil in the world as white man's greed. In this country today, black-on-white violence is a fact of life, and in addition to the steady stream of black-on-white rapes and murders, there have been racially motivated black-on-white crimes of shocking brutality and horror, including not only rape and sodomy, but torture, disfigurement, burning. Cases in point are the Wichita Massacre in December 2000 in which five young white people were captured and tortured and four of them murdered. The torture murder of Channon Christian and Christopher Newsom in Knoxville in January 2007 and the torture and disfigurement of a young woman in New York City in April 2007. Senator, is it your position that until whites have ended racial inequality in America, whites have to expect to be targeted by white-hating black thugs? In fact, aren't such criminals only acting out in physical terms the same seething anti-white anger, hatred, and vengefulness which has been enacted verbally by the pastor and through whoops, yells, and cries from the congregation every week in your church for the last 30 years and which you have justified as an understandable and inevitable response to racial inequality? If Senator Obama has replied, I'm not aware of it. Perhaps he's not a VFR reader. The crucial point is that your democratic mind handles these two identical crimes, one real and one imaginary, in very different ways. In the imaginary crime, your reflex is to extend a chain of collective responsibility to all the ideologies, institutions, and individuals who remind you even remotely of the criminal or can be connected with him in some general way. Captain Williams was certainly not ordered to rape an Iraqi journalist. In the real crime, responsibility extends only to the perpetrator, and perhaps not even to him. After all, he had a difficult childhood. Dear open-minded progressive, this is how elegantly democracy has infected your brain. To the anonymous London reporter of 1956, the fact that this horrific crime could happen in Manhattan in 2008, and no one, not even the fellow Columbia-trained journalists a hundred blocks downtown, would find it especially important, would suggest some kind of anesthesia, some disconnection of the natural chimpanzee response of fear and rage. But this response has not been disabled in general, because we see it displayed in all its glory when an American soldier puts a pair of underpants on someone's head somewhere in Mesopotamia. Thus we are looking at selective anesthesia. By historical standards, our reaction to one offense is unusually sedated, and our reaction to the other is unusually inflamed. Of course, this does not exclude the possibility that in both cases, the old reaction was wrong and the new reaction was right. But it is difficult for me, perhaps only because I am insufficiently versed in progressive doxology, to construct an ethical explanation of the change. On the other hand, I find it very easy to construct a political explanation of the change. Here's another way to look at the same issue. Suppose, dear open-minded progressive, that the San Francisco Police Department embarked on a reign of lawless terror, killing a hundred people or so a year, at least half of whom were innocent, and beating, raping, etc., many more. Would the good progressives of San Francisco stand for it? I think not. Because we don't believe that the police should be above the law. We believe that when they commit crimes, they should be tried and sent to jail just like everyone else. 
So we believe that ethically a policeman's crimes are no different from a street thug's. Or do we? Not as far as I can tell. I think San Franciscans are much more likely to express fear and anger at the idea of a policeman committing lawless violence. Don't you find this slightly odd? Which would you rather be hit over the head by? A policeman or a mugger? I would rather not be hit over the head at all, thank you. If the SFPD were as high-handed and above the law as the paramilitary gangs it, in theory, opposes, you, dear open-minded progressive, would agree that the only solution is a higher power, the National Guard. They have bigger guns, after all. But if you prefer martial law to the SFPD's reign of terror, why don't you prefer martial law to MS-13's reign of terror? And this is exactly the problem. The reality is that almost every country in the world today and certainly every major American city could use a solid dose of martial law. Because all are beset by criminal paramilitary organizations which, A, are too powerful to be suppressed by the security forces under the legal system as it presently stands, B, if judged by the same standards as the security forces constitute a gigantic ongoing human rights violation, and C, if associated with the civilian and non-governmental organizations which protect them from the security forces, implicate the former as major human rights violators. So when a liberal surgeon in South Africa, whose trustworthiness strikes me as complete, writes, I recently watched the movie Capote. I enjoyed it. But being South African, I was interested in the reaction the movie portrayed of the American community to the murders that the movie is indirectly about. Their reaction was shock and dismay. Their reaction was right. But in South Africa, there is a similar incident every day. I don't read the newspaper because it depresses me too much. You might wonder why I, a surgeon, am posting on this. One reason may be because I often deal with the survivors, two previous posts found here and here. At the moment, I have three patients who are victims of violent crime. One is the victim of a farm attack, an old man who had his head caved in with a spade. Why? Just for fun, it seems. But maybe the reason I'm writing this post is because I'm South African. This is my country, and I'm Gatvo. Just three recent stories. Some guys broke into a house. They gagged the man. It seemed that whatever they shoved into his mouth was shoved in too deep, because as they lay on the bed violating his wife, he fought for breath and finally died of asphyxiation. Then there is a woman alone at home. Some thugs broke in and asked where the safe was. They were looking for guns. She told them she had no safe and no guns. They then took a poker heated it to red hot, and proceeded to torture her with it so that she would tell them what they wanted to hear. Because she could not, the torture went on for a number of hours. Then there is the story of a group of thugs that broke into a house. They shot the man and cut the fingers of the woman off with a pair of garden shears. While the man lay on the floor dying, the criminals took some time off to lounge on the bed, eating some snacks they had found in the fridge and watch a bit of television. There is crime everywhere, but the most brutal and the violent crimes without clear motives are almost exclusively black on white. This is one more thing the government denies and even labels you as racist if you say it. It may not be put too strongly to say it is very nearly government sanctioned. We start to smell a small, ugly smell of the future. After all, if all the people in the world could vote or if they all moved to America, the electorate would look a lot like the new South Africa, the rainbow nation the great hope for human oneness. Oops. Unfortunately, our surgeon's database is a little out of date. America is no longer shocked by in-cold-blood events. There are simply too many of them, but there are nowhere near as many as in South Africa. And even if I were not convinced by the surgeon's uncapitalized demeanor, other sources confirm the result. In fact, the simplest way to evaluate a government for human rights violations is to think of all violence as the responsibility of the state whether it is committed by men in uniforms or not. Otherwise, employing paramilitary criminals to do your dirty deeds for a measure of plausible deniability is far too easy, and quite popular these days. There is no sharp line between an army and a militia, between a militia and a gang, and between a gang and a bunch of criminals. As the laws of King Ian of Wessex famously put it, we use the term thieves if the number of men does not exceed seven, and brigands for a number between 7 and 35. Anything beyond this is an army. 
a short course in actual Saxon history such as that linked above cannot come too soon for many libertarians who throughout the history of English legal theory have been overfond of construing the medieval world as a paradise of ordered liberty. Indeed, we inherit many elegant constructs from medieval law, and one reason they are so elegant is that they had to operate in such a brutal environment of pervasive violence. There is no reason at all that a libertarian such as myself cannot favor martial law. I am free when my rights are defined and secured against all comers, regardless of official pretensions. Freedom implies law, law implies order, order implies peace, peace implies victory. As a libertarian, the greatest threat to my property is not Uncle Sam, but thieves and brigands. If Uncle Sam wakes up from his present sclerotic slumber and shows the brigands a strong hand, my liberty has been increased. You see what happens when you open your mind and snort the mystery powder. You wind up on YouTube listening to an effeminate deceased dictator scream, Tendre la mano mas dura que se imaginen. I don't think that one needs much translation. And how about this one? Frankly, I begin to think that the U.S. is about ready for an Il Duce right now. Except that when you follow the link, it's not at all what you think. At least it has nothing to do with the Pinochet youth. The original post was actually on a site for insider political gossip in New York State, which was linked from the NYT. And the author strikes me as Rara Avis, a completely honest and dedicated career public servant, certainly an Obama voter, and certainly not a follower of Mussolini or any similar figure. And yet the quote is not out of context at all. Read the essay. If I'm worth your time, Littlefield is too. Letting go of one's illusions is a difficult process that takes a long, long time, but I am just about there. From a young age, I have been a believer in public services and benefits as a way of providing some measure of assurance for other people, people I rely on every time I purchase a good or service, of a decent life regardless of one's personal income or standing. After all, I initially chose public service as a career and I have been a defender of the public institutions when compared with those who were only concerned with their own situation and preference put in less or get out more, as if the community was a greedy adversary to be beaten in life rather than something one is a part of. Now, however, I see that it is probably hopeless. Admittedly, Albany is one of the worst Augean stables of bureaucracy in America. If Hercules had to clean it out, he wouldn't find the Hudson sufficient he'd have to find a way to get the St. Lawrence involved. But is Albany that different from Sacramento or from Washington itself? Of course not. Of course, neither Albany nor Washington needs a deuce. It needs a CEO. Like any gigantic, ancient, and broken institution, it has no problem that can't be fixed by installing new management with plenary authority. It might help to move the capital as well, put it in Kansas City or better yet San Francisco so that progressives can see the future up close. But the reality is this thing is done. It is over. It is not fixable by any form of conventional politics. Either you want to keep it or you want to throw it out. Any other political opinions you may have are irrelevant next to this choice. On that note, let's review our rules for reactionaries. Rule number one is the one we just stated. Reaction is a Boolean decision. Either you want to discard our present political system including democracy, the Constitution, the entire legal code and body of precedent, the UN, etc., etc., or you think it's safer to muddle along with what we have now. Either is a perfectly legitimate opinion which a perfectly reasonable person may hold. Of course, it is impossible to replace something with nothing. I've presented some designs for a restoration of secure, responsible, and effective government. What I like about these designs is that they're simple, clear, and easy to understand and they rely on straightforward engineering principles without any mystical element. In particular, they do not require anyone to be a saint. But here is another simple design. Military government. Hand plenary power to the Joint Chiefs. Let them go from there. This won't do permanently, but for a few years it'd be fine. That should be plenty of time to figure out what comes next. Here is yet another. Restrict voting to homeowners. Note that this was widely practiced in Anglo-American history and for very good reason. As John Jay put it, those who own the country ought to govern it. Mere freehold suffrage is a poor substitute for military government, and it too is not stable in the long run, but it would be opposed by all the same people, and it would constitute a very hard shake-up in exactly the right direction. Here is a third. 
dissolve Washington and return sovereignty to the states. Here is a fourth. Vest plenary executive authority in the Chief Justice, John Roberts. Here is a fifth. Vest plenary executive authority in the publisher of the New York Times, Pinch Salzberger. Here is a sixth. Vest plenary executive authority in the good one, Barack Obama. I'm not altogether fond of the jobs that the latter two are doing with the limited authority they have now, but they are at least prepared for power and real authority tends to create real responsibility in a hurry. At present, any of these things is such a long way from happening that the choice does not matter at all. What matters, dear open-minded reactionary, is that you have had enough of our present government, you are done, finished, Gatvol, and you want to replace it with something else that is secure, responsible, and effective. In other words, rule number one, the reactionary's opposition to the present regime is purely negative. Positive proposals for what to replace it with are out of scope, now and for the foreseeable future. Once again, think in terms of the fall of communism. The only thing that all those who lived under communism could agree on was that they were done with communism. The advantage of Rule 1 is that, applied correctly, it ensures a complete absence of internal conflict. There is nothing to argue over. Either you oppose the government or you support it. One exception to Rule 1 is that the same coherent pure negativity and resulting absence of bickering can be achieved by opposing components of the government. For example, I believe that both America and the rest of the planet would achieve enormous benefits by a total shutdown of international relations, including security guarantees, foreign aid, and mass immigration, and a return to the 19th century policy of neutrality, an approach easily summarized by the phrase, no foreign policy. I believe that government should take no notice whatsoever of race, no racial policy, I believe it should separate itself completely from the question of what its citizens should or should not think, separation of education and state. These are all purely negative proposals. They all imply lopping off an arm of the octopus and replacing it with nothing at all. If any of them or anything similar is practical and a full reset is not, then all the better. However, any practical outcome in this direction is at present so distant that it is hard to assess plausibility. Rule number two is that a restoration cannot succeed by either of the following methods. The Democrats defeating the Republicans or the Republicans defeating the Democrats. More precisely, it cannot involve imposing progressivism on traditionalists slash fundamentalists or traditionalism on progressives. Traditionalism and progressivism are the two major divisions of Christianity in our time. Not all traditionalists are Catholics, and many progressives are, but fundamentalism today occupies the basic political niche of Catholicism in the European tradition, and progressivism is clearly the Protestant mainstream, historically Unitarian, Congregationalist, Methodist, etc., doctrinally almost pure Quaker. If secure, responsible, effective government has to wait until this religious war is over, it will wait forever, or there will be a new Bartholomew's Day. Neither of these options is acceptable to me. Are they acceptable to you? Then you may not be a restorationist. Of course, each of these Christian sects is intimately connected, exactly as Noah Webster describes, with a political party and a set of politically constructed opinions about what government is and how it should be run. Since progressivism is politically dominant, one would expect it to have the most political content and the least religious content, and indeed this is so. And as we've seen, in a democracy, there is no reason to expect anyone's political opinions to have any relationship to the actual art of responsible, effective government. Nonetheless, it is entirely possible to be an apolitical progressive. Progressivism is a culture, not a party. Charity, for example, is a vast part of this culture, and no reasonable person can have anything against charity, as long as it remains a purely personal endeavor and does not develop aspects of political violence as it did in the late 20th century. Environmentalism is a part of this culture, and who doesn't live in the environment, etc., etc., etc. The fangs can be pulled without much harm to the snake. In fact, the snake has never really needed fangs, and will find itself much more comfortable without them. Rule number three, in case this is not a corollary of rule one, a reset implies a total breach with the Anglo-American political tradition. The fact that an institution is old and has carried the respect of large populations for decades or centuries is always a reason to honor and respect it. That you oppose Washington, the real organization that exists in the real world, does not mean that you oppose America. 
the abstract symbol. Nor does it mean you oppose America, the continent in the Northern Hemisphere, whose destruction would be quite the engineering feat. It does not mean that you want to burn or abolish the flag, etc., etc., etc. Similarly, the fact that I'm not a Catholic doesn't mean that if I met the Pope, I'd say, fuck you, Pope. As a matter of fact, I would probably want to kiss his ring, or whatever is the appropriate gesture. On the other hand, we have no reason to think that the political designs we have inherited from this tradition are useful in any way, shape, or form. All we know is that they were more militarily successful than their competitors, which may well have been flawed in arbitrary other ways. If the Axis had defeated the Allies, a feat which was quite plausible in hindsight, we would face a completely different set of re-engineering challenges, and it would be the Prussian tradition rather than the Whig that had to be discarded. Historical validation is a good thing. But history provides an extraordinary range of examples. And there is no strong reason to think the governments recent and domestic are any better than the governments ancient and foreign. The American Republic is over 200 years old. Great. The Serene Republic of Venice lasted 1100. If you're designing from the ground up, why start from the first rather than the second? A total breach does not imply that everything American or everything Portuguese, if you are trying to reboot Portugal, but not much in the government of modern Portugal is in any sense Portuguese, must be discarded. It means everything American needs to be justified, just as it would be if it was Venetian. If you believe in democracy, why? If you favor a bicameral legislature, a Supreme Court, a Department of Agriculture, why? Rule number four, the only possible weapon is the truth. I hope it's unnecessary to say, but it's worth saying anyway, that the only force which can terminate USG by military means is the military itself. There is no reason to talk about this possibility. If it happens, it will happen. It certainly won't happen any time soon. This means that democracy can only be terminated by political means, that is, democracy itself, which means convincing a large number of people. Of course, people can be convinced with lies as well as with the truth, but the former is naturally the specialty of the present authorities. Better not to confuse anyone. What is the truth, anyway? The truth is reality. The truth is what exists. The truth is what rings like a bell when you whack it with the back of a knife. It is very difficult to recognize the truth, but it is much easier to recognize it when it's right next to an equal and opposite lie. A certain device called the Internet is very good at providing this service. Here is an example. The wonderful kids at Google, who are all die-hard progressives and whom I'm sure would be horrified by the uses I'm making of their services, have done something that I can only compare to Lenin's old saying about the capitalists, that they would sell the rope that was used to hang them. Likewise, progressives seem determined to publish the books that will discredit them. As in the case of the capitalists, this is because they are good, not because they are evil. But unlike Lenin, we are good as well and we welcome these accidental, unforced errors. I refer, of course, not to any new books. It is very difficult to get reactionary writing published anywhere, even, in fact, especially because they are so sensitive on the subject by the conservative presses. However, as you, our readers, know, the majority of work published before 1922 is online at Google. It is often hard to read, missing for bizarre reasons that make no sense. Why scan a book from 1881 and then not put the scans online? Badly scanned, etc., etc. But it is there, and as we've seen, it is quite usable. And there are two things about the pre-1922 corpus. One, it is far, far to the right of the consensus reality that we now know and love. Just the fact that people in 1922 believed X, while today we believe Y, has to shake your faith in democracy. Was the world of 1922 massively deluded, or is it ours? It could be both, but it can't be neither. Indeed, even the progressives of the Belle Epoque often turn out to be far to the right of our conservatives. WTF? Two, you can use this corpus to conduct a very interesting exercise. You can triangulate. This is an essential skill in defensive historiography. If you like you are, you like defensive historiography. Historiographic triangulation is the art of taking two or more opposing positions from the past and using hindsight to decide who was right and who was wrong. The simplest way to play the game is to imagine that the opponents in the debate were reanimated in 2008 
informed of present conditions and reunited for a friendly panel discussion. I'm afraid often the only conceivable result is that one side simply surrenders to the other. For example, one fun exercise which you can perform safely for no cost in the privacy of your own home is to read the following early 20th century books on the Negro question. The Negro, the Southerner's Problem by Thomas Nelson Page, Racist, 1904. Following the Color Line by Ray Stannard Baker, Progressive, 1908. And Race Adjustment, Essays on the Negro in America by Kelly Miller, Negro, 1909. Each of these books is A, by a forgotten author, B, far more interesting and well-written than the pseudoscientific schlock that comes off the presses these days, and C, a picture of a vanished world. Imagine assembling Page, Baker, and Miller in a hotel room in 2008 with a video camera and little glasses of water in front of them. What would they agree on, disagree on? Dear open-minded progressive, if you fail to profit from this exercise, you simply have no interest in the past. However, an even more fun one is the now thoroughly forgotten Gladstone-Tennyson debate. I forget how I stumbled on this contretemps, which really does deserve to be among the most famous intellectual confrontations in history. Sadly, dear open-minded progressive, it appears to have been forgotten for a reason, and the reason is not a good one. You may know that Tennyson, in his romantic youth, 1835, wrote a poem called Loxley Hall. Due to its nature as 19th century dramatic verse, Loxley Hall is unreadable today, but its basic content can be described as romantic juvenile liberalism. Here is some of the pith, if pith there is. Men, my brothers, men the workers, ever reaping something new, that which they have done but earnest of the things that they shall do. For I dipped into the future, far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world, and all the wonder that would be, saw the heavens fill with commerce, argosies of magic sails, pilots of the purple twilight dropping down with costly bales, heard the heavens fill with shouting, and there reigned a ghastly dew from the nation's airy navies grappling in the central blue, far along the worldwide whisper of the south wind rushing warm, with the standards of the peoples plunging through the thunderstorm, till the war drum throbbed no longer, and the battle flags were furled, in the parliament of man, the federation of the world. There the common sense of most shall hold a fretful realm in awe, and the kindly earth shall slumber, lapped in universal law. I'm not sure whether this is supposed to remind us more of the UN, the British Empire, or Star Trek, perhaps all three, but you get the idea. The Parliament of Man couplet in particular is rather often quoted. Well, so Tennyson was a romantic young liberal when he wrote this, in 1835. In 1885, when he wrote, adding ten years for some dramatic reason, Loxley Hall, sixty years after, he was neither romantic nor young nor, um, liberal. While the sequel is also unreadable today, for more or less the same reasons, here are some couplets from it. I myself have often babbled doubtless of a foolish past. Babble, babble. Our old England may go down in babble at last. Truth for truth and good for good. The good, the true, the pure, the just. Take the charm forever from them and they crumble into dust. Gone the cry of forward, forward, lost within a growing gloom. Lost or only heard in silence from the silence of a tomb. Half the marvels of my morning triumphs over time and space, staled by frequence, shrunk by usage into commonest commonplace. Forward, rang the voices then, and of the many mine was one. Let us hush this cry of forward till ten thousand years have gone. France had shown a light to all men, preached a gospel, all men's good. Celtic demos rose a demon, shrieked and slaked the light with blood. I, if dynamite and revolver leave you courage to be wise, when was age so crammed with menace? Madness, written spoken lies, envy wears the mask of love, and laughing sober fact to scorn cries to weakest as to strongest. Ye are equals, equal born. Equal born? Oh yes, if yonder hill be level with the flat. Charm us, orator, till the lion look no larger than the cat. Till the cat through that mirage of overheated language loom larger than the lion. Demos end in working its own doom. Those three hundred millions under one imperial scepter now, shall we hold them? Shall we loose them? Take the suffrage of the plough? Nay, but these would feel and follow truth if only you and you, rivals of realm-ruining party, when you speak, were wholly true. Trustful, trustful, looking upward to the practiced hustings liar, so the higher wields the lower, while the lower is the higher. Step by step we gained a freedom known to Europe, 
known to all. Step by step we rose to greatness. Through tungsters we may fall. You that woo the voices, tell them old experience is a fool. Teach your flattered kings that only those who cannot read can rule. Tumble nature, heel o'er head, and yelling with the yelling street, set the feet above the brain and swear the brain is in the feet. Bring the old dark ages back without the faith, without the hope. Break the state, the church, the throne, and roll their ruins down the slope. Do your best to charm the worst, to lower the rising race of men. Have we risen from out the beast, then back into the beast again? Etc. Obviously, either someone has been reading Pobedonostsev, or great minds just happen to think alike. I don't think you have to be a Victorian liberal to see that this is highly seditious material. Inflammatory, even. Not bad for an old fart. Well, Gladstone, who was both a Victorian liberal and an old fart himself, reads this, and of course he shits a brick. The poem might as well have been a personal attack on Gladstone himself, especially that bit about Celtic demos, which is not a terribly well-concealed reference to Irish home rule. And what does he do? He's not just a statesman, but a real aristocrat. Does he challenge Tennyson to a duel? A bit late in the day for that. No, he takes time out from his busy duties as prime minister to write a response. Not in verse, since taking on Tennyson in trochaic couplets is like challenging Chuck Norris in Fight Club. But Gladstone was a master of prose. Listen to this wicked little intro. The nation will observe with warm satisfaction that although the new Loxley Hall is, as told by the calendar, a work of Lord Tennyson's old age, yet is his poetic eye not dim nor his natural force abated. Take note, kids. This is how you start out if you're really going to crucify someone. Gladstone continues by flattering the person for a few paragraphs. Then he flatters the poem for a page or so. Then he changes his angle slightly. Perhaps the tone may even at times be thought to have grown a little hoarse with his years. Not that we are to regard it as the voice of the author. Oh, no, not at all. Then page 319, Gladstone spends another page agreeing with Tennyson. Yes, the French Revolution was terrible, and the riots of Captain Swing, etc., etc. But it all worked out in the end, didn't it? What bliss was it to be young after the first reform bill, etc., etc. And then finally, page 320, Gladstone launches into full-on shark attack mode. During the intervening half-century or near it, the temper of hope and thankfulness, which both Mr. Tennyson and the young prophet of Loxley Hall so largely contributed to form, has been tested by experience. Authorities and people have been hard at work in dealing with the laws, the policy, and the manners of the country. Their performances may be said to form the play, intervening between the old prologue and the new epilogue, which has just issued from the press. This epilogue, powerful as it is, will not quite harmonize with the evergreens of Christmas. The young prophet, now grown old, is not indeed, though perhaps on his own showing he ought to be, in despair, for he still stoutly teaches manly duty and personal effort, and longs for progress more, he trows, than its professing and blatant votaries. But in his present survey of the age as his field, he seems to find that a sadder color has invested all the scene. The evil has eclipsed the good, and the scale, which before rested solidly on the ground, now kicks the beam. For the framing of our estimate, however, prose and very prosaic prose may be called in not less than poetry. The question demands an answer, whether it is needful to open so dark a prospect for the future whether it is just to pronounce what seems to be a very decided censure on the immediate past. What follows is a rather amazing document, a compact and thorough defense of Victorian liberalism and democracy and its prospects for the future. In the words of the Prince Consort, our institutions are on their trial as institutions of self-government. And if condemnation is to be pronounced, on the nation it must mainly fall and must sweep away with it a large part of such hopes as have been either fanatically or reflectively entertained that, by this provision of self-government, the future might effect some moderate improvement upon the past and mitigate in some perceptible degree the social sorrows and burdens of mankind. I will now, with a view to a fair trial of this question, try to render rudely and slightly though it be some account of the deeds and the movement of this last half-century I should not attempt to abuse Gladstone by excerpting him. But one morsel, especially considering the above, stands out as particularly choice. One reference to figures may, however, be permitted. It is that which exhibits the recent movement of crime in this country. 
For the sake of brevity, I use round numbers in stating it. Happily, the facts are too broad to be seriously mistaken. In 1870, the United Kingdom, with a population of about 31,700,000, had about 13,000 criminals, or one in 1,760. In 1884, with a population of 36 million, it had 14,000 criminals, or one in 2,500. And as there are some among us who conceive Ireland to be a sort of pandemonium, it may be well to mention, and I have the hope that Wales might on the whole show as clean a record, that with a population of, say, 5.1 million Ireland in 1884, had 1,573 criminals, or less than one in 3,200. Words fail me, dear open-minded progressive, they really do. But try the experiment. Read the rest of Gladstone's essay and ask yourself what he and Tennyson would make of the last century of British history and her condition today. Suffice it to say that I think someone owes someone else an apology. Of course, they're both dead, so none will be forthcoming. In general, what I find when I perform this exercise is that, as far to the right of us as 1922 was, the winner of the triangulation tends to be its rightmost vertex. Not on every issue, certainly, but most. I'm sure that if I were to try the same trick with, say, Torquemada and Spinoza, the results would be different. But I am out of my historical depth much past the late 18th century. What's wonderful is that if you doubt these results, you can play the game yourself. Bored in your high school class? Read about the Civil War and Reconstruction and slavery. Unless you're a professional historian, you certainly won't be assigned the primary sources I just linked to. But no one can stop you either. At least not until Google adds a flag this book button. I am certainly not claiming that everything you find in Google Books or even everything I just linked to is true. It is not. It is a product of its time. What's true, however, is that each book is the book it says it is. Google has not edited it. And if it says it was published in 1881, nothing that happened after 1881 can have affected it. Here is another exercise in defensive historiography. Skim this facile 2008 treatment of Francis Lieber, then read the actual document that Lieber wrote. The primary source is not only better written, but shorter and more informative as well. One page is misscanned, but one can make out the wonderful words, the utmost rigor of the military law. You'll see immediately that the main service Professor Bosco, the modern historian, provides is to deflect you from the brutal reality that Lieber feeds you straight. Lieber says, do Y, because if you do X, Z will happen. The Union Army did Y, and Z did not happen. The U.S. in Iraq and modern counterinsurgency forces more generally did X and Z happened. The modern law of warfare, which Lieber more or less founded, has been twisted into an instrument which negates everything he believed. The results have been the results he predicted. I know it's a cliché, but history is too important to be left to the historians. Rule number five, quality is better than quantity at least when it comes to supporters. Any political conspiracy, reactionary or revolutionary, is in the end a social network. And we observe an interesting property of social networks. Their quality tends to decline over time. It does not increase. Facebook, for example, succeeded where Friendster and Orkut failed by restricting its initial subscriber base to college students, which for all their faults really are the right side of the bell curve. In order to make an impact on the political process, you need quantity. You need moronic chanting hordes. There is no way around this. Communism was not overthrown by Andrei Sakharov, Joseph Brodsky, and Vaclav Havel. It was overthrown by moronic chanting hordes. I suppose I shouldn't be rude about it, but it's a fact that there is no such thing as a crowd of philosophers. Yet communism was overthrown by Sakharov, Brodsky, and Havel. The philosophers did matter. What was needed was the combination of philosopher and crowd, a rare and volatile mixture, highly potent and highly unnatural. My view is that up until the very last stage of the reset, quality is everything and quantity is, if anything, undesirable. On the Internet, ideas spread like crazy, and they are much more likely to spread from the smart to the dumb than the other way around. One person and one blog is nowhere near sufficient, of course. What we need is a sort of counter-cathedral an institution which is actually more trustworthy than the university system. The universities are the brain of USG, and the best way to kill anything is to shoot it in the head. 
To be right when the cathedral is wrong is to demonstrate that we live under a system of government which is bound together by the same glue that held up communism, lies. You do not need a triple-digit IQ to know that a regime held up by lies is doomed. You also do not need a triple-digit IQ to help bring down a doomed regime. Everyone will volunteer for that job. It's as much fun as anything in the world. Solely for the purpose of discussion, let's call this Counter-Cathedral Resartus, from Carlyle's great novel, Sartor Resartus, The Tailor Reclothed. The thesis of Resartus is that the marketplace of ideas, free and blossoming as it may seem, is or at least may be infected with lies. These lies all have one thing in common. They are related to the policies of modern democratic governments. Misinformation justifies misgovernment. Misgovernment subsidizes misinformation. This is our feedback loop. On the other hand, it's clear that modern democratic governments are doing many things right. Perhaps in all circumstances, they are doing the best they can. Perhaps there is no misinformation at all. The hypothesis that such feedback loops can form is not a demonstration that they exist. Therefore, the mission of Resartus is to establish, using that crowdsourced wiki power we are all familiar with, the truth on every dubious subject. Perhaps the truth will turn out to be the official story, in which case we can be happy. The two sites today which are most like Resartus are climate audit and gene expression. Both of these are, in my humble opinion, scientific milestones. CA's subject is climatology. GNXP's subject is human biodiversity. There are also some general-purpose truth verifiers, such as Snopes. But Snopes is hopelessly lightweight next to a CA or a GNXP. CA and GNXP are unique because their mission is to be authorities in and of themselves. They do not consider any source reliable on the grounds of mere institutional identity. Nor do they assume any institutional credibility themselves. They simply try to be right, and as far as I can tell, lacking expertise in either of their fields, especially the statistical background to really work through their work, they are. CA created and edited by one man, Steve McIntyre, who as far as I'm concerned is one of the most important scientists of our generation, is especially significant, because unlike GNXP, which is publicizing mainstream research that many would rather see unpublicized, McIntyre, starting with no credentials or academic career at all, is actually attacking and attempting to destroy a major flying buttress of the cathedral, and one with major political importance, not to mention economic. Imagine a cross between Piltdown Man, the Dreyfus Affair, and Enron, and you might get the picture. If the fields behind anthropogenic global warming, AGW, paleoclimatology and climate modeling, are indeed pseudosciences and go down in history as such, I find it almost impossible to imagine what will happen to their promoters, their promoters being basically everyone who matters. McIntyre is best known for his exposure of the hockey stick, but what's amazing is that CA seems to find a similar abuse of mathematics data or both, typically less prominent, about every other week or two. The scientific achievement of GNXP is less stunning, but its implications are, if anything, larger. I've discussed human neurological uniformity and its absence already. Chapter 9. But let's just say that a substantial component of our political, economic, and academic system has completely committed its credibility to a proposition that might be called the international white conspiracy. Statistical population variations in human neurology do not strike me as terribly exciting per se. A responsible, effective government should be able to deal with anything down to your high-end homo erectus. Lies, however, are always big news. If there is a much, much simpler explanation of reality which does not require an international white conspiracy, that is a problem for quite a few people, the vast majority of whom are, in fact, white. At the same time, California and GNXP and relatives, Ludwig von Mises Institute, though it's not just a website, has many of the same fine qualities, were not designed as general-purpose information warfare devices. There is some crossover, but I suspect most CA posters are unaware of or uninterested in GNXP and often the reverse. Many people are natural specialists, of course, and this is normal. The idea of Resartus, which as usual anyone can build in their own backyard, contact me if you are interested in resartus.org, is to build a general purpose site for answering a variety of large controversial questions. A smart person should be able to visit Resartus and decide with a minimum of effort who is right about AGW or human biodiversity or peak oil 
or the Kennedy assassination, or evolution, or string theory, or 9-11, or the Civil War, or... To build a credible truth machine, it's important to generate true negatives as well as true positives. For example, I favor the conventional wisdom on evolution and 9-11. On peak oil and the Kennedys, I simply don't know enough to decide. Actually, I live in terror of the idea that someone will convince me that Oswald didn't act alone. So I try to avoid the matter. Therefore, I would hope that any attempt to audit Darwin as McIntyre audited man would result in a true negative. The easiest way to describe the problem of Rosatis is to describe it as a crowdsourced trial. Indeed, any process that can determine the truth or falsity of AGW, etc., should be a process powerful enough to determine criminal guilt or innocence. Certainly, many of these issues are well into that category of importance. In fact, I would not be surprised if one day we see legal proceedings in the global warming department. There have already been some suspicious signs of lawyering up. A trial is not a blog nor is it a discussion board. One of the main flaws of climate audit is that it does not provide a way for AGW skeptics and believers to place each other's arguments and evidence side by side, making it as easy as possible for neutral third parties to evaluate who is right. I'm confident that CA is on the money, but much of this confidence is gut feeling. In the evolution world, the talk.origins index to creationist claims has probably come the closest to setting out a structured argument for evolution in which every possible creationist argument is listed and refuted. However, a real trial is adversarial. The prosecutor does not get to make the defense lawyer's arguments. On Rosatus, the way this would work is that the creationist community itself would be asked to list its claims and edit them collectively, producing the best possible statement of the creationist case. Not showing up should not provide an advantage, so evolutionists should be able to add and refute their own creationist claims. Creationists should in turn be able to respond to their responses and so add infinitum until both sides feel they have said their piece. As an evolutionist, I feel that this process, which could continue indefinitely as the argument tree is refined, evidence exhibits were added, etc., etc., would demonstrate very clearly that evolutionists are right and creationists are blowing smoke. As a matter of fact, as someone who served on a jury, I feel that such an argument tree would be far more useful than verbal lectures from the competing attorneys. And if these structures were available on one site for a wide variety of controversial issues, it would be very, very easy for any smart young person with a few hours to spare to see what the pattern of truth and error and its inevitable political associations started to look like. It certainly will not be easy to construct a nexus of more reliable judgments than the university system itself, but at some point someone will do it. And I think the results will be devastating. When I look at the thinking of people who disagree with me, and especially when I look at the thinking of the educated public at large, New York Times comments on the few articles which they are enabled for are an invaluable vox populi for the Obama bot crowd. I am often struck by the fact that their perspective differs from mine as a result of small, seemingly irrelevant details in the interpretation of reality. If you believe that John Kerry was telling the truth about his voyages into Cambodia, for example, you will hear the word swift boating in a very different way. On a larger subject, if James Watson is right, our historical interpretation of the 1860s will simply have to change. Details matter. Facts matter. Our democratic institutions today, though far more distributed and open than the systems of Goebbels or Vyshinsky, are basically designed to run on an information system that funnels truth down from the top of the mountain. This is a brittle design. If it breaks, if it starts distributing sewage along with the rose water, it loses its credibility. If it loses its credibility, the government loses its legitimacy. When a government loses its legitimacy, you don't want to be standing under it. The cathedral is called the cathedral for another reason. It's not the bazaar. Coding, frankly, is pretty easy. Reinterpreting reality is hard. Nonetheless, I think this thing will come down one of these days. And I would rather be outside it than under it. Under it.